Preface and Introduction of History of the Jews in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Jews in America by Peter Wiernick. Preface and Introduction. Preface. There were less than 10,000 Jews in the New World three centuries after its discovery, and about two-thirds of them lived in the West Indies and in Suriname or Dutch Guiana in South America. While the communities in those faraway places are now larger in membership than they were at the beginning of the 19th century, their comparative importance is much diminished. The two or three thousand Jews who lived in North America, or in the United States 100 years ago, have, on the other hand, increased to nearly as many millions the bulk of them having come in the last three or four decades. On this account, neither our conditions nor our problems can be thoroughly understood without the consideration of the actual present. The plan of other works of this kind, to devote only a short concluding chapter to the present time, or to leave it altogether for the future historian, could therefore not be followed in this work. The story would be less than half told, if attention were not paid to contemporary history. The chief aim of the work, the first of its kind in this complete form, being to reach the ordinary reader who is interested in Jewish matters in a general way, original investigations and learned disquisitions were avoided, and it was not deemed advisable to overburden the book with too many notes or to provide a bibliographical apparatus. The plan and scope of the work are self-evident. It was inevitable that a disproportionately large part should be devoted to the United States. The continuity of Jewish history is made possible only by the preservation of our identity as a religious community. Local history really begins with the formation of a congregation. Each of the successive strata of immigration was originally represented by its own synagogues, and when the struggle to gain a foothold or to remove disabilities was over, communal activity was the only one which could properly be described as Jewish. Economic growth could have been entirely neglected despite the present-day tendency to consider every possible problem from the standpoint of economics. But the material well-being of the Jews of the earlier period was an important factor in the preparation for the reception and easy absorption of the larger masses which came later, and this gives wealth a meaning which, in the hands of people who are less responsible for one another than Jews, it does not possess. The Murano of the 17th or the 18th century who brought here riches far in excess of what he found among the inhabitants in the places where he settled, would probably not have been admitted if he came as a poor immigrant, and his merit as a pioneer of trade and industry interests us, because he assisted to make this country a place where hosts of men can come and find work to do. Without this, only a small number could enjoy the liberty and equality which an enlightened republic vouchsafes to every newcomer without distinction of race or creed. Still, these absorbingly interesting early periods had to be passed over briefly, despite the wealth of available material, to keep within the bounds of a single volume, and to be able to carry out the plan of including in the narrative a comprehensive view of the near past and the present. While no excuse is necessary for making the latter part of the work longer than the earlier, though in most works the inequality is the other way, the author regrets the scarcity of available sources for the history of the Jewish immigration from Slavic countries other than Russia. There were times when German Jewish historians were reproached with neglecting the Jews of Russia. In those times, there was a scarcity of necessary Vorarbeiten, or preparation of material for the history of the Jews of that empire. Today, as far as the history of the Jewish immigrant in America is concerned, the scarcity is still greater as far as it concerns the Jews who came from Austria and Romania. The principal sources which were utilized in the preparation of this work are the publications of the American Jewish Historical Society, 20 volumes, 1893 to 1911, which are referred to as publications, the Jewish Encyclopedia, Funk and Wagnalls, 12 volumes, 1901 to 1906, the Settlement of the Jews in North America by Judge Charles P. Daly, edited by Max J. Kohler, New York, 1893, often referred to as daily. The Jews in America by Isaac Markins, New York, 1888. The American Jew as Patriot, Soldier, and Citizen by the Honorable Simon Wolfe, edited by Louis Edward Levy, Philadelphia, 1895. 
Other works, like Dr. Kaiserling's Christopher Columbus, Mr. Pierce Butler's Judah P. Benjamin of the American Crisis Biographies, Philadelphia, 1906, and the Reverend Henry S. Marais's Jews of Philadelphia, were also drawn upon for much valuable material which they made accessible. All these works were used to a larger extent than is indicated by the references or footnotes, and my indebtedness to them is herewith gratefully acknowledged. Where biographical dates are given after the name of a person born in a foreign country, the date of arrival in the New World is often fully as important as that of birth or death. This date is indicated in the text by an A, which stands for arrived, as B stands for born, and D for died. In conclusion, I gladly record my obligation to Mr. Abraham S. Freitas of the New York Public Library for aid in the gathering of material, to Mr. Isaiah Gamble for rereading of the proofs, to Mr. Samuel Weisberg for seeing the work through the press, and to my sister Bertha Wiernick for assistance in the preparation of the index. P.W. New York, July 1912. Introduction. The Jews as Early International Traders. The ten centuries which passed between the fall of the Western Roman Empire and the discovery of the New World are commonly known as the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. They were, on the whole, very dark indeed for most of the inhabitants of Europe, as well as for the Jews who were scattered among them. It was a time of the fermentation of religious and national ideas, a formative period for the mind and the body politic of the races, from which the great nations of the present civilized world were evolved. It was a period of violent hatreds, of cruel persecutions, of that terrible earnestness which prompts and justifies the extermination of enemies and even of opponents. There was almost constant war between nations, between classes, between creeds and sects. The ordinary man had no right even in theory. The truths that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, were not self-evident then. They were not even thought of, until a much later era. The treatment accorded to the Jews in our own time in the countries where the general conditions are nearest to those prevailing in the Dark Ages gives a clear idea of what the Jew had to undergo when the average degree of culture was so much lower than it is in the least developed of the Christian countries at present. The records of the time are so filled with pillage, expulsions, and massacres that they impress us as having been common occurrences though they happen further apart to those who live through the peaceful intervals which distance of time makes to appear short to us. There were, of course, some bright spots, the most shiny of which was the Iberian Peninsula during the earlier part of the Moorish domination. Sometimes, a kind-hearted king would afford his Jews protection and even grant them valuable privileges. A clear-headed prince often found it to his own interest to utilize them for the advancement of the commerce of his dominion, and in a rear period of peace and prosperity, there also happened a general relaxation of the severity which characterized the time. But if we view the entire thousand years as a single historical period, we find the condition of the Jews slowly deteriorating, with the result that while the modern nations were welded together and came out of the medieval furnace strengthened and developed, the Jews were pushed back, segregated and degraded, ready for the numerous expulsions and various sufferings which continued for more than two centuries in Western Europe and are not yet over in other parts of the Old World. The favorable position of the Jews at the beginning of the Middle Ages is less familiar to the reading public, even to the Jewish reader, than the troublesome times which came later. As a matter of fact, the Jews were, except for the lack of national unity and of the possession of an independent home, better situated materially four centuries after the destruction of the Second Temple than before the last dissolution of the Kingdom of Judah. The instinct for commerce which is latent in the Semitic race was awakened in the Diaspora, and after an interruption of more than a thousand years, we find, at the end of the classical times, international trade again almost exclusively in the hands of members of that race. The Sumero-Akkadians, original Babylonians, were the earliest known international traders on land, and the Phoenicians who first dared to trade overseas were of Semitic origin. As foreign commerce is the highest form of activity in regard to the utilization of human productivity, so it is also the forerunner of mental activity, 
and of the spread of an ennobling and instructive culture. The beginnings of both Egyptian and Greek civilization, according to the latest discoveries, point unmistakably to a Mesopotamian or Phoenician origin, with the strong probability that the latter received it from the former in times which we usually describe as prehistoric, but about which we now possess considerable exact information. Culture followed the great route of the caravans to Syria and Egypt on one side, to Iran and India, and as far as China, in an opposite direction. And if we accept the wholly incorrect and unscientific division of the white race into Aryans and Semites, then this original and most fertile of the cultures of humanity was undoubtedly Semitic. A more modern and more nearly correct division would place these ancient inhabitants of the plateau of Asia as a part of the great Mediterranean or brunette race, which includes, besides all the so-called Semites, a number of European nations which are classed as Aryans. Greece succeeded Phoenicia and was in turn succeeded by Rome in the hegemony of international trade as well as in that of general culture. Both commerce and culture declined when the ancient civilization was all but destroyed by the invasion of the blonde barbarians of the northern forests, who were themselves destined to attain in a faraway future the highest form of civilization of which mankind has hitherto proven itself capable. See Zolshan das Rosen Problem, Vienna, 1910, page 206. It so happened that at the time of the downfall of the Roman Empire, or, as it is usually called, the beginning of the Middle Ages, another people of Semitic origin, the Jews, were for the most part engaged in international trade. There are records of Jewish merchants of that period shipping or exporting wine, oil, honey, fish, cattle, woolens, etc., from Spain to Rome and other Latin provinces, from Medea to Britannia, from the Persian Gulf and Ethiopia to Macedonia and Italy. There was no important seaport or commercial center in which the Jews did not occupy a commanding position. Their prominence as importers and exporters rather increased than diminished by the downfall of the great empire. The new nations of the Germanic kingdoms, which were founded on the ruins of Rome, knew nothing of international trade, and the position of the Jews as merchants was accepted by them as a matter of course. Hence, the first traces of Jewish settlements in modern European countries are almost exclusively to be found in the earliest records of commerce and of trading privileges. They are then known as traders with distant countries, as sea-going men, as owners of vessels, and as slave traders. The commercial note, or written obligation to pay, which is accepted in lieu of payment, and is itself negotiable as a substitute for money, is a Jewish invention of those times. They developed industries and approved the material conditions of every place in which they were found in large numbers. As late as 1084, when their position had been already much weakened, and the coming crusades were casting their shadows, Bishop Rudiger of Spire began his edict of privileges granted to the Jews with the statement, as I wish to turn the village of Spire into a city, I call the Jews to settle there. See Ibid, page 351. The Spanish Jews as Landowners Canon law on one side, and the rise of cities on the other, shattered the position of the Jews until they were reduced to sore straits at the end of the Middle Ages. The Church labored persistently and relentlessly through the centuries in which Europe was thoroughly Christianized, to separate the Jews as far as possible from their Gentile neighbors. The ties which united the two parts of the population by a thousand threads of mutual interest, friendship, cooperation, and beneficial intercourse were slowly loosened, and, where possible, all but severed. At the various church councils, from Nicaea to the last Lateran, there was laid down the theory of the necessity to force the Jews out of the national life of the countries in which they dwelt, and to segregate them as a distinct, inferior, and outlawed class. The principles enunciated by the higher clergy were disseminated by the priests and the demagogues among the masses. Special laws and restrictions were often followed by attacks, sacking of the Jewish quarters, and degradations of various kinds. In the twelfth and the following three centuries, the ill treatment was often followed by expulsions and cancellation of debts. 
while heavy fines on individual Jews or on entire communities were accepted on both sides as a lesser evil or as easy terms for escaping greater hardships. The climax of this method of dealing with the Jews, the greatest blow administered to the unhappy children of Israel by Christian princes, was the expulsion from Spain in 1492 and its concomitant, the expulsion from Portugal five years afterwards. But the church alone could never have accomplished the ruin of the Jews if the changing economic conditions and the rise of a large and powerful class of Christian merchants did not help to undermine the position of the earth's while solitary trading class. The burgher classes were the chief opponents and persecutors of their Jewish competitors. They seconded, and in many cases instigated, the efforts of the clergy to exclude the Jews from many occupations. So when the city overpowered the landowner and began to exert a preponderant influence on the government, the cause of the Jew was lost, or at least postponed until a more humane and liberal time, when the ordinary claims of the brotherhood of man were to overcome the narrow-minded, mercantile, and ecclesiastical policies of a ruder age. The great historian Ranke pointed out that the struggle between the cities and the nobility in Castile was decided in favor of the former by the marriage of Queen Isabella to Ferdinand of Aragon. It was also this marriage which sealed the doom of the Spanish Jews, as well as that of their former friends and protectors, the Moors, who had by that time sunk so low that it was impossible for them to keep their last stronghold in Europe much longer. Though the outlook in Spain was very dark, it was much worse than all other known countries, which accounts for the fact that there was hardly any emigration from the Christian parts of Spain in the time immediately preceding the expulsion. The Spanish Jew was then, and has to some extent remained even unto this day, the aristocrat among the Jews of the world. His intense love for that country is still smoldering in the hearts of his descendants, and not without reason. In other countries, the Jew could, during the Middle Ages, only enjoy the sympathy and sometimes be accorded the protection of the nobility. In Spain and Portugal, he actually belonged to that class. For, as Selig, Dr. Paulus, Castle, has justly remarked in his splendid article, Juden in Ursch and Gruber's Encyclopedia, sufficient attention has not been paid by Jewish historians to the important fact that Spain and Portugal were the only considerable countries during the Middle Ages in which the Jews were permitted to own land. The statement, for which there is an apparent Jewish authority, that they owned about a third of Spain at the time of their exile, is doubtless an exaggeration, but there can be no question of their being extensive holders of land properties. This largely explains why the Jew in Spain has not sunk in public estimation as much as he did in other countries, why his fate was different, and in the end, worse than that of his more humiliated and degraded brother elsewhere. When the German or French Jew was forced out of commerce, he could only become a moneylender at the usurious rates prevailing in those times. This vocation drew on him the contempt and hatred of all classes, as was always the case, and is the case in many places even today. But while the usurer was despised, he was very useful, often even indispensable, especially in those times when there was a great scarcity of the precious metals and of convertible capital. This may explain why the exiled Jews were, in other countries, usually called back to the places from which they were exiled. The prejudice of the age may render their work disreputable, but it was nonetheless necessary. They were missed as soon as they left, and on many occasions negotiations for their return were begun as soon as the popular fury cooled down, or when the object of spoliation was attained. Not so in Spain. The Jewish merchant, who could no longer hold his own against a stronger non-Jewish competitor, could do what is often done by others who voluntarily retire from such pursuits, i.e., invest his capital in landed estates. We can imagine that the transition did not at all seem to be forced, that those who caused it, and even its victims, might have considered it as the natural course of events. After the great massacres of 1391, a century before the expulsion, many Jews emigrated to Moorish North Africa, where there still remained some degree of tolerance and friendliness for them, mingled perhaps with some hope of reconquering the lost parts of the Iberian Peninsula. But later, there was less thought of migration, least of all of emigrating to the parts of Spain which still remained in the possession of the Moors. The race which was, seven centuries before, assisted by the Jews to become masters of Iberia, 
and which together with them rose to a height of culture and mental achievement which is not yet properly appreciated in modern history, has now become degenerate and almost savage in its fanaticism. The Jew of Spain was still proud despite his sufferings. He could not see his fate as clearly as we can now from the perspective of five hundred years. He was rooted in the country in which he lived for many centuries. He was, like most men of wealth and position, inclined to be optimistic, and he could not miss his only possible protection against expropriation or exile, the possession of full rights of citizenship, because the Jews nowhere had it in those times, and had not had it since the days of ancient Rome. The catastrophe of the great expulsion, which came more unexpectedly than we can now perceive, was possibly facilitated by the position which the Jews held as landowners. It certainly contributed to make the decree of exile irrevocable. The holder of real property is more easily and more thoroughly despoiled because he cannot hide his most valuable possessions or escape with them. He is not missed when he is gone. His absence is hardly felt after the title to his land has been transferred to the crown or to favorites of the government. When the robbery is once committed, only compunction or an awakened sense of justice could induce the restitution which readmission or recall would imply. And as abstract moral forces had very little influence in those cruel days, it is no wonder that the expulsion was final, the only one of that nature in Christian Europe. This peculiar position of the Jews in Spain and Portugal was also the cause of the immense number of conversions which gave these anti-Jewish nations a very large mixture of Jewish blood in their veins. The temptation to cling to the land and to the high social position, which could not be enjoyed elsewhere, was too strong for all but the strongest. Thus, we find Moranos, or secret Jews, in all the higher walks of life in the times of the discovery of America. The more steadfast of their brethren, who were equally prominent in the preceding period, assisted in various ways earlier voyages of discovery, and even contributed indirectly to the success of the one great voyage, which did not begin until they were exiled from Spain forever. But we must constantly bear in mind, when speaking of the Middle Ages, and of the two centuries succeeding it, the 16th and the 17th, that the Jews did not possess the right of citizenship, and were not, even when they were treated very well, considered as an integral part of the population. This was the chief weakness of their position, and the ultimate cause of all the persecutions, massacres, and expulsions. Still, they had many opportunities, and made the most of them to advance their own interests, and those of the countries in which they dwelt. We find them in the 13th and 14th centuries in close touch with the current of national life in the countries, which were most absorbed in enterprises of navigation and discovery. Many of them were still great merchants, Numerous others were scholars, mathematicians, and astronomers or astrologers. Some had influence in political life as advisors or fiscal officials at the royal courts. They accomplished much as Jews and as Moranos, even when the danger of persecution must have been ever present, or later, when in constant terror of the Inquisition. Many of them could therefore participate in the work which led to the discovery of a new world, where their descendants were destined to find a home safer and more free than was ever dreamt of in medieval Jewish philosophy. End of introduction. Part 1, Chapter 1 of History of the Jews in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This is a reading by Aviva Apfel. History of the Jews in America by Peter Viernick. Part 1. The Spanish and Portuguese Period. Chapter 1. The Participation of the Jews in the Discovery of the New World. The Jew of Barcelona who has navigated the whole known world. Judah Crescus, the map Jew, as director of the Academy of Navigation which was founded by Prince Henry the Navigator. One Jewish astronomer advises the King of Portugal to reject the plans of Columbus. Zucuto is one of the first influential men in Spain to encourage the discoverer of the New World. Abravanel, Signor, and the Murano Santanel and Sanchez, who assisted Columbus. The voyage of discovery begun a day after the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. 
Luis de Torres, and other Jews who went with Columbus. America discovered on Hosanna Rabbah, the Indians as the lost ten tribes of Israel. Money taken from the Jews to defray the expenditure of the second voyage of Columbus. Vasco da Gama and the Jew Gaspar. Scrolls of the Torah from Portugal sold in Cochin. Alphonse de Albuquerque's interpreter who returned to Judaism. In the days when church and state were one and indissoluble, and when all large national enterprises, such as wars or the search for new dominions by means of discovery, were undertaken avowedly in the name and for the glory of the Catholic religion, it could not have been expected that governments would make an effort to protect international trade as long as it was in Jewish hands. We must therefore go back as far as the first half of the 14th century to find a record of Jews who went to sea on their own account in an independent way. According to the great authority on the subject of the chapter, Dr. M. Kaiserling, Christopher Columbus and the Participation of the Jews in the Spanish and Portuguese Discoveries, English translation by the late Professor Charles Gross of Harvard University, Jaime III, the last king of Majorca, testified in 1334 that Hucha Fakin, a Jew of Barcelona, has navigated the whole then known world. About a century later, we find again a Jew prominently identified with navigation. But in this instance, he is a scientific teacher in the employ of an energetic prince who considered navigation as a national project of the greatest moment. Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal, 1394 to 1460, who helped his father to capture Ceuta in North Africa and there obtained information from Jewish travelers concerning the south coast of Guinea and the interior of Africa, established a naval academy or school of navigation at Via do Efante or Sagres, a seaport town which he caused to be built. He appointed as its director Mestre Jaime of Majorca, whose real name was Cafuda, Judah, Crescas, the son of Abraham Crescas of Palma, the capital of Majorca. Cafuda was known as the Map Jew, and a map which he prepared for King Juan I of Aragon and was presented by the latter to the King of France, is preserved in the National Library of Paris. He became the teacher of the Portuguese in the art of navigation as well as in the manufacture of nautical instruments and maps. In this work, he had no superior in his day. While this Jewish scholar helped the Portuguese to many notable achievements in their daring voyages, another one, at a later period, was almost the direct cause of their being overtaken by the Spaniards in the race for the new discoveries. For it was Joseph Vicinho, Physician to King Joao of Portugal, considered by the high court functionaries to be the greatest authority in nautical matters, who influenced the king to reject the plan submitted by Christopher Columbus, 1446 to 1506, and thereby caused the latter to leave Portugal for Spain in 1484. Columbus came to Spain when Ferdinand and Isabella, with the aid of the newly introduced Inquisition, were despoiling the wealthy Moranos, who were burned at the stake in large numbers. The last war with the Moors had already begun. Another and more famous Jewish scholar was to make amends for whatever suffering was caused to the great discoverer by Vicinho's fatal advice. Abraham ben Samuel Zacuto, who was born in Salamanca, Spain about the middle of the 15th century and died in exile in Turkey after 1510, was famous as an astronomer and mathematician and in his capacity as one of the leading professors in the university of his native city, was formerly the teacher of the above-named Vicinio. He was more discerning than his pupil, and when he learned to know Columbus soon after the latter's arrival in Spain, he encouraged him personally and also gave him his almanacs and astronomical tables, which were a great help in the voyage of discovery. Zacuto was among the first influential men in Spain to favor the plans of Columbus, and his favorable report caused Ferdinand and Isabella to take him into their service in 1487. The explorer was then ordered to proceed to Malaga, which was captured several weeks before, and there made the acquaintance of the two most prominent Jews of Spain in that time, the chief farmer of taxes, Abraham Senor, and Don Isaac of Bravenel. These two men were provisioning the Spanish armies which operated against the Moors and were in high favor at the court. Abravanel was one of the first to render financial assistance to Columbus. Luis de Santangel and other Moranos interposed in favor of Columbus when he was about to go to France in January 1492 because Ferdinand refused to make him viceroy and life governor of all the lands which he might discover. Santangel's pleadings with Isabella were especially effective. 
and when the question of funds remained the only obstacle to be overcome, he who was saved from the stake by the king's grace at the time when several other members of the Santanel family perished, advanced a loan of 17,000 florins, nearly 5 million maravedis, to finance the entire project. Account books in which the transfer of money from Santanel to Columbus through the Bishop of Avila, who afterwards became the Archbishop of Granada, were recorded, are still preserved in the Archive de India of Seville, Spain. After the Spanish monarchs had expelled all the Jews from all their kingdoms and lands in April, in the same month they commissioned me to undertake the voyage to India, writes Christopher Columbus. This refers to the decree of expulsion, but the coincidence of the actual happening was still more remarkable. The expulsion took place on the second day of August, 1492, which occurred on the ninth day of the Jewish month of Av, the day on which, according to Jewish tradition, is the anniversary of the destruction of both the first holy temple of Jerusalem in the year 586 BC and also of the second temple at the hands of the Romans in the year 70 CE. The day, known as Tisha B'Av, was observed as a day of mourning and lamentation among the Jews of the Diaspora in all countries and is still so observed by the Orthodox everywhere to this day. Columbus sailed on his momentous voyage on the day after, the 3rd of August. The boats which were carrying away throngs of the expatriated and despairing Jews from the country which they loved so well and in which their ancestors dwelt for more than eight centuries sighted that little fleet of three sailing craft which was destined to open up a new world for the oppressed of many races, where, at a later age, millions of Jews were to find a free home under the protection of laws which were unthought of in those times. Neither all the names nor even the number of men who accompanied Columbus on his first voyage are known to posterity. Some authorities placed the number at 120, others as low as 90. But among the names which came down to us are those of several Jews, the best known among them being Luis de Torres, who was baptized shortly before he joined Columbus. Torres knew Hebrew, Chaldaic, and some Arabic, and was taken along to be employed as an interpreter between the travelers and the natives of the parts of India which Columbus expected to reach by crossing the ocean. Others of Jewish stock whose names are preserved are Alfonso de Calle, Rodrigo Sanchez of Segovia, the physician Maestro Bernal, and the surgeon Marco. Land was sighted October 12, 1492, on Hosanna Rabat the seventh day of the Jewish Feast of the Booths, and Louis de Torres, who was sent ashore with one companion to parley with the inhabitants, was thus the first white man to step on the ground of the New World. As the place proved to not be the kingdom of the Great Khan which Columbus had set out to reach, but an island of the West Indies with a strange hitherto unknown race of copper-colored men, it is needless to say that the linguistic attainments of the Jewish interpreter availed him very little. After he managed to make himself somewhat understood, he was favorably impressed with the new country and finally settled for the remainder of his life in Cuba. He was the first discoverer of tobacco which was through him introduced into the Old World. It is also believed that in describing in a Hebrew letter to a Murano in Spain the odd gallinaceous bird which he first saw in his new abode, he gave it the name Tuki. The word in Kings 1, 10, verse 22, which is commonly translated peacock, and that this was later corrupted into Turkey, by which name it is known to the English-speaking world. It may also be remarked in passing that the belief identifying the red race which was surnamed Indian with the lost ten tribes of Israel began to be entertained by many people, especially scholars and divines, soon after the discovery of America. It attained the dignity of a theory in the middle of the 17th century when Thorogood published his work, the Jews in America, or probabilities that the Americans are of that race. London, 1650. This view was supported among our own scholars by no less an authority than Menashe ben Israel, who wrote on the same subject in his Esperanza de Israel, which was published in Amsterdam in the same year. Columbus wrote his first reports of his wonderful discovery to Luis de Santangel and to Gabriel Sanchez. The letter to the first is dated February 15, 1493, and was written on the return voyage near the Azores or the Canaries. It was decreed by a royal order of November 23, 1492, that the authorities were to confiscate for the state treasury all property which had belonged to the Jews, including that which Christians had taken from them or had appropriated unlawfully or by violence. 
This gave Ferdinand sufficient means to provide for the second voyage of Columbus, March 23, 1493. The king and the queen signed a large number of injunctions to royal officers in Soria, Zamora, Burgos, and many other cities, directing them to secure immediate possession of all the precious metals, gold and silver utensils, jewels, gems, and other objects of value that had been taken from the Jews who were expelled from Spain or had migrated to Portugal, and everything that these Jews had entrusted for safekeeping to Moranos, relatives or friends, and all Jewish possession which Christians had found or had unlawfully appropriated. The royal officers were later ordered to convert this property into ready money and to give the proceeds to the treasurer, Francisco Pinello, in Seville, to meet the expenditure of Columbus's second expedition. One of the specific instances of these confiscations which deserves to be mentioned is the order to Bernardino de Lerma to transfer to Pinello all the gold, silver, and various things which Rabbi Ephraim, who is sometimes referred to in contemporary documents as Rabbi Frain, also as Ruby Frain, and who was perhaps the father of the great Rabbi Joseph Caro, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, etc., the richest Jew in Burgos, had before emigrating left with Isabel Asoria, the wife of Luis Nunez, Colonel of Zamora. Not merely the clothing, ornaments, and valuables which had been taken from the Jews were converted into money, but also the debts which they had been unable to recover were declared by order of the crown to be forfeited to the state treasury, and stringent measures were adopted to collect them. A moderate estimate places the sum thus obtained at six million maravedis, to which ought to be added to the two millions contributed by the Inquisition of Seville as a part of the enormous sum which it wrested from the Jews and Moors. According to another order issued in the above-named date, it was from this Jewish money that Columbus was paid the ten thousand maravedis which the Spanish monarchs had promised as a reward to him who should first sight land. In the days of suffering and disgrace which came to Columbus after his discoveries, Santantel and Sanchez remained faithful to him and often interceded in his behalf with Ferdinand and Isabella. They both died in 1505, about one year before the great discoverer whose success they made possible. Their immediate descendants occupied high positions in the royal service. Columbus was not the only renowned discoverer of that time who was directly and indirectly assisted by Jews. The great and cruel Vasco da Gama, who did for Portugal almost as much as Columbus did for Spain, could hardly have carried out his important undertakings without the help of at least two Jews. One of them was the above-mentioned Abraham Zacuto, who, like many of his unfortunate brethren, went from Spain to Portugal after the calamity of 1492. He was highly favored by King João and by his successor, Dom Manuel and the latter consulted him on the advisability of sending out under Vasco da Gama's command the flotilla of four boats which was to reach India by the way of Cape of Good Hope. Zacuto pointed out the dangers which would have to be encountered, but gave it as his opinion that the plan was feasible, and predicted that it would result in the subjection of a large part of India to the Portuguese crown. Zucuto's works in the instruments which he invented and made available materially facilitated the execution of the enterprises of Vasco da Gama and other explorers. As in the case of Columbus and Spain, da Gama sailed in the year of the expulsion of the Jews from the country which fitted out his expedition, 1497. When he returned, Zucuto was in exile in Tunis, though he probably could have remained in Portugal just as Abravanel could have remained in Spain. It was during his return voyage to Europe while staying at the little island of Anchevide, 60 miles from Gao, off the Indian coast of Malabar, that Vasco da Gama met the second Jew who became very useful to him and to Portugal. A tall European with a long white beard had approached his ship in a boat with a small crew. He had been sent by his master Sabayo, the Moorish ruler of Gao, to negotiate with the foreign navigator. He was a Jew who, according to some chronicles, came from Posen, according to others, from Granada, whose parents had emigrated to Turkey and Palestine. From Alexandria, which some give as his birthplace, he proceeded across the Red Sea to Mecca and thence to India. Here he was a long time in captivity, and later was made Admiral, Capito Mor, by Ceballo. The Portuguese were overjoyed to hear so far from home a language closely related to their native speech, but he was soon suspected of being a spy and was forced by torture to join the expedition and, as a matter of course, to embrace Christianity. The admiral acted as his godfather and his name came down to us as Gaspar da Gama or Gaspar de las Indias. 
He was brought to Portugal, where he was favored by King Manuel and rendered inestimable service to Vasco da Gama and several later commanders. He accompanied Pedro Alvarez Cabral on the expedition in 1500, which led to the independent discovery of Brazil, which became a Portuguese possession. On the return voyage, Gaspar met Amerigo Vespucci, who received much information from him and mentions him as a linguist and a traveler who is trustworthy and knows much about the interior of India. On another expedition in which he accompanied his godfather in 1502, Gaspar found his wife in Cochin. She had remained true to him and to Judaism since he was carried away by the Portuguese, but probably both of them considered it unsafe for her to join him. He again journeyed to Cochin in 1505 in the retinue of the first viceroy of India, which also included the son of Dr. Martin Pinheiro, the judge of the Supreme Court of Lisbon. The young Pinheiro carried along a chest filled with Torah scrolls which were taken from the recently destroyed synagogues in Portugal. Gaspar's wife negotiated the sale in Cochin, where there were many Jews and synagogues, obtaining 4,000 parados for 13 scrolls. The viceroy later confiscated the proceeds for the state treasury and sent an account of the whole affair to Lisbon. Another Portuguese commander and governor of India, Alphonse de Albuquerque, obtained much information and valuable assistance from his interpreter, a Jew from Castile whom he induced to embrace Christianity and to assume the name Francisco de Albuquerque. His companion, Cufo, or Hukefe, underwent the same change of religion and visited Lisbon, but soon found himself in danger and escaped to Cairo, where he again openly professed Judaism. End of chapter 1, read by Aviva Apfel. August 2023. Chapter 2 of History of the Jews in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Aviva Apfel. History of the Jews in America by Peter Viernick. Chapter 2. Early Jewish Martyrs Under Spanish Rule in the New World Children torn from their parents were the first Jewish immigrants. Jewish history in the New World begins as Jewish history in Spain ends with the Inquisition. Emperor Charles V, Philip II, and Philip III. Lutherans persecuted together with Jews and Mohammedans. Codification of the Laws of the Inquisition and its Special Edicts for the New World We've seen in the preceding chapter that the Jews were expelled forever from Spain and Portugal at the time when these two nations, with considerable assistance from professing and converted Jews, discovered the New World and took possession of it. Nothing could therefore have been farther from the thoughts and the hopes of the Jews of those dark days than the idea that America was to be, in a faraway future, the first Christian country to grant its Jewish inhabitants full citizenship and absolute equality before the law. For nearly a century and a half, no professing Jew dared to tread upon American soil, and even the secret Jews or Muranos were as much in danger in the newly planted colonies as in the mother countries under whose rule they remained for a long time. The first Jewish immigrants in the New World were children who were torn away from the arms of their parents at the time of the expulsions, and even they were persecuted as soon as they grew up. The Muranos who sought a refuge in America in these early days were soon followed by the same agencies of persecution which made life a burden to them in their old home. We meet in America for more than a century after its discovery, almost the same conditions as in Spain and Portugal after the Jews were exiled. Where the history of the Jews in Spain ends, says Dr. Kaiserling, the history of the Jews in America begins. The Inquisition is the last chapter in the record of the Confessors of Judaism on the Pyrenean Peninsula and its first chapter in the Western Hemisphere. The Nuevos Cristianos concealed their faith, or were able to conceal it, as little in the New World as in their mother country. With astonishing tenacity, nay, with admirable obstinacy, they clung to the religion of their fathers. It was not a rare occurrence that the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the martyred Jews sanctified the Sabbath in the most conscientious manner, by refraining from work as far as possible, and by wearing their best clothing. They also celebrated the Jewish festivals, observed the Day of Atonement by fasting, and married according to the Jewish customs. They clung to their faith and suffered for it even as late as the 18th century which means that the Jewish religion was handed down secretly and preserved in the seventh and eighth generation after the exile. Many went to the stake or died in the prisons of the Inquisition in the New World. 
Many others were transported in groups to Spain and Portugal and gave up their lives as martyrs in Seville, Toledo, Evora, or Lisbon. Their religious heroism will be apparent in all its magnitude when the immense documentary material which is heaped up in the archives of Spain and Portugal and other places on this side of the ocean will have been sifted and worked up. Publications 2, page 73. Intolerance reigned supreme in America almost immediately after its colonization, and the secret Jews who settled there were not permitted to enjoy peace or prosperity. Juan Sanchez of Saragossa, whose father was burnt at the stake, was the first to obtain permission of the Spanish government to trade with the newly discovered lands. In 1502, Isabella permitted him to take five caravellas loaded with wheat, barley, horses, and other wares to Española, Little Spain, the large West Indian island containing Haiti and Santo Domingo, without paying duty. In 1504, he was again permitted to export merchandise to that country. Other secret Jews went to the new places and settled there, some even obtaining positions in the public service. As early as 1511, we hear already of measures taken by Isabella's daughter, Queen Juana of Castile, against the sons and grandsons of the burned who held public office. The Inquisition was introduced there by a decree of that year, and one of its first victims was Diego Caballera of Barameda, whose parents, according to two witnesses, had been prosecuted and condemned by the same tribunal in Spain. The Inquisitor General of Spain, Cardinal Jimenez de Cisneros, on May 7, 1516, appointed Fray Juan Coivedo, Bishop of Cuba, his delegate for the Kingdom of Terra Firma, as the mainland of Spanish America was then called, and authorized him to select personally such officials as he needed to hunt down and exterminate the Moranos. Emperor Charles V, 1500-1558, with the permission of his former teacher, Cardinal Hadrian, 1459-1523, the Dutch Grand Inquisitor of Aragon, who later became Pope, Hadrian or Adrian VI, 1522-23, issued an edict on May 25, 1520, whereby he ordered Alfonso Manso, Bishop of Puerto Rico, and Pedro de Cordova, Vice Provincial of the Dominicans, as Inquisitor for the Indies and the Islands of the Ocean. At first, the secret Jews were not the only victims of persecution, and not even the most numerous among them. There were many heathenish natives who were forcibly converted by the mighty clerical arm of the Spanish conqueror, but who nevertheless remained at heart loyal to their hereditary belief and practiced their idolatrous customs with as much zeal as the fear of discovery and consequent punishment would allow. Fiendish atrocities were committed in the name of religion against those Indian Moranos, and the fearful persecution depopulated the country to such an extent that the tyrants themselves perceived that they must desist. The Inquisition in Spain itself had, however, fallen more or less into desuetude during the reign of the above-mentioned Emperor Charles V, who was the grandson of Ferdinand and Isabella and had inherited their Spanish and American possessions. It was revived and invigorated under the more bigoted rule of his son, King Philip II, 1527 to 1598, who ascended the Spanish throne in 1556 after his father's abdication. Under the new reign, the laws of the Inquisition were codified and promulgated at Madrid on September 2, 1561. A printed copy of the new code was sent to America in 1569. Another document dated February 5, 1569, issued by Cardinal Diego de Spinoza, General Apostolic Inquisitor Against Heresy, Immorality, and Apostasy, addressed to the Reverend Inquisitor Apostolic in His Majesty's Dominions and Signores of the Providences of Peru, Peru, New Spain, and the New Kingdom of Granada and the other provinces and bishoprics of the Indies of the Ocean, consists of 40 sections prescribing the rules of procedure. See Elkin Nathan Adler, The Inquisition in Peru, Publications 12, page 5 to 37. A later document containing the general edicts to be read on the third Sunday of Lent and the fourth Sunday of Anathema in every third year in the Cathedral of Lima and all the towns of the districts was printed in Peru itself shortly after 1641 and records the names of the places which were included in the jurisdiction of those issuing it. It reads, we, the inquisitors against heresy, immorality, and apostasy in this city and Archbishopric of Los Reos, Lima, with the Archbishopric of Los Charcas and Bishoprics of Quito, Cusco, Rio de la Plata, Paraguay, Tucumán, Santiago, and Concepcion of the Dominions of Chile, La Paz, Bolivia, Santa Cruz de la Sierra, Guamanga, Areguipa, 
and Truxillo and all the dominions, estates, and seigneurias of the provinces of Peru, and its viceroyalty governments and districts of the royal audiencias thereto appertaining. In this document we find the name of a new Christian sect which is to be punished for heresy together with the unbelievers who were known to the Inquisition of the earlier period. Lutherans are now enumerated among heretics after the Jews and the Mohammedans. Among the books and engravings which are considered as heretical and indecent are mentioned the books of Martin Luther and other heretics, the Al-Quran or other Mohammedan books, Biblias and Romance, Bibles in the Vernacular, and others prohibited by censorships and catalogs of the Holy Office, etc. Then follow lengthy descriptions of how to detect Jews, Mohammedans, and Lutherans. And in the case of the first, even drinking kosher wine and the making of a bracha, or pronouncing a blessing before tasting it, are not omitted from the practices which characterize the secret Jew whom the Inquisition was to discover and punish. But it seems that the Moranos came to America in large numbers despite all the severity of Philip II. His son Philip III, 1578 to 1621, who succeeded him in 1598, endeavored to prevent their emigrating to the New World and issued in the beginning of the 17th century the following edict. We command and decree that no one recently converted to our holy faith, be he a Jew or more, or the offspring of these, should settle in our Indies without our distinct permission. Furthermore, we forbid most emphatically the immigration into New Spain of anyone who is at the expiration of some prescribed penance newly reconciled with the Church. Of the child or grandchild of any person who has ever worn the San Benito publicly. Of the child or grandchild of any person who is either burnt as a heretic or otherwise punished for the crime of heresy through either male or female descent. Should anyone falling under this category presume to violate this law, his goods will be confiscated for the benefit of the royal treasury, and upon him the full measure of our grace or disgrace shall fall, so that under any circumstances and for all time he shall be banished from our Indies. Whosoever does not possess personal effects, however, should atone for his transgression by the public infliction of one hundred lashes. This characteristic specimen of anti-immigration legislation of three centuries ago, including what would in the colloquialism of today be called a grandfather clause, was the cause of much suffering, but it is not possible to state with any degree of certainty how far it was effective. It is probable that the number of Moranos in the Indies which belonged to the King of Spain went on increasing until about the middle of the 17th century, when certain territories were for the first time open for them in the New World where they could practice Judaism openly. End of chapter 2, read by Aviva Apfel, August 2023. Chapter 3 of History of the Jews in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This is a reading by Aviva Apfel. History of the Jews in America by Peter Viernick. Chapter 3 Victims of the Inquisition in Mexico and in Peru. Impossibility of obtaining even approximately correct figures about the Inquisition. A few typical cases. The Carabajal family. Relaxation for several decades. The notable case of Francisco Maldonado de Silva. The Inquisition, or as it styled itself, the Holy Office, was an institution of tremendous power and influence which, during its existence of more than three centuries, deeply impressed the character of the Spanish and Portuguese peoples. A great number of books were written about it, but the material to be dealt with is so vast that none of the works purporting to be histories of the Inquisition really deserve that name. It has been mentioned already in the preceding chapter that an immense mass of documentary material which is heaped up in various archives awaits to be sifted and worked up. An idea of the actual quantity of this material can be obtained from the statement made by Mr. E. N. Adler in the monogram on the Inquisition in Peru quoted above, that 33 million documents relating to the Inquisition are preserved in 80,000 legajos, or bundles, in the Castile of Samancas, a small town seven miles from Valladolid in Spain. It is therefore next to impossible to attempt to give a general review of the work of that awful tribunal in the old world or the new. 
It is even unsafe to quote figures as to the total number of trials, auto de fe, or of victims, because most of the authorities contradict one another or disagree in vital points. Many facts which are given at one time as reasonably certain are soon disproved by the discovery of more authentic records which necessitates a constant changing of the time, the place, and the identity of the persons spoken of in such descriptions. It is therefore considered best to mention here only a few typical cases of victims about whose identity and Jewish extraction there can be no doubt. From these the reader may form his own opinion as to what was constantly happening in the various places since the Inquisition's firm establishment in the New World in the second half of the 16th century until its final disappearance at the end of the 18th and in some instances as late as the beginning of the 19th centuries. Several members of the Carabajal family suffered martyrdom in Mexico at the end of the 16th century and at the beginning of the 17th. Francisca Nunez de Carabajal, born in Portugal about 1540, was among the members of the family seized by the Inquisition in 1590. She was tortured until she implicated her husband and her children, and the entire family was forced to confess and abjure Judaism at a public auto de fe which was celebrated on Saturday, February 24, 1590. Later, after more than five years' imprisonment, they were convicted of relapsing into Judaism, and Francisca, her son Luis, and her four daughters were burned at the stake in Mexico City, December 8, 1596. She was the sister of Don Luis de Carabajal y Cueva, born in Portugal, 1539, who was appointed governor of New Leon, Mexico, in 1579, and is said to have died in 1595. He arrived in Mexico in 1580, where, in consideration of his appointment as governor of a somewhat ill-defined district, he undertook to colonize a certain territory at his own expense, being allowed the privilege of reimbursing himself out of the revenue. There were many Spanish Jews among his colonists, and within a decade after their settlement, more than a score were denounced and more or less severely punished for Judaizing. He is the subject of a work half romantic and half historical by Mr. C. K. Landis, entitled Carabal Ha the Jew, A Legend of Monterey, Vineland, 1894. Another heroic martyr of Mexico was Don Thomas de Sobremonte, a Judaizer who died at the stake April 11, 1649, without uttering a groan, mocking the Pope and his hirelings, and taunting his tormentors with his last breath. The Inquisition in Lima, Peru, is known to have solemnized 34 auto de fe at that place between 1573, November 15, and 1806, July 17, and at 10 or 11 of them there were Jewish victims, their numbers ranging from 1 or 2 to as high as 56, January 23, 1639. From the earliest day of its establishment, it looked with suspicion upon the Portuguese who settled there. In this case, as in many others, Portuguese was only another name for Moranos, and they were treated with great severity. There is a record of one David Ebron, who in 1597 sent a memorial to Philip II relating to his discoveries and services in South America, but it is not known how far his claims were recognized. About 1604 or 1605, a number of those who were accused in Peru of Judaizing sent memorials to the King of Spain in which they pleaded that life under such conditions had become unbearable. Relief was obtained in the form of an apostic brief from Pope Clement VIII, commanding the inquisitors to release, without delay, all Judaizing Portuguese in Peru. When this order arrived in Lima, only two prisoners were still detained in the dungeons of the tribunal, Gonzalo de Luna and Juan Vincente. The others had either become reconciled or had suffered death at the stake. The liberal decree, which arrived too late from most of the complainants who were to benefit by it, still seemed to have had the effect of securing the Moranos against molestation for several decades. 
But as soon as they had increased in wealth and affluence, the establishment of a new tribunal was ordered in the province of Tucuman, it having been ascertained that quite a colony of Jews were domiciled in the Rio de la Plata. In consequence of this order, dated May 18, 1636, the Portuguese were again hounded, and many of them lost life and fortune. The Inquisition succeeded in ferreting out the fact that in Chile alone, at that time, there were no less than 28 secret Jews, most of them enjoying the rights of citizenship and living securely and at peace with their neighbors. It has now been practically ascertained that a considerable number of Jews or Moranos lived in Peru, Chile, Argentine, Cartagena, and La Plata toward the end of the 16th century, that their number and wealth increased in the first half of the 17th when the new era of persecutions was ushered in by attacks and denunciations. A notable instance, typical of the times, was the case of Francisco Maldonado de Silva. His sister, Doña Isabel Maldonado, 40 years old, on the eighth day of July, 1626, testified before the commissioner of the city of Santiago de Chile that her brother had, to her horror and indignation, confessed to being a Jew, imploring her not to betray him and using all endeavors to convert her too. He was arrested in Concepcion, Chile, April 29, 1627, and transported to Lima in July of the same year where he was imprisoned in a cell of the convent of San Domingo. He is described in the records of the tribunal as a bachelor, 33 years old, an American by birth, having been born of new Christian parents in the city of San Miguel, province of Tucumán, Peru. His father, the licentieta Diego Núñez de Silva, and his brother, Diego de Silva, were both reconciled by the Inquisition at an auto held in Lima, March 13, 1605. He confessed that he was brought up as a Catholic and that up to his 18th year he rigidly observed the tenets of the Christian faith. According to a circumstantial description of his case, he remained in prison for nearly 12 years, during which time he had many hearings and disputed with many priests who undertook to convert him. He also wrote much in defense of his views and at one time made a nearly successful effort to escape. In the last years of his confinement, he fasted very much, thereby becoming so feeble that he could not turn in his bed, being nothing but skin and bones. He was, with ten others, burnt at the stake in Lima on January 23, 1639, at a splendid and gruesome auto de fe, for which the preparations were costly and elaborate, involving fifty days of uninterrupted labor, holidays included. End of chapter 3. Read by Aviva Apfel, July 2023. Chapter 4 of History of the Jews in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Aviva Apfel. History of the Jews in America by Peter Viernick. Chapter 4. Moranos in the Portuguese Colonies. Less persecution in Portugal itself and also in its colonies. Moranos by right to emigrate. They dare to profess Judaism in Brazil and the Inquisition is introduced in Goa. Alleged help given to Holland in its struggle against Spain. While the expulsion of the Jews from Portugal, which took place five years after the great expulsion from Spain, was in many respects more cruel and accompanied by greater atrocities, notable among which were the forced conversions and the robbing of children from their Jewish parents to be brought up as Christians, the conditions in the Portuguese colonies, including Brazil, were somewhat more favorable for the reception of the Jewish refugees than in the Spanish possessions of the New World. This happened because the conditions in Portugal itself were much more favorable to the Jews prior to the era of expulsion, and the sudden severity against the Jews in 1497, which was almost unexpected, was due to the influence of the Spanish rulers. It was Queen Isabella of Spain who prevailed on King Manuel of Portugal, 
reigned 1495 to 1521, her future son-in-law, to exile the Jews of his dominion, vowing she would never set foot on Portuguese soil until the country was clear of them. In the preceding centuries, the Jews, though they were recognized and treated as a separate nation in Portugal even more than in Spain, their condition when judged by the standards of the Dark Ages was much more favorable and well-nigh secure. There are no records of systematic persecutions in Portugal before the exile from Spain. The influence of the church grew much more slowly than in the former country, and its kings followed the old Spanish policy of protecting the Jews and Moors against the encroachments of the clergy long after it was abandoned by Spain. Moranos and other Jews who escaped from the Inquisition to Portugal before the Spanish expulsion were, because the king did not want or did not dare to harbor them, permitted to go to the Orient but not to Africa, because in the latter place they could become dangerous to him as allies of the Moors. So it came to pass that while in the more extensive Spanish domains across the Atlantic, we hear only of individual crypto-Jewish settlers and more of their misfortunes and the auto de fe of which they were the victims than of their successes. We learn of considerable settlements of Moranos in Brazil early in the 16th century. But even the better conditions in the Portuguese territories must not be taken in the sense which such a term would imply today or even a hundred years ago. The Portuguese policy was cruel and vacillating, only a little less so than that of his larger and more consistent neighbor. King Manuel forbade the Neo-Christians in 1499 to leave Portugal. The prohibition was removed in 1507 and again put into effect in 1521. His successor, John III, reigned 1521-57, to was even less favorably disposed toward the secret Jews who remained in his kingdom, and in 1531 the Inquisition was introduced there by the authorization of Pope Clement VII. The Moranos bought from John's successor, King Sebastian, reigned 1557-78, to the right of free departure for the sum of 250,000 ducats. But there were other involuntary departures in the periods when the emigration of those suspected converts was prohibited. For a considerable time in the 16th century, Portugal sent annually two shiploads of Jews and criminals to Brazil, and also deported persons who had been condemned by the Inquisition. The banishment of large numbers to Brazil in 1548 is especially mentioned. Jews or Moranos were soon settled in all the Portuguese colonies, and they carried on an extensive trade with various countries. As early as 1548, according to some 1531, Portuguese Jews, it is asserted, transplanted the sugar cane from Madeira to Brazil. Some of them began to feel so secure that they dared to profess Judaism openly. The result was the introduction of the Inquisition into Goa, the metropolis of the Portuguese dominions in India, with jurisdiction over all the possessions of that country in Asia and Africa, and as far as the Cape of Good Hope. It was therefore but natural for the hunted and despairing new Christians to sympathize with the Dutch, who were at that time, beginning in 1567, fighting for their freedom, and to help them later against Portugal itself in the New World and in the Far East. The charge that the Moranos of the Indies sent considerable supplies to the Spanish and Portuguese Jews in Hamburg and Aleppo, who in turn forwarded them to Holland and Zealand, is probably not true. But the act would have certainly been justified in times when the Moranos were legally burned alive when convicted of adhesion to the religion of their forefathers. The charge also proves that the Jews and Moranos of various and distant countries were then believed to be in communication and to render assistance to one another or to their friends when the occasion required it. We may recognize in such charges the false accusations which were circulated about Jews from times immemorial to our present day, but it nevertheless tends to prove that the Jews retained some recognizable importance as international traders even in times when their fortunes were at the lowest ebb. Except for the brief period in the 17th century, which is dealt with more extensively in a subsequent chapter, in which Brazil came under the dominion of the Dutch, it remained almost entirely free of the Jews until the present time. The time was approaching when liberal and enterprising nations, pursuing a more enlightened and more profitable policy, were beginning to grant the Jewish refugee not only shelter and security, but also the religious liberty and broad human tolerance which were almost unknown in the Catholic countries in the Middle Ages. The dawn of a new era began for the Jews in Europe with the ascendancy, first of Holland and then of England, and the children of Israel were soon to share openly in the invaluable benefits which the discovery of the new world brought to mankind in general. End of chapter 4, read by Aviva Apfel, September 2023. Part 2, Chapter 5 of History of the Jews in America. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Aviva Apfel. History of the Jews in America by Peter Viernick. Part 2. The Dutch and English Colonial Period. Chapter 5. The Short-Lived Dominion of the Dutch over Brazil. The Friendship Between the Dutch and the Jews. Restrictions and Privileges in Holland. Dutch-Jewish Distributors of Indian Spices. Preparations to Introduce the Inquisition in Brazil. Jews Help the Dutch Conquer It. Southeast Description of Recife. Vieira's Description. The United Provinces of Netherland, or as it is commonly called, Holland, became a safe place for Jews as soon as the Union of Utrecht, 1579, made its independence reasonably secure. When the liberator of these provinces, William of Orange, the silent 1533 to 84, was installed as stadtholder in 1581, he declared that he should not suffer any man to be called to account molested or injured for his faith or conscience. This implied and actually resulted in better treatment of the Jews, which led to their enjoying a larger degree of prosperity and security in Holland in the following century than anywhere else. The friendship between the Jews and the Dutch which commenced at that period has never unto this day been marred by systematic persecution or any retrogressive step. It proved mutually beneficial in various parts of the world, and has cost Spain and Portugal much more than is ordinarily known even to students of history. But while the treatment was immeasurably better, the vicious principle of separation remained. The Jews in Holland were as much a nation apart, in theory at least, as in Spain and Portugal before the expulsion. They did not enjoy full rights of citizenship until they received it somewhat against their will during the French invasion at the end of the 18th century, and were not even free from other restrictions. They were not permitted to serve in the train bands or militia of the cities, but paid a compensation for their exemption therefrom. The prohibition of intermarriage with Christians could hardly be considered a hardship for Jews of the 17th century, but the fact that they were not allowed any mechanical pursuit or to engage in retail trade has a much deeper significance. It explains, at least partly, why the Dutch succeeded where the Portuguese failed, notably in that Indian trade, whose interruption by the Turkish conquest of Constantinople was the cause of searching for new water routes to the east and of the discovery of the New World. Having exiled their best international traders and kept those remaining as Muranos in constant fear, the Portuguese could not derive the full benefit from that lucrative trade in spices which was to be the reward of their great discoveries. When the Sixty Years' Captivity as the Dominion of Spain over Portugal from 1580 to 1640 is called, brought, among other disasters, the capture of the Portuguese Indian possessions by the Dutch, the superiority of the latter's methods were soon apparent. They succeeded with more ease, since with true commercial spirit, they not only imported merchandise from the east to Holland, but also distributed it through the Dutch merchants to every country in Europe. Whereas the Portuguese, in the days of their commercial monopoly, were satisfied with bringing over the commodities to Lisbon and letting foreign nations come to fetch them. It is not difficult to surmise who were those Dutch merchants who distributed the spices to every country in Europe, when we think of that class of wealthy Murano immigrants in Holland who were not permitted to follow mechanical pursuits or to engage in retail trade. Holland's tendency was clearly apparent. The Jews, mostly Portuguese, were permitted to use their wealth, their ability, and their foreign connections to carry on and extend that trade which languished in the hands of those who had banished them. The Jews were exceedingly grateful for the opportunity which Holland afforded them to be useful to themselves and to her, and the very effective results of the friendship between the Jews and the Dutch were soon apparent in the ensuing struggle between the latter and the Portuguese over the possession of Brazil. The Dutch commenced the realization of their ambitious scheme for the conquest of Brazil in the second decade of the 17th century, at a time when the large number of Moranos who lived there were terrorized by rumors of the introduction of the Inquisition. These rumors became current as early as 1610 when it was reported that the physicians of Bahia, who were mainly new Christians, prescribed port to their patients in order to lessen the suspicion that they were still adhering to Judaism. In connection with some of the earliest Brazilian intrigues in favor of the Dutch, mention is made of one Francisco Ribeiro, a Portuguese captain who is described as having many Jewish relatives in Holland. About 1618, the Inquisition in Oporto, Portugal, had arrested all merchants of Jewish extraction. 
Many of the victims were engaged in Brazilian trade, and the Inquisitor General applied to the government to assist the Holy Office to recover such parts of their effects as might be in the hands of their agents in Brazil. Accordingly, Don Luis de Sousa was charged to send home a list of all the new Christians in Brazil with the most precise information that can be obtained of their property and place of abode. It seems highly probable that it was the Dutch war alone which prevented the introduction of the dreaded tribunal in Brazil. The Dutch West India Company, which was formed in 1622 in furtherance of the project of conquering Brazil, had Jews of Amsterdam among its large stockholders and several of them in its board of directors. One of the arguments in favor of its organization was that the Portuguese themselves, some of them from their hatred of Castile, others because of their intermarriage with new Christians and their consequent fear of the Inquisition, would either willingly join or feebly oppose an invasion, and all that was needful was to treat them well and give them liberty of conscience. When the Dutch fleet was sent to Bahia, all the necessary information was obtained from Jews. The city was taken in 1624, and Willikin, the Dutch commander, at once issued a proclamation offering liberty, free possession of their property, and free enjoyment of religion to all who would submit. This brought over about 200 Jews who exerted themselves to induce others to follow their example. Bahia was recaptured by the Portuguese in 1625, and though the treaty for its deliverance provided for the safety of other inhabitants, the new Christians were abandoned and five of them were put to death. Many others, however, seem to have remained there for several years. Another foothold was gained by the Dutch when the city of Recife, or Pernambuco, which had a large crypto-Jewish population, was captured in 1631. Most of the Jews and new Christians from Bahia and other Brazilian towns soon removed to that city. The conquerors appealed to Holland for colonists and craftsmen of all kinds, and many Portuguese Jews came over in response to that call. Robert Southey, the historian of Brazil, asserts that the Jews were made excellent subjects of Holland. Some of the Portuguese Brazilians gladly threw off the mask which they had so long been compelled to wear and joined their brethren in the synagogue. The open joy with which they celebrated their ceremonies attracted too much notice. It excited the horror of the Catholics, and even the Dutch themselves, less liberal than their own laws, pretended that the toleration of Holland did not extend to Brazil. The result was an edict by which the Jews were ordered to perform their rites more privately. When in 1645 Vieira was inciting the Portuguese to reconquer Brazil, he pointed particularly to Recife, calling attention to the fact that the city is chiefly inhabited by Jews, most of whom were originally fugitives from Portugal. They have their open synagogues there to the scandal of Christianity. For the honor of the faith, therefore, the Portuguese ought to risk their lives and property in putting down such an abomination. The Portuguese, who had shortly before thrown off the Spanish yoke and regained their independence at home, responded to that call and redoubled their effort to reconquer their gigantic South American colony. But although the history of the first really Jewish settlements in the New World was brief, extending over less than two decades, it was so brilliant in itself and had such far-reaching consequences in the settlements of Jews in other parts of America that another chapter must be devoted to its description. End of chapter 5 Read by Aviva Apfel, October 2023. Chapter 6 of History of the Jews in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Jews in America by Peter Wiernick. Hesife, the first Jewish community in the New World. The Cajal Kodesh of Hesife, or Pernambuco in Brazil, Manasseh ben Israel's expectation to make it his home, large immigration from Amsterdam, Isaac of Boab da Fonseca and his colleagues, first rabbis and Jewish authors of the New World, the siege and the surrender, the return and the nucleus of other communities in various parts of America. The rebuke to the joyful demonstrations of the Jews in Hesife did not prevent the establishment there of the first real Jewish community in the New World. The Dutch Stadtholder of Brazil, John Maurice of Nassau, was a just and honorable official who encouraged the development of the community and its steady increase by immigration. The Jews of Hesife, who were soon numbered by thousands, called themselves Kahal Kodesh, the Holy Congregation and had a governing body consisting of David Sr. Coronel, 
Abraham de Mercado, Jacob Mugathe, and Isaac Castuno. One of the earliest settlers there was Ephraim Suiro, a stepbrother, or brother-in-law, of the famous rabbi of Amsterdam, Manasseh ben Israel, 1904-1957. Don Francisco Fernandez de Mora, who had a grandchild in Amsterdam, held important offices, while another member of the community, Gaspar Diaz Ferreira, was considered one of the wealthiest men in the country. Dr. Kaiserling, in his paper on The Earliest Rabbis and Jewish Writers in America, Publications 3, page 13 and following, quotes from the correspondence between the old Vossius and Hugo Grotius, in which they speak of the intention of their mutual friend, the above-named Rabbi Manasseh, to emigrate to Brazil in order to improve his material condition, which was unsatisfactory in Amsterdam, notwithstanding the high communal position which he held there. He dedicated the second part of his conciliador to the prominent men of the congregation of Hasife, probably in anticipation of the expected journey, which, however, was never made. But though the man who was later to induce Oliver Cromwell to admit Jews into England did not come, other reputable Hebrew scholars soon arrived to lend luster to the new congregation. In 1642, about 600 Spanish-Portuguese Jews from Amsterdam embarked for Brazil, accompanied by two men of learning, Isaac Abab de Fonseca, 1605-1693, and Moses Rafael de Aguilar, died 1679. Aboab became the Chacham, or Rabbi, the first in America. Aguilar, who was also a grammarian, became the reader or cantor. A congregation was also organized at Tamarica, which had its own Chacham, Jacob Lagarto, the first Talmudical author in the Western Hemisphere. A certain Jacob de Aguilar is also mentioned as a Brazilian rabbi of that time. Considerable numbers of Jews also resided at other places in Brazil, particularly at Itamarica, Rio de Janeiro, and Paraíba, but Hesife was the great center, and its fame soon spread even into the Old World. Neuhoff, the historian, writes that the Jews there had built stately homes, that they had a vast traffic, and purchased sugar mills. Several years later, they raised large sums to assist the Dutch in defending the coast. The last and most important immigrants were barely settled when the sanguinary struggle between the Portuguese and the Dutch for the possession of the colony began in 1645 a conspiracy into which native Portuguese entered for the purpose of assassinating the Dutch authorities at a banquet in the capital was discovered and exposed by a Jew, and a possible sudden termination of Dutch rule was averted. Open war broke out in 1646, and Hesife had to endure a long and costly siege. Jews vied with Dutch in suffering and in bravery, and there was a record of the fact that Moranos in Portugal used their influence to call the attention of the government of the Netherlands to the gravity of the situation in South America. But the resources of the West India Company were exhausted by the possession of Brazil, and as the home government would not or could not give it proper support, the heroism and the self-sacrifice of both Dutch and Jews served only to prolong the struggle. It probably also served to cement the friendship between the defenders, who were later to dwell together for longer periods in other parts of America. A Boab commemorated the thrilling experience of this war in the introductory chapter of his Hebrew version of Abraham Cohen Herrera's Porta Seli, Shahar Ha Shomayim. He also wrote a poetical account of the siege in a work entitled Zekar Rab, Prayers, Confessions, and Supplications, which were composed for the purpose of appealing to God in the trouble and the distress of the congregation when the troops of Portugal overwhelmed them during their sojourn in Brazil in 5406, 1646. The rabbi ordered fasts and prayers, while wealthy members of the community, like Abraham Cohen, contributed material support. Many of the Jewish immigrants were killed by the enemy, many died of starvation, the remainder were exposed to death from various causes. Those who were accustomed to delicacies were glad to be able to satisfy their hunger with dry bread. Soon they could not obtain even this. They were in want of everything, and were preserved alive as if by a miracle. Among the instances of individual heroism which deserve to be recorded is that of one of the Pintos, who is said to have manned the fort 
dos afrogades single-handed until overwhelmed by superior force he was compelled to surrender on the 23rd of january 1654 Recife, together with the neighboring cities of Maristad, Baraiba, Itamarica, Sierra, and other Hollandish possessions, proceeded to the Portuguese conquerors with the condition that a general amnesty should be granted. The Jews, as loyal supporters of the Dutch, were promised every consideration. Nevertheless, the new Portuguese governor ordered them to quit Brazil at once. Sixteen vessels were placed at their disposal to carry them and their property wherever they chose to go, and they were also furnished with passports and safeguards. Aboab, Aguilar, the Nazis, Pereiras, the Mesas, Abraham de Castro, and Joshua Zarfati, both surnamed El Brasil, and many others returned to Amsterdam. Jacob de Velocino, born in Pernambuco, 1639, died in Holland, 1712. The first Hebrew author born on American soil settled at The Hague. Others went to Suriname, Cayenne, and Curaçao, and it is generally assumed that the first Jewish settlers who in that year arrived in New Amsterdam, the future New York, came directly, or at least indirectly, from Pernambuco. The community of Hesife formed thus, by its dissolution, the nucleus of several of the oldest and most important Jewish communities in the New World. End of chapter 6《ヒストリー・オブ・ジュース・アメリカ》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《ヒストリー・オブ・ジュース・アメリカ》by Peter Wiernick。The Jews in Suriname or Dutch Guiana。Jews in Brazil after the expulsion of the Dutch。The community of Paramaibo, Suriname, was founded when Hesife was still flourishing. First contact with the English, whom the Jews preferred, David Nasi and the colony of Cayenne, privileges granted by Lord Willoughby, de Juden Savana, trouble with slaves and bush negroes, plantations with Hebrew names, German Jews, legal status and banishments, Jewish theaters, literature and history. The history of the Jews in Brazil practically ends with the termination of the Dutch rule, and there is a gap which extends until the new settlements at the beginning of the 20th century. There was the usual aftermath of Muranos and persecutions, which was almost a repetition of the happenings under Portuguese domination prior to the short liberal era under Holland sway. Some new Christians continued to reside in Brazil after the capitulation of 1654, their number was largely increased towards the end of the 17th century, when Portugal again banished to Brazil the Moranos who had become reconciled. These transportations continued from 1682 to 1707, and the Jews again became to be known as a distinct class. They were closely watched, however, and many were sent back to Lisbon from time to time to be tried by the Inquisition. Many Jews from Rio were burned at an auto de fe at Lisbon in 1723. Several of these martyrs were men of great repute, the most prominent being the famous Portuguese poet and dramatist Antonio José de Silva, a native of Rio de Janeiro, who was burned as a Jew at Lisbon in 1739. In 1734, Jews appear to have been influential in controlling the price of diamonds in Brazil. The transportations to Lisbon of those accused of Judaizing had become so common at the middle of the 18th century that a wide ruin was produced, and many sugar mills at the Rio stopped in consequence. The influential Marquis de Pombal, with all his power, did not venture to proclaim toleration for the Jews, but he succeeded in having laws enacted, making it penal for any person to reproach another for his Jewish origin, and removing all disabilities of Jewish blood, even from the descendants of those who had suffered under the Inquisition. He prohibited public autos de fe, and required all lists of families of Jewish extraction to be delivered up. These statutes deprived the Inquisition of its most important means of accusation, and as a result, the Moranos were ultimately absorbed in the Catholic population of Brazil. The Jewish community, which is founded in Suriname or Dutch Guiana, near Brazil, in the days when the community of Hesife was still in a flourishing condition, 
and which soon rose to prominence after the dispersion of the latter, has enjoyed an almost uninterrupted existence until the present day. According to the latest researches, the oldest indication in the archives of the Dutch Portuguese Jews shows that the Jews had already settled in Suriname in the year 1639. Footnote 5. Rabbi P. A. Helfman of Paramaibo, Suriname, in Publications 16, page 7 and following, supplementing the chronology made by Professor Richard Gottheil in the same publications at the beginning of Volume 4. See also Rev. J. S. Rus of the Dutch Congregation in Paramaibo, Ibid, Volume 13, page 126 and following. End footnote. As far as can be traced, the first Jewish marriage was celebrated there between Chacham Isaac Mehatob and Judith Mahatob in 1643. The text of the Ketubah, which has been preserved, proves that Suriname, or rather the city of Paramaribo, had already in that year a sufficient number of Jews to require the services of a Chacham or Rabbi. Though the Dutch had claims on it, Guiana was at that time practically British territory, and it was there that the Jew came first in contact with the Englishmen in the New World, many years before they began to dwell together in North America. And while it was recognized that of all European nations, the Dutch were then the most friendly to the Jews, many of the latter who had experience with both nationalities in that part of the world soon learned to prefer the English. Lord Willoughby, who arrived for the second time in Suriname in 1652, brought with him several Jewish families, and the community was thus increasing even before the influx of refugees from Brazil two years later. On September 12, 1659, the Jews were permitted under the patronage of David Nassi to found a colony on the island of Cayenne, French Guiana. According to the tenor of the 18 articles contained in the letters patent of that date, all the land over which they exercised the right of possession within four years from that date would become their property, and they would be allowed to administer justice according to the Jewish usages and customs. The colony was further increased by the arrival, in 1660, of 152 Jews from Lehorn, Italy. But the four years limit was barely passed when the French took Cayenne in 1664, and all the Jews left the island for Suriname, under the leadership of the above-mentioned David Nassi. The French of the time of the great monarch Louis XIV would not suffer Jews to be settled in their colonies. A century and a quarter had to pass before France, shaken to its very foundations by the Great Revolution which began in 1789, was the first of modern European nations to grant its Jews the absolute equality which was implied in full citizenship. Even while the Portuguese Jews were still in Cayenne, they were given by Lord Willoughby in 1662 the same privileges in Suriname as the English colonists. A year after their return, on August 17, 1665, was issued the famous grant of privileges by the Governor, Council and Assembly of Suriname, of which the preamble reads as follows. Whereas, it is good and sound policy to encourage as much as possible whatever may tend to the increase of a new colony, and to invite persons of whatsoever country and religion to come and reside here and to traffic with us, and whereas, we found that the Hebrew nation, now already resident here, have, with their persons and property, proved themselves useful and beneficial to this colony, and being desirous further to encourage them to continue their residence and trade here, we have, with the authority of the governor, his council and assembly pass the following act. The provisions of the act, the full text of which is reproduced in publications, volume 3, pages 145 to 146, volume 9, pages 144 to 145, and volume 16, pages 179 to 180, is extremely favorable to the Jews. The British government of Suriname therein ratified all former privileges of the Jews, guaranteed them full enjoyment and free exercise of their religious rights and usages, and made void any summons served upon them on their Sabbaths and holidays. They were not to be called for any public duties on those days, except in urgent cases. Civil suits of less value than 10,000 pounds of sugar were to be decided by their elders, and the magistrates were obliged to enforce their judgments. They were also permitted to bequeath their property according to their own laws of inheritance. They were given ten acres of land for the erection of a synagogue and such buildings as the congregation might need, 
and in order to induce Jews to settle there, it was decided that all who came for that purpose should be considered as British-born subjects, in return for obeying all the decrees of the King of England, which did not infringe on their privileges. For Portuguese Jews of that 17th century, i.e., for extremely conservative Jews whose relatives were at that very time tortured and burned at the stake for adherence to their religion, these privileges were probably much more acceptable than an outright admission to full citizenship could have been. There was no desire or striving for assimilation on either side in those times. No especially organized movement was necessary to emphasize the fact, which was then self-evident, of the existence of a separate Hebrew nation. Nobody thought otherwise before the philosophers of the 18th century instilled in the minds of the civilized nations the idea of the modern assimilationist. The frank selfishness of the preamble was, therefore, a better guarantee of good faith and more convincing than phrases about humanity and inherent rights could possibly be in those illiberal times. The English were thus less sentimental and more businesslike in their dealings with the Jews than the Dutch, and were probably on that account more trusted. When Suriname became a Dutch province, July 13, 1667, the Jews were allowed all rights of citizenship. Still, a number of them left with the English and went to Jamaica. Another declaration by the home government of Holland, made two years later to the Jews of Suriname, that they would be allowed free exercise of their religion, tends to prove that there must have been cases, or at least fears, of restraint in that respect. Even if the documents relating to the attempted departure of the Jews from Suriname in 1675 edited by Dr. J. H. Hollander in Publications 6, pages 9 through 29, in which the anxiety of many Jews to leave Suriname for British territory is described, should be considered as somewhat exaggerated. It could not have been entirely an invention. The Jews' preference for the British rule was therewith clearly established, and so was their acknowledged usefulness in the newly founded colonies. The Jews of Suriname were then chiefly engaged in agriculture, the wealthy among them being large planters and slaveholders. The chief men of the congregation were David Nassi, Isaac Pereira, Isaac Ares, Enriquez de Caceres, Rafael Aboab, Samuel Nassi, Isaac R. de Pardo, Aaron de Silva, Alaus de Fonseca, Isaac Mera, Daniel Messia, Jacob Nunes, Israel Calabi Sid, Isaac da Costa, Isaac Drago, Bento da Costa. The first synagogue was built in 1672 on an elevated spot in Thorarica, belonging to the Jews da Costa and Solis. There are still some tombstones with illegible Hebrew inscriptions. We hear about that time of Rabbi Isaac Neto, who was called from England as minister of the congregation of Paramaribo, 1674 or 1680, and later we found recorded the name of another rabbi, David Pardo, who also came from London and died in 1713 or 1717. The last named wrote, while still in Europe, Zephyr Sholchan Tahor, Amsterdam, 1686, extracts from the Sholchan Aruk, and is considered the most distinguished rabbi of Suriname. In 1682, the above-named Samuel Nassi, who has been described as Capitaine and as the richest planter in Suriname, gave to the Jews an island on the river Suriname, about 70 miles from the sea, where most of them settled, and which was henceforth known as the Juden Savanna, Savannah of the Jews, the name originally meaning a treeless region, and was the principal seat of the Jewish community of Suriname. It was there that the congregation Baraka we Shalom, Blessing and Peace, built its splendid synagogue in 1685. One hundred years later, the centennial of the dedication of that synagogue was appropriately celebrated on Wednesday, Heshwan 8, 5546, October 12, 1785, of which a record was printed in Amsterdam the following year, partly in Hebrew and partly in Dutch. See Rost. Catalogue der Rosenthalschen Bibliothek, 1st, page 738. When a French squadron attacked Suriname in 1689, the Jews under the leadership of Samuel Nassi did good service in beating them off. Similar valuable service was rendered in 1712, this time under Capitan Isaac Pinto, against another French attack under Cassard. 
The unfriendliness of the French was demonstrated again in that year, when they took the Jewish savannah and desecrated the synagogue by slaughtering a pig on the Teba or Amud. The Jews, on the other hand, did not always get the protection to which they were entitled. When the slaves on the plantation of M. Mahado revolted and killed their master in 1690, Governor von Schrepenhutzen refused to assist the Jews. At a later period in 1718, when there was continual trouble with Bush Negroes, who destroyed the plantation of David Nassi, they were chastised by Jews under the leadership of Capitan Jacob Davilar. David Nassi, 1672 to 1743, himself served under him with distinction, and his praises were sung by the Judeo-Spanish poetess Benvenide Belmonte. We also find traces of legal restrictions in such instances as the decree of 1703, by which all Jewish marriages contracted in Suriname up to that year are confirmed, but henceforth they must be made in conformity with the Dutch marriage law of 1580. Sunday closing laws were also brought into force against them, but they were later repealed. A list of the names of about 65 plantations belonging to Jews at that period and the names of the owners has been preserved. Publications 9, page 129 and following. Some of the plantations bear Hebrew names like Carmel, Hebron, Succoth, and Beersheba. The number of Jews in Suriname was then, about 1694, 570, consisting of 92 Dutch or Portuguese families, about 50 unmarried persons, and 10 or 12 German families. They possessed about 9,000 slaves. Difficulties between the earlier settlers and the Germans who arrived later soon arose, and in 1734 the latter requested permission to form a separate community, which was granted. They were, however, prohibited to own any possession on the Jewish savannah, nor were they allowed to have their own jurisdiction. The act of the separation of the Hugdeutsche, High German Jews, who founded the congregation Neue Shalom, is dated January 5, 1735. It is signed by A. Henry de Schoises, governor, and Samuel Uz Davilar, Ishak Carello, Abraham Pinto, Jr., Jehoshua C. Nassi for the Portuguese, Solomon Joseph Levy, I. Meyer Wolf, Garrett Jacobs, Jakob Ahrens Polak for the German Jews. The Portuguese thereupon built a new synagogue, Zedek Weshalom, which was dedicated in 1737. But the Germans also stuck to the Portuguese Minhag, or prayer book, and we have it on the authority of Rabbi Ross of Paramaribo, 1905, that there never existed a synagogue with a Minhag Ashkenaz in Suriname. Bloody conflicts with Negroes continued for about 40 years longer, and many valiant deeds of Jewish military leaders and their followers embellished the records of that period. David Nassi was killed in battle at the age of 71 in 1743, after being successful in more than 30 skirmishes, and was succeeded as Capitan by Isaac Carvalho. In 1749, another Jewish Capitan, Nahr, won a victory against the Alka Negroes. Well, in 1750, young Isaac Nassi and 300 of his men were killed by an overwhelming force of Bush Negroes. At last, in 1774, forts were erected and a military line drawn from the savannah of the Jews along the river Comoimber to the sea, and we hear no more of Negro wars. The legal status of the Jews was undergoing some changes, as is almost unavoidable so long as there is not the same law for Jew and Gentile alike. Some measures could be considered as improvements, like the law of 1749, which granted the Jews of Suriname their own judiciary in matters affecting less than 600 gulden. On the other hand, we hear of an unsuccessful attempt in 1768 to institute a ghetto in Paramaribo, and in 1775, Jews were forbidden to visit a certain amateur theater of that town. At that time, the two communities also began to make use of the right which was bestowed on them by the English Charter of Privilege, and later confirmed by the Dutch authorities, of banishing troublesome people and persons of bad demeanor. The deputies of the Jewish nation had only to declare to the governor the reasons why they wished to have these persons banished, and they were expelled. The above-named Rabbi J. S. Ross has noted five cases of such banishments. Solomon Montel was banished in 1761 on the request of the Portuguese deputies because he refused to restitute rents or usury, which is contrary to the Mosaic law. 
In 1772, Noah Isaacs was banished on the request of the German deputies, and in the following year, Abraham Isaac Moses Michael Fernandez Enriquez, alias Escarabajos, was, on the request of the Portuguese deputies, made to quit the place. Elias Levin was banished in 1781 by the Germans, and Abraham de Mesquita, the last of those exiled, belonged to the Portuguese part of the community. The German Jews kept on increasing in numbers, and in 1780, their synagogue in Paramaribo was enlarged and two burial grounds were procured. In 1784, the Jewish theater of that city, probably the first in modern history, was enlarged and embellished. The savanna, of which only ruins remain now, was on its decline, and had only about 40 houses in 1792, while the community in Paramaribo was growing, and two Jewish playhouses are mentioned in that year. The Portuguese were still the majority, numbering 834, but the Germans were gaining fast, and from the ten families at the end of the 17th century, they rose now to the number of 477. There were also about 100 Jewish mulattoes in Paramaribo at that time. The Jews of Suriname in that period also commenced to display considerable literary activity. J.C. Nassi and others wrote the Essay historique sur la colonie de Suriname avec l'histoire de la nation juive y établie, Paramaribo, 1788, which is one of the principal sources of the history of the Jews of Suriname, a highly interesting correspondence between representative Jews of that community and Christian Wilhelm von Dom, 1751-1820, relating to the latter's work favoring the Jews, is printed at the end of that essay, reproduced in Publications 13, pages 133-135. to 135. Various other works of historical, religious, and poetical nature were written and published there in the following half-century. The history of the community of Paramaribo in the 19th century is uneventful. In 1836, when the German congregation, which now numbered 719 souls, already exceeded the Portuguese portion, which had declined to 684, a new Hogdeutsche of Nederlandsche synagogue was erected. In 1838, Rabbi B.C. Carillon became the spiritual head of the Dutch Portuguese congregation. Twenty years later, M. J. Lewenstein, 1829-1864, was inaugurated as the chief rabbi of the congregation of Paramaribo and held the position for six years until his death. In 1900, the city contained about 1,500 Jews, who occupied an honorable position and controlled the principal property of the colony. Even modern anti-Semitism has not failed to invade this distant Jewish settlement, the oldest in the New World. At present, 1911, there are about 4,000 Jews in Suriname, mostly in Paramaribo, which now has about 50,000 inhabitants. The two communities, both strongly Orthodox, are still in existence, and each has its rabbi. The most prominent Jewish citizen in the colony is Mr. David da Costa, a former president of the provincial parliament, who was lately appointed by the Dutch government to be the presiding judge of the Supreme Court of the colony. Mr. da Costa was for many years Parnas, or president, of the Portuguese congregation. Another member of the Jewish community, M. Benjamin, is at the head of the educational system of the province. Several families trace their descent from the original settlers who came there in 1639, and all of them, now fully enfranchised for several generations, have no other mother tongue than the Dutch. Their staunch orthodoxy has saved them from being absorbed in the non-Jewish population, as happened with most of the early settlers in the British colonies in North America. End of chapter 7《ラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラ Plans of Jewish colonization, trade communication with New Amsterdam, Stuyvesant's slur, 
the First Congregation, Departures to North America and to Venezuela, Barbados, Taxation and Legal Status, Decay after the Hurricane of 1831, Jamaica under Spain and under England, Hebrew taught in the parish of St. Andrews in 1693, Harsh Measures and Excessive Taxation, Naturalizations. Another early settlement on Dutch territory, which is still in a flourishing condition, is on the island of Curacao, Dutch West Indies. It is probable that Jews from Holland were among the first settlers in the island under the Dutch government, which captured it from Spain in 1634. But there is no definite record until 1650, when twelve Jewish families, de Mesa, Abwab, Perrier, de Leon, Le Pera, Toro, Cardoz, Jesurum, Marquena, Chavis, Oliveira, and Anoricos Cotino were granted permission by Prince Maurice of Orange to settle there. Matthias Bach, governor of the island, was directed to grant them land and supply them with the slaves, horses, cattle, and agricultural implements in order to further the cultivation and develop the natural resources of the island. The land assigned to them was situated at the northern outskirts of the present district of Willemstead, which is still known as the Jodenvik, Jewish Quarter. But, despite the favorable conditions under which they settled there, severe restrictions were put on their movements, and they were even prohibited in 1653 from purchasing additional Negro slaves, which they needed for their farms. By a special grant of privilege dated February 22, 1652, Joseph Nunez de Fonseca, known also as David Nasi, who undertook to emigrate and take with him a large number of people under a Jewish patron named Jean de Ilion, two leagues of land along the coast were to be given him for every fifty families, and four leagues for every hundred families which he should bring over. The colonists were exempted from taxes for ten years and could select the land on which they desired to settle. They were also accorded religious liberty, though they were restrained from compelling Christians to work for them on Sunday, nor were any others to labor on that day. The project was, however, not carried out on any extensive scale. It was only after the reconquest of Brazil by the Portuguese in 1654, and the consequent expulsion and dispersion of the Jews from the territory, which was now again forbidden to them, that their effective settlement in Curacao began. The Brazilian Jews who came there in that period brought with them considerable wealth, and they laid the foundation of that prominence in the commerce of the island which they have since retained. Shortly afterwards, 1657, regular communications for the purposes of trade were established between New Amsterdam and Curacao, and it was principally in the hands of Jews. An original bill of lading, in Spanish, and an invoice of goods shipped from Curacao to New Netherland in 1658, and addressed to Joshua Mordecai Enriquez, includes Venetian pearls and pendants, thimbles, scissors, knives, bells, etc. An illicit trade was also carried on with Isaac de Fonseca de Barbados, which tended to undermine the trade monopoly enjoyed by the Dutch West Indies Company. But Fonseca's threat to abandon Curacao and turn his trade towards Jamaica kept the authorities from interfering. Peter Stuyvesant, 1592 to 1672, the governor of New Netherlands, complained to the directors of the West India Company in the following year that the Jews in Curacao were allowed to hold Negro slaves and were granted other privileges not enjoyed by the colonies of New Netherlands and he demanded for his own people, if not more, at least the same privileges as were enjoyed by the usurious and covetous Jews. The congregation Mikwa Israel was founded in 1656 under the direction of the Spanish and Portuguese community of Amsterdam, and regular daily services were held in a small wooden building, which was rented for the purpose. The Reverend Abraham Hayam Lopez de Fonseca, who, according to one of the oldest tombstones on the Jewish burial ground in Curacao, died A.B. 225432, 1672, was the earliest Hazan, or rabbi, whose name has come down to us. The first regularly appointed Hakim was Joshua Pardo, who arrived from Amsterdam in 1674 and remained until 1683 when he left for Jamaica. A new synagogue was erected in 1692 and consecrated on the eve of Passover of that year, 
The service is being read by the Hazan David Rafael Lopez de Fonseca, died 1707. The building, which was enlarged in 1731, still stands. In the last decade of the 17th century, a considerable number of Jews left the island for the continent of America, many of them, including the Toro family, going to Newport. A number of Italian settlers who originally came from the Jewish colony of Cayenne, which was dispersed in 1664, went to Tucacas, Venezuela, where they established a congregation called Santa Hermandade. The prosperity of those who remained in Curacao went on increasing in the 18th century. A benevolent society was established in 1715. Five years later, they responded liberally to an appeal for aid from the congregation Sharif Israel of New York and in 1756 met with an equal generosity a similar appeal from the Jews of Newport. By 1750, their numbers had increased to about 2,000. They were prosperous merchants and traders, and held positions of prominence in the commercial and political affairs of the island. By the end of the century, they owned a considerable part of the property in the district of Willemstead, and as many as 53 vessels are said to have left in one day for Holland, laden with goods, which for the most part belonged to Jewish merchants. A new congregation, which called itself Nua Shalom, and occupied a tract across the harbor from Willemstead, was organized about 1740, and its synagogue in the Otrabanda was consecrated on, on Elu 12, 5505, 1745. It was established chiefly in order to save those who lived there from crossing the water on the Sabbath to attend divine services and for a time it was regarded as merely a branch of the older congregation, and as under its direction. This led to a series of disputes which culminated in 1749 in an open breach. It was settled by the intervention of Prince William Charles of Orange Nassau, in a decree dated April 30, 1750, in which the original jurisdiction of the older congregation, subject to the regulations of the Portuguese community of Amsterdam, was sustained. The arrangement lasted for the following 120 years, when the younger congregation became independent, 1870. The increase in numbers and material well-being continued during the 19th century, but the community was not without internal dissensions. It was due to one of these controversies between the Pamasim and the ministers that a society called the Porvenir was founded in 1862. In the following year, it developed into a reform congregation under the name Emmanuel, whose new synagogue in the quarter Scarlo was dedicated in 1866. About three years before, a moderate change in the direction of reform was introduced into the liturgy of the oldest congregation. The congregations of Curacao now have more than 1,000 members, nearly four-fifths of it belonging to Mikwa Israel. The Jews are among the leading citizens of the island, in business as well as in the professions. They occupy executive and judicial positions and are well represented among the officers of the militia. Almost all of them, like in Holland itself, are true to their religion, and there are probably less apostasies and in intermarriages than in any other free community in which the emancipation of the Jews has been fully carried out in theory as well as in practice. The Jewish settlements in the British West Indies also enjoyed long periods of increase in prosperity, but they declined when the English colonies of the North American continent, and later the United States, offered a wider field of activities and better opportunities under conditions which are so similar to those prevailing in the older places as to make the change of residence a matter of very little inconvenience. The oldest settlement under the English flag in the West Indies was probably on the island of Barbados where, it is believed, Jews came first in 1628. On April 27, 1655, Oliver Cromwell issued passes to Abraham de Mercado, M.D., Hebrew, and his son, Raphael, to go to Barbados to exercise his profession. In 1656, the Jews were granted, upon petition, the enjoyment of the privileges of the laws and statutes of the Commonwealth of England and of the island relating to foreigners and strangers. In April 1661, Benjamin de Caceres, Henry de Caceres, and Jacob Frazo petitioned the King of England to permit them to live and trade in Barbados and Suriname. 
their petition was supported by the king of denmark which tends to prove that they must have been men of considerable importance in the report made by the commissioners of foreign plantations to whom it was referred it is stated the whole question of the advisability of allowing jews to reside in and trade with his majesty's colonies hath been long and often debated the merchants of england were opposed to the admission of jews because of their ability to control trade wherever they entered and because they would divert it from england to foreign countries the planters on the contrary favored their admission and accused the merchants of aiming to appropriate the whole trade to themselves the commissioners refrained from deciding the general question but advised that these three highly recommended jews who had behaved themselves well and with general satisfaction in barbados should be granted a special license to reside there or in any other plantations the jewish community was soon increased to a considerable extent partly by the arrival of former members of the dissolved colony of Kaying, 1664. It is recorded in the minutes of the vestry of St. Michael's Parish, July 9, 1666, that the Jews inhabiting this parish do pay the quantity of 35,000 pounds Muscovado sugar to be levied by themselves and pay to Senior Luis Diaz and Senor Geronimo Rodriguez who are hereby ordered to pay it to the present church wardens the order is repeated in october sixteen sixty six and again in sixteen sixty seven and in that year another order making the levy for the year twenty thousand pounds was issued in sixteen sixty nine the order in january was for fourteen thousand pounds and in march for sixteen thousand in sixteen seventy it was again for sixteen thousand but the jews sent in a petition declaring the amount to be excessive this had the effect of reducing the amount of the tax to seven thousand pounds in sixteen seventy one and to half of what was levied last year in sixteen seventy two for the following five years it was mostly seven thousand pounds a year levied for their trade in sixteen eighty it is eight thousand five hundred pounds apportioned among forty five jews some being made to contribute only twelve pounds several others as high as seven hundred and ninety two each with david raphael de mercado heading the list with one thousand seventy five pounds see list of names in publications nineteen pages one seventy four to one seventy five antonio rodrigo regio abraham levi regio luis diaz isaac gerato cotino abraham Pereira david baruch lozada and other hebrews who were made free denizens by his majesty's letters patent petitioned in sixteen sixty nine about the refusal to accept the testimony of jews in the courts of the colony the governor in forwarding the petition says that they had not been exposed to any other injuries in their trade or otherwise but the privilege granted was only for cases relating to trade and dealing special taxes continued to be imposed at various times until seventeen sixty one when all additional burdens were lifted and afterwards the jews were raided and paid taxes on the same scale as other inhabitants all political disabilities were removed by act of the local government in eighteen o two and by act of parliament in eighteen twenty the number of jews in barbados was never as large as that of Suriname in sixteen eighty one the total jewish population of the island was two hundred and sixty they went on increasing slowly the great majority living in bridgetown where the first synagogue was erected probably prior to sixteen seventy nine and a small number in Svetstown. in seventeen ninety two at the beginning of the period of the greatest prosperity of the community the congregation of bridgetown had a hundred and forty seven members and seventeen pensioners were supported the name of the congregation was Kehol Kodesh Nid Israel, and its ministers were all selected by the vestry of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in London. The decline of the Jewish community of Barbados dates from the great hurricane in 1831, which devastated the island and also destroyed the synagogue. Though a new edifice was erected and dedicated in 1833, and even a religious school was established several years later, the members kept on leaving the island for the United States most of them going to philadelphia in eighteen forty eight there were only seventy one jews left in eighteen seventy three those remaining petitioned for relief from taxation of property held by the congregation 
The census of 1882 showed 21 Jews, and the number was still smaller at the end of the 19th century. When England conquered the largest of its West Indian possessions, the island of Jamaica, in 1655, a considerable number of Jews, known as Portugals, were living there. They dared not profess Judaism openly or organize themselves into a congregation, but they were less in danger on account of their faith than in any other Spanish colony. The proprietary rights of the island was vested in the family of Columbus until about 1576, when it passed to the female Braganza line, and these exclusive rights exempted the island from the jurisdiction of the Inquisition and prevented it from being included in the bishopric of Cuba. The British were careful to distinguish between the Portuguese Jews and the Spaniards, with the result that the Jews at once began to establish and develop the commercial prosperity of the colony. Sir Thomas Lynch, governor of Jamaica, writing in March 1672 to the Council for Trade and Transportation, mentions, as points in favor of the Jews, that they have great stocks, no people, and aversions to the French and Spaniards. Several years before that time, Jacob Joshua Bueno Enriquez, a resident of Jamaica for two years, petitioned the king for permission to work a copper mine, and that he and his brothers, Joseph and Moita, may use their own laws and hold synagogues. In 1668, Solomon Gebe Faro and David Gomez Enriquez were recommended by the king to the governor to remain and trade in Jamaica as long as they behaved well and fairly. There were considerable increases by arrivals from Brazil, later from the withdrawal of the British from Suriname, by direct immigration from England and even from Germany. But there must have been also considerable emigration of Jews, for at the end of the 17th century, the number of Jews in Jamaica is figured at 80. While the inclusion of Hebrew in the curriculum of the Free School, which was established in the parish of St. Andrews in 1693, the earliest known instance of the teaching of Hebrew in an English settlement in the New World may be taken as a concession to the Jewish inhabitants. There was no lack of harsh and galling measures. In 1703, the Jews were prohibited, under penalty of 500 pounds, from holding Christian servants. In 1711, they were prohibited, along with mulattoes, Indians, and Negroes, from being employed as clerks in any of the judicial or other offices. The struggle of the Jews of Jamaica against heavy taxation forms an interesting chapter in their history at the beginning of the 18th century. See Publications 2, page 165. In 1700, a memorial was presented to Sir William Beeston, Governor-in-Chief of the island of Jamaica, against the excessive special taxation of four assemblies and against being forced to bear arms on our Sabbath and holy days without any necessity or urgent occasion, which is quite contrary to our religion unless in case of necessity, when an enemy is in sight or apprehension of being near us. The reply by the governor and council begins with the admission of the truth of the statement about taxation, but a counterclaim is advanced that their first introduction into this island was on the condition that they should settle and plant, which they do not there being but one considerable and two or three small settlements of the Jews in all the island. But their employment is generally keeping of shops and merchandise, by the first of which they have engrossed that employment, and by their parsimonious living, which I do not charge as a fault in them, they have thereby means of underselling the English, that they cannot, many in them, follow that employment, nor can they in reason put their children to the Jews to be trained up in that profession, by which the English nation think they suffer much, both in their own advantages and what may be made to their children hereafter. The governor then proceeds to explain that the Jews themselves requested that they might on any occasion be taxed by the lump, and that because of their controlling of trade, especially of the retail trade, the assembly have thought it but just that they should pay something in proportion more than the English. He continues, as for their bearing of arms, it must be owned that when any public occasion has happened, or an enemy appeared, that they might have been ready and behaved themselves very well. But for their being called into arms on private times, and that they have happened upon their Sabbath or festivals, they have been generally excused by their officers, unless by their obstinacy or ill language they have provoked them to the contrary. 
Traces of retrogression are also discernible in a document which was presented in 1721 to the Jamaica House of Representatives, entitled A Petition of Jacob Henriquez, Moses Mendes Quixano, and David Gabay on behalf of themselves and the rest of the Jews now resident in this island, praying that the House will take into consideration the great disparity there is between the numbers, trade, and substance of the Jews now resident in this island in this and former times, and to mitigate the assessment of tax to be laid upon them. But it seems that there was an improvement and an increase of the community about the middle of that century, for not less than 151 of the 189 Jews in the British American colonies, whose names have been handed down as naturalized between 1740, under the Act of Parliament of that year, and 1755, resided in Jamaica. Among the leading Jewish families which contributed most signally to the development of Jamaica's trade are De Silva, Suarez, Cardozo, Belisario, Belenfante, Nunez, Fonseca, Guderect, De Cadorva, Bernay, Gomez, Vaz, and Bravo. Kingston was from the time of its foundation, 1693, the principal seat of the Jewish community. An earlier synagogue, which is mentioned in 1684 and 1687, was probably situated in Port Royal. There were also settlements in Spanish Town, Montego Bay, Falmouth, and Lacovia. Here also, like in most other Dutch and English colonies, the local authorities were less liberal than the home governments, especially in matters of taxation. The assistance of the crown was necessary to abolish all special taxation, and also to check such attempts as there were made during the reign of William III to expel the Jews from the island. There is a record, see Publications 19, page 179-80, to of a Mr. Montefiore who made an application to be admitted as an attorney in Jamaica in 1787, and produced a certificate of his admission in the court of King's Bench in London in 1784. But the above-mentioned anti-Jewish law of 1711 was cited to disqualify him from acting as attorney in Jamaica. It is believed that the man who met with this refusal was Joshua Montefiore, 1762-1843, an uncle of Sir Moses Montefiore, 1784-1885. to The community was in a flourishing condition in 1831, when all civil disabilities were finally removed, and the Jews immediately began to take a leading part in the affairs of the colony. In 1838, Sir Francis H. Goldsmith, 1808-1878, to was able to compile a long list of Jews who were chosen to civil and military offices in Jamaica, since the Act of 1831, which was used by him as an argument in favor of removing the Jewish disabilities at home. Alexander Bravo was the first Jew to be chosen as a member of the Jamaica Assembly, being elected for the District of Kingston in 1835. He later became a member of the Council and afterward Receiver General. In 1849, eight of the 47 members of the Colonial Assembly were Jews, and Dr. C. M. Morales was elected speaker in that year. Fincas Abraham, died 1887, was one of the last survivors of the body of merchants who contributed to the prosperity of the West Indies. See Jewish Encyclopedia. The Spanish and Portuguese synagogue of Kingston, situated on Princess Street until the time of its destruction by the Great Fire of 1882, was consecrated in 1750. It was replaced by a new edifice on East Street in 1884. The English and German synagogue was consecrated in 1789. A third, German, was merged with a first in 1850. The synagogue of the Amalgamated Congregation of Israelites, which was consecrated in 1888, was destroyed by the earthquake of January 1907. The United Congregation now worships at the East Street Synagogue, which was enlarged for the purpose. The English-German congregation consecrated a new synagogue in 1894. There was also a Hebrew Benevolent Society and a Gemelit Hasidim Association, which is more than a century old. Among the rabbis of Jamaica were Joshua Pardo, who came there from Curaçao in 1683, his contemporary, the Spanish poet Daniel Israel Lopez Laguna, 
Hakam de Cordoza died in Spanish Town, 1798. Reverend Abraham Perrier Mendez, born Kingston, 1825, died New York, 1893. Reverend George Jacobs, Reverend J. M. Corcos, and the present rabbi of the English German synagogue on Orange Street, Reverend M. H. Solomon. The two synagogues in Kingston are the only ones in the colony which has about 2,000 Jews, or nearly 10% of the white population of Jamaica. End of section 8. Chapter 9 of History of the Jews in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mr. History 89. History of the Jews in America by Peter Wernick. Chapter 9. New Amsterdam and New York. Some topics of this chapter include Poverty of the first Jewish immigrants to New Amsterdam. Stuyvesant's opposition overruled by the Dutch West India Company. Privileges and restrictions. Contributions to build the wall from which Wall Street takes its name. The first cemetery. Exemptions from military duty. Little change at the beginning of the English rule. The first synagogue after a liberal decree by the Duke of York. Muranos brought back in boats which carried grain to Portugal. Hebrew learning. Question about the Jews as voters and as witnesses. Peter Kalm's description of the Jews of New York around 1745. Hyman Levy, the employer of the original Astor. The wealth which made the Spanish and Portuguese Jew welcome, or at least ensured him sufferance in the other Dutch and English colonies of the New World, was absent in the case of those who first settled in what is now New York. In September 1654, the year in which the Dutch lost control of Brazil and the great Jewish community of Rashifif was scattered, there arrived in the port of New Amsterdam, as New York was called by its Dutch founders, the Baroque St. Caterina, of which Jacques de la Main was master, from Cape St. Anthony, possibly Cuba, question mark, carrying 27 Jews, men, women, and children. These passengers, the first Jews to arrive in what is now the United States, were so poor that their goods had to be sold by the master of the vessel by public auction for the payment of their passage. The amount realized by the sale being insufficient, he applied to the court of Burgomaster and the Chopins that one or two of them, as principals, be held as security for the payment of the balance in accordance with the contract made with him by which each person signing it had bound himself for the payment of the whole amount and under which he had taken two of them, David Israel and Moses Ambrosius, as principal debtors. The court accordingly ordered that they should be placed under civil arrest in the custody of the provost marshal until they should have made satisfaction that the captain should be answerable for their support while in custody as security for which a certain proportion of the proceeds of the sale was directed to be left in the hands of the secretary of the colony. But no further proceedings appear upon the record. The matter was doubtless arranged and was probably nothing more than a dispute or misunderstanding between them and the captain as to whether they were bound to make good the deficiency which was probably enhanced by the forced sale of their effects by auction. It was more likely that their embarrassment was only temporary and was due to their being robbed shortly before or after they left their last stopping place or resident, which was probably Jamaica. Parentheses, see Leon Hooner. Whence came the first Jewish settlers of New York? Question mark. Quotation, publications, in quotation, 9, page 75, ff, in parentheses. It is mentioned that some of them were awaiting remittances, 
which must have come in time to enable the refugees to hold their own until the question of permitting them to remain in the colony was settled in their favor through correspondence with Holland. Peter Stuyvesant, the governor of the colony, a man of strong will and strong prejudices, was hostile to the new arrivals, and he soon wrote to the directors of the Dutch West India Company in Amsterdam, requesting that, quote, none of the Jewish nation be permitted to infest New Netherland, end quote. He received a reply that such a course, quote, would be unreasonable and unfair, especially because of the considerable loss sustained by the Jews in the taking of Brazil, and also because of the large amount of capital which they had invested in the shares of this company. After many consultations, we have decided and resolved upon a certain petition made by said Portuguese Jews that they shall have permission to sail and to trade in New Netherland and to live and remain there, provided that the poor among them shall not become a burden to the com company or the community, but be supported by their own nation, end quote. This is the end of the reply, dated April 26th, 1655, which began with the ominous sentence, quote, we would like to agree to your wishes and request that the new territories should not be further invaded by people of the Jewish race. For we see uh, from such immigration the same difficulties which you fear, end quote. But the influence of the Jews in Amsterdam overcame the predilections and the fears of the company, and a special act was issued July 15, 1655, expressly giving Jews in New Netherlands the privileges contained in the above letter to the governor. Before the favorable decision could arrive from Holland, the position of the Jews was precarious. On the 1st of March, 1655, Abraham de la Simon was brought before the court of Burgomaster and the Chopins upon the complaint of the shout or sheriff for keeping open his store on Sunday during the Sherman and selling at retail. The sheriff on that occasion informed the court that the governor and council had resolved that the Jews who had come in the preceding autumn, as well as those that had recently arrived from Holland, must prepare to depart forthwith. The court, which was also a council for the municipal government of the city, was asked by the sheriff whether it had any objection to make, whereupon, says the record, it was decided that the governor's resolution should take its course. There is some reason to believe that some Jews left on account of that resolution before the orders from Holland arrived. They presumably went to Rhode Island. Those who remained were still objects of the governor's aversion, and even the more friendly company was not too liberal. A letter from the directors to Stuyvesant, dated March 13, 1556, contains the following, quote, The permission given to the Jews to go to New Netherlands and enjoy the same privileges as they have here in Amsterdam, has been granted only as far as civil and political rights are concerned, without giving the said Jews a claim to the privilege of exercising their religion in a synagogue or a gathering. And, but it must be said to the credit of the directors that they insisted on what they granted to the Jews, and in another letter, dated June 14, 1556, they write, to the self-willed governor, quote, We have seen and heard with displeasure that against our orders of the 15th of February, 1655, issued at the request of the Jewish or Portuguese nation, you have forbidden them to trade to Fort Orange, Albany, and the South River, Delaware. Also, the purchase of real estate, which is granted to them without difficulty here in this country, and we wish it had not been done and you had obeyed our orders, which you must always execute punctually and with more respect. Jews, or Portuguese people, however, shall not be employed in any public service, parentheses, to which they are neither admitted in this city, in parentheses, nor allowed to have any open retail, retail shops, but they may quietly and peacefully carry on their business as aforementioned, and exercise in all quietness their religion within their houses, for which end they must, without doubt, endeavor to build their houses close together in a convenient place 
on one or the other side of New Amsterdam at their choice as they do here. These instructions came as the result of a petition sent by the directors by Abraham De Luca, Salvatore De Andra, and Jacob Cohen for themselves and in the name of others of the Jewish nation, asking for a confirmation of the privileges which was thus granted. These three and two other Jews, Joseph de Costa and David Ferreira, were in the preceding year, 1655, assessed each 1,000 florins to defray the cost of erecting the outer fence or city wall from which Wall Street takes its name. It was the same amount as was imposed upon the wealthiest of the citizens, and the five adduced it as a reason for their being entitled to the rights to trade and to hold real property. Abraham de Luca, who appears to have been the most prominent of the early Jewish immigrants and several others, applied in July 1655 for a burying ground, but the request was refused with the reply, quote, that there was no need for it, end quote. There was need for it, however, about a year later, and on July 14, 1656, a lot was granted to them outside of the city for a place of internment. This is the old cemetery on Oliver Street in New Bowery, which was augmented by further purchases in the following century. The city was at that time exposed to attacks from Spanish cruisers and pirates and to assaults from hostile Indians. The encroachments of the English on Long Island and Westchester was a subject of constant anxiety. England never having conceded the rights of the Dutch to settle New Netherlands. This caused all the male inhabitants capable of bearing arms to enroll in the Burger Guard, and a watch was kept up night and day with the steadiness and vigilance of a beleaguered town. A few months after the arrival of the Jewish immigrants, the question arose whether the adult males among them should be incorporated in the Burger Guard, the officers of the guard submitting the question to the governor and council. It was duly deliberated upon, and an ordinance was passed, August 28, 1655, which, after reciting, quote, the willingness of the mass of the citizens to be fellow soldiers of the aforesaid nation, end quote, or watch in the same guardhouse, and the fact that the Jews in Holland did not serve in the train bands of the city, but paid a compensation for their exemption therefrom, declared that they should be exempt from that military service. And for such exemption, each male person between the ages of 16 and 60 shall pay a monthly contribution of 65 stevers. Jacob Barsimian and Azar Levy died 1682, petitioned to be allowed to stand guard for other burghers or to be relieved from the tax, which was refused by the governor and council with the remark that, quote, they might go elsewhere if they liked, end quote. But, after the last order from Amsterdam favorable to the claims of the Jews was received, Azur Levy applied to be admitted to the right of citizenship and exhibited his certificate to the court to show that he had been a burgher in Amsterdam. His request, as well as the one made from the same purpose by Salvador de Andre and others, was not complied with. The matter was brought before the governor and council and at the directions from Holland were controlling, an order was made April 21st, 1657, that the burgomaster should admit them to that privilege. Here, the struggle virtually ended, and they were no longer troubled during the Dutch rule. When the British captured the city in 1664 and renamed it New York, the condition of the Jews remained practically unchanged. There is a record of at least one Jew who removed from Newport to New York in that period and had difficulties with the local authorities because they enforced against him the regulation which did not permit a Jew to engage in retail trade. The Charter of Liberties and Privileges, which was adopted in 1683 by the colonial legislature, declared that, quote, no one should be molested, punished, disquieted, or called in question for his religious opinion who professed faith in God by Jesus Christ, end quote, which meant that the Jews and unbelievers were excluded from the privileges of religious freedom. A petition by the Jews to Governor Dongan in 
1686 for liberty to exercise their religion, i.e. to have public worship, was consequently decided in the negative. But James, Duke of York, afterwards King James II, 1633 to 1701, uh, to whom New York was granted by his brother, had previously sent out instructions, which arrived about that time, quote, to permit all persons of what religion soever quietly to inhabit within the government and to give no disturbance or to disquiet whatsoever for or by reason of their differing in matters of religion. The exact date when the Jews took advantage of that liberal decree is not known. But it is presumed that the religious services, which had been heretofore conducted semi-privately, were soon performed in a house devoted to that purpose. It is certain that there was a Jewish synagogue in New York in 1695, probably as early as 1691, while the restrictions as to trade were removed a few years before. The synagogue, the first on the North American continent, was situated on the south side of the present Beaver Street between Broadway and Broad Street. When it became too small for the community which was increasing in wealth and in numbers, a new edifice was erected in 1728 on Mill Street, about the present site of South William Street, where the congregation, which now assumed the name of Shariath Israel, remnant of Israel, continued to worship for more than a century. A profitable commerce was carried on between New York and the West Indies at the beginning of the 18th century, in which numerous Jewish merchants participated. There was also carried on, though for a short period, a considerable business of exporting wheat to Portugal on account of the scarcity in Europe about the close of the French War. Abraham de Lucena and Luis Moses Gomez, who engaged in that traffic to Portugal, not only became two of the most affluent of the Jewish residents of New York, but they also incidentally caused an increase of the number of their co-religionists in the community. It is presumed that the vessels which carried grain to the Iberian Peninsula brought Jewish or Murano passengers on the return voyage. Most of the new Jewish names, which began to appear here about that time, are of undoubted Spanish and Portuguese origin but were also in the city Jews from other countries. When the Reverend John Sharp proposed the erection of a school, library, and chapel in New York in 1712 to 13, he points out among the advantages which the city afforded for that purpose that, quote, it is possible also to learn Hebrew here as well as in Europe, there being a synagogue of Jews and many ingenious men of that nation from Poland, Hungary, Germany, etc. And the above mentioned Louis Moses Gomez, born Madrid, 1654, died New York, 1740, who arrived in America about 1700, was, until the time of his death, one of the principal merchants of New York. He had five sons, and his descendants have intermarried with most of the old time American Jewish family. While the community was increasing in number and wealth, something occurred which sharply reminded the Jews that the time of complete emancipation had not yet come. In 1737, the election of Colonel Frederick Phillips as representatives of the General Assembly for the County of Westchester was contested by Captain Cornelius von Horn. Colonel Phillips called several Jews to give evidence on his behalf. When an objection was made, to their competency as witnesses. After arguments on both sides were heard, they were informed by the speaker that it was the opinion of the house that, quote, none of the Jewish profession could be admitted as evidence, end quote. It seems that Jews had voted on the election for after again hearing arguments from the council of both parties, the house resolved that as it did not appear that the persons of the Jewish religion had a right to vote for members of parliament in Great Britain, it was the unanimous opinion of the House that they could not be admitted to vote for representatives in the colony. This decision has been described by a later historian as remarkable, and in explanation of it, he says, quote, 
that Catholics and Jews had long been particularly obnoxious to the colonists, end quote, that, start quote, the first settlers being Dutch and mostly of the Reformed Protestant religion, and the migration from England, since the colony belonged to the crown, being principally Episcopal, both united in their aversion to the Catholics and the Jews, end quote. Quoted by Daly, The Settlement of the Jews in North America, page 46. The general condition of the Jews of New York was, nevertheless, highly favorable, as is attested by Peter Kalm, 1715-1779, the Swedish botanist and traveler who spent a considerable time in the colony in the following decade. He says, quote, There are many Jews settled in New York who possess great privileges. They have a synagogue and houses, great country seats of their own property, and are allowed to keep shops in the town. They have likewise several ships, which they freight and send out with their goods. In fine, the Jews enjoy all the privileges in common to the other inhabitants of this town and province. End quote. The increase of the community between that time and the American Revolution was very slow in comparison with the vast growth of the general population of the city, which was less than 5,000 in 1700, about 9,000 in 1750, and nearly 23,000 in 1776. The natural increase and the additions which the Jewish community received by immigration, chiefly from England, was barely sufficient to counteract the loss of others who went to Newport, Charleston, and Philadelphia. But, though small, it continued to be a highly respectable and influential body, having among its members some of the principal merchants of the city. Of this number was Haman Levy, died 1790, who carried on an extensive business chiefly with the Indians, and, by winning their respect and confidence, became the largest fur trader in the colonies. Upon his books are entries of monies paid to John Jacob Astor, 1763 to 1848, the founder of the Astor family, for beating furs at the rate of one dollar a day. Miss Zephora Levy died 1833, a daughter of Haman, was married in 1779 to Benjamin Hendricks, a native of New York, the founder of a well-known and long-maintained Jewish commercial house. End of chapter 9. Chapter 10 of History of the Jews in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Jews in America by Peter Wernick, New England and the Other English Colonies. Some major points in this chapter include the Old Testament spirit in New England, Roger Williams, the first Jew in Massachusetts, Judah Monis, instructor in Hebrew at Harvard, Newport, Jews from Holland, Bring there the first decrees of masonry. The cemetery immortalized by Longfellow. Jacob Rodriguez Riviera introduces the manufacturer of sperm oil. Aaron Lopez, the greatest merchant in America. Immigration from Portugal. Rabbi Isaac Toro. Visiting rabbis. First Jews in Connecticut. Philadelphia. Congregation Mequa Israel, Easton's Wealthy Jews, Maryland, Dr. Jacob Lombrazo, General Oglethorpe and the First Jews of Georgia, Joseph Ottolenghi, the Carolinas, Charleston. Although, quote, the Puritans of England and America appropriated the language of our judges and prophets, end quote, and the spirit of the Old Testament was the most potent force in the foundation and the conduct of the early commonwealths of New England. Still, 
it was not a typical or recognized leader of those who deemed themselves members of a new Hebrew theocratic democracy, but rather an outcast from their ranks who first granted full religious liberty to the Jews and bade them welcome. This man was Roger Williams. Around 1600 is a guess to 1684. The former clergyman of the Church of England, who later, in 1631, became a Puritan pastor in Salem, Massachusetts, and was expelled for denying the right of the magistrates to punish Sabbath-breaking, and was four years later, quote, banished from the jurisdiction of the Puritans of America and driven into the wilderness to endure the severity of our northern winter and the bitter pangs of hunger, end quote. There was at least one Jew in Massachusetts before the arrival of the first Jews in New Amsterdam, and he is mentioned only as being assisted or forced to quit the colony. The reference to him is dated May 3rd, 1649, when it is stated that the court allows Solomon Franco, the Jew, six shillings per week out of the treasury for ten weeks for subsistence till he can get his passage into Holland. See Cahut, the Jews of New England, in, quote, Publications, chapter 11, page 78, in parentheses. Several other Jews are mentioned as having lived there in the latter part of the 17th and in the first three quarters of the 18th century. But, owing to the intolerance and religious zeal of the Puritans, they either moved to other parts or embraced Christianity. When a Jew named Joseph Frazen, or Fraser, died in Boston in 1704, his body was sent to Newport for burial. The most distinguished among the early converts was Judah Manus, born in Algiers around 1680, died in Northborough, Massachusetts in 1764. He was baptized in the College Hall at Cambridge, Massachusetts on March 22, 1722, and was afterward active in the cause of his new faith, although he observed throughout his life the Jewish Sabbath. He was an instructor in Hebrew at Harvard University from 1722 till 1759, when, on the death of his wife, he resigned and removed to Northborough. Besides some insignificant missionary pamphlets, he was the author of the first Hebrew grammar printed in America, Boston, 1735. It was the smallest of the original colonies, which is now likewise the smallest state in the Union, Rhode Island, founded by the pioneer of religious liberty in the New World, that the Jews established their oldest congregation on the North American continent. Providence was founded in 1636, Portsmouth and Newport about two years later, and the last named place, which soon became one of the most important cities in the colonies, excelling even New York as a commercial center and a port of entry, until after the revolution, began to attract Jews soon after their arrival in these parts of the country. The earliest authentic mention of Jews in Newport is in 1658, when 15 Jewish families are said to have arrived from Holland, bringing with them the first degrees of masonry, which they proceeded to confer on Abraham Moses in the house of Mordecai Capanel. But there is reason to believe that Jews from New Amsterdam and Caracau settled there a year or two before. A congregation seems to have been originated in 1658 under the name Jeshut Israel. The cemetery, immortalized by Longfellow and Emma Lazarus, was acquired by Kamenel and Moses Pakeko in 1677, but it is possible that there existed an earlier Jewish cemetery. Still, even in Rhode Island, it was only tolerance. The recognition of equal rights was yet to come with the Declaration of Independence. In reply to a petition of the Jews, the General Assembly of Rhode Island in 1684 affirmed the right of the Jews to settle in the colony, declaring that, quote, they may expect as good protection here as any stranger be not of our nation residing among us in his majesty's colony ought to have, being obedient to his majesty's laws, end quote. 
More Jewish settlers arrived from the West Indies in 1694, but the great impulse to the commercial activity which raised Newport to the zenith of its prosperity was given by a number of Portuguese Jews who settled there about the middle of the 18th century. Most prominent among the, those were Jacob Rodriguez Rivera, died at an advanced age in 1789, who arrived in 1745, and Aaron Lopez, who came in 1750. The former introduced into America the manufacturer of sperm oil, having brought the art with him from Portugal, and it soon became one of the leading industries. Newport, whose inhabitants were engaged in whale fishing, had 17 manufactories of oil and candles and enjoyed a practical monopoly of this trade down to the revolution. Aaron Lopez died May 28, 1782, who was Rivera's son-in-law, became the great merchant prince of New England. Parentheses, Ezra Stiles says of him that for honor and extent of com commerce, he was probably surpassed by no merchant in America. In parentheses. The advantages of this important seaport were quickly comprehended by this sagacious merchant, and to him, in a larger degree than to any one else, was due the rapid commercial development that followed. He was the means of inducing more than 40 Jewish families to settle there, and heads of many of which were men of wealth, mercantile sagacity, high intelligence, and enterprise. In 14 years after Lopez settled there, Newport had 150 vessels engaged in trade with the West Indies alone. Besides an extensive trade, which was carried on as far as Africa and the Falkland Islands. The Jews were even then, nearly 300 years after the expulsion, transferring to the liberal English colonies the wealth and the still more valuable business ability and commercial connections, which they could not freely nor safely employ as Morenos in Portugal. The immigration of secret Jews from that country increased after the great earthquake at Lisbon in 1755, and a considerable portion went to Rhode Island. One of the vessels from that unhappy city bound to Virginia was driven into Narragansett Bay, and its Jewish passengers remained in Newport. Isaac Turo died December 8, 1783, came from Jamaica to Newport in 1760 to become the minister of its prosperous congregation and occupied the position until the outbreak of the revolution, when he returned to end his days in Jamaica. Until the time of his arrival, worship was held in private houses, but in 1762, the congregation, which numbered between 60 and 70 members, decided to erect a synagogue. The building, which is still standing, was completed and dedicated in 1763. There is evidence that the Jewish population of Newport, even before the revolution, contained considerable German and Polish elements. According to one historian, the city numbered before the outbreak of hostilities 1,175 Jews, which was probably a majority of the Jews in all the colonies, while more than 300 worshippers attended the synagogue. Many Jewish rabbis from all parts of the world were attracted to Newport in those times. The above named Ezra Stiles, 1727 to 1795, the famous president of Yale University, who was a preacher in Newport at that time, mentioned several of them in his diary. He met one from Palestine in 1759, two from Poland, 1771 and 1772, respectively, a rabbi Pasquela from Sinmirna, a Rabbi Cohen from Jerusalem, and a Rabbi Raphael, Chaim Isaac Karegel, born in Hebron, Palestine, 1733, died Barbados, 1777, who preached at Newport in Spanish in 1773 and became an intimate friend of the Christian theological scholar. The arrival of a Jewish family from the West Indies to New Haven, Connecticut in 1772 is noted by Stiles, who was a native of that place, in his diary as follows, quote, They are the first real Jews at that place, with exception of the two brothers Pinto, who renounced Judaism and all religion, end quote. 
This is substantially accurate in regard to New Haven, although one David, the Jew, is mentioned in the Hartford Town Records as early as 1659 or 1650, and the residence of several Jews is implied in the entry which was made in the same records under date of September 2nd, 1661. Quote, the same day ye Jews, which at present live at John Marsh, his house, have liberty to sojourn in ye town for several months. End quote. They are mentioned at a subsequent period too, which proves that they were permitted to remain longer than the allotted seven months. But all trace of them is lost afterwards, and almost two centuries had passed until the first synagogue was erected in Hartford. The Jews of New Amsterdam, who had difficulties with Peter Stuyvesant in 1655 about their right to trade on the South River, which was subsequently renamed the Delaware, see above, chapter 9, were probably the first to set foot in what later became the colony and still later the state of Pennsylvania. This was 20 years before William Penn, 1644 to 1718, became part proprietor of West Jersey, and more than a quarter of a century before he came over to America, 1682, and founded the city of Philadelphia in the colony of Pennsylvania, which had received as a grant from the King of England in the preceding year. The first Jewish resident of Philadelphia was Jonas Aaron, who was living there in 1703. A number of other Jews settled there in the first half of the 18th century, and some of them, including David Franks, 1720 to 1793, Joseph Marx, and Samson Levy, became prominent in the life of the city. Isaac Miranda came there earlier, 1710, and held several state offices, but he was a convert to Christianity, and his preferment cannot be considered a Jewish success. A German traveler mentions the Jews among the religious sects of Philadelphia in 1734. In 1738, Nathan Levy, 1704 to 1753, applied for a plot of ground to be used as a place of burial and obtained it September 25, 1740. This was the first Jewish cemetery in the city and was henceforth known as the Jews' Burying Ground, situated on Spruce Street, near 9th Street. It later became the property of the congregation Miquel Israel, which had its beginnings about 1745 and is believed to have worshipped in a small house in Sterling Alley. The question of building a synagogue was raised in 1761 as a result of the influx of Jews from Spain and the West Indies, but nothing was then accomplished in that direction. In 1773, when Bernard Gratz, born in Germany, 1738, died in Baltimore, 1801, was Piranus and Solomon Marici treasurer, a subscription was started, quote, in order to support our holy worship and establish it on a more solid foundation, end quote. But no synagogue was built until about 10 years later. Bernard Gratz and his brother, Michael, born 1740, with whom he came to America about 1755, was among the eight Jewish merchants of Philadelphia who signed the Non-Importation Resolution in 1765. The others were Benjamin Levy, David Franks, Samson Levy, Hyman Levy, Jr., Matthias Bush, and Moses Mordecai. Jews were to be found in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, as early as 1730, before the town and county were organized, and the name of Joseph Simon was preserved as the best known of the first arrivals. Meyer Hart died about 1795, and his right Rachel and their son Michael born 1738, were one of the 11 original families that are classed as the founders of Easton, Pennsylvania, about 1750. Meyer Hart heads the list of those furnishing material for the erection of a schoolhouse in Easton in 1755. He is first described as a shopkeeper and later as an innkeeper, and he was naturalized April 3, 1764. In 1780, his estate was valued at 2,095 pounds, 
and that of his son Michael at 2,261 pounds, these two being the heaviest taxed individuals in the county. At that period, there were two other Jewish merchants residing in Easton, Bernard Levy and Joseph Nathan. There is a tradition that Schafferstown, Pennsylvania, had a synagogue and a Jewish cemetery in 1732, but the facts have not been verified, and there is a suspicion that the supposed Jews were German pietists who assumed biblical names. To the south of Pennsylvania, the older colony of Maryland, which was established in 1634, quote, adopted religious freedom as the basis of the state, end quote. But this boon was reserved for Christians only, although there is no record that the statutory death penalty for those who denied the Trinity was ever carried out in practice. The physician, Jacob Lombrazo, died May 1666, was hailed from Lisbon, Portugal, and came to Maryland about January 1656, and later became an extensive landowner, was committed for blasphemy in 1658, but this did not prevent him from enjoying a lucrative practice and engaging in various mercantile pursuits in subsequent years. He was even granted letters of denization on September 10, 1663, which vested him with all the privileges of a native or naturalized subject. But his case seems to have been exceptional, probably owing to his medical skill and his wealth. But in general, colonial Maryland was no place for Jews, and even after it became a part of the United States, it was one of the last to remove the civil disabilities of its Jewish citizens. Another Murano physician from Lisbon, Dr. Samuel Ribeiro Nunez, what, who escaped from the clutches of the Inquisition and arrived in 1733 in the newly founded colony of Georgia, found a more congeal place to refuge. Georgia was, in respect to the Jews, the reverse of New Netherlands. The trustees of the colony in England were opposed to permitting Jews to settle there, but General James Edward Oglethorpe, 1696 to 1785, the governor, was very friendly disposed toward them. Nunez was one of 40 Jewish immigrants who unexpectedly arrived at Savannah in the second vessel which reached the colony from England, July 11, 1733. The governor, one of the noblest figures of colonial times, bade them welcome and considered them a good acquisition to the new colony. The first settlers were of Spanish and Portuguese extraction, but Jews who apparently came from Germany took up their residence there less than a year afterwards. Both bands of settlers received equally liberal treatment, and they soon organized a congregation, 1734. The first male white child born in the colony was a Jew, Isaac Minnis. Abraham de Leon of Portugal introduced the culture of grapes into Georgia in 1737, while others of the early settlers engaged in the cultivation and manufacture of silk, the knowledge of which they likewise brought with them from Portugal. A dispute with the trustees of the colony respecting the introduction of slaves caused an extensive immigration to South Carolina in 1741 and resulted in the dissolution of the congregation. But in 1751, a number of Jews returned to Georgia, and in the same year, the trustees sent over Joseph Odalengi, died after June 1774, to superintend the somewhat extensive silk industry of the colony. Odalengi soon attended prominence in the political life of the colony and was elected a member of the General Assembly, where he served from 1761 to 1765. Several other Jews rendered distinguished services to Georgia, but they belong to the period of the Revolution, which will be treated separately in the following part. A new congregation was started in 1774. Quote, Jews, heathens, and dissenters, end quote, were granted full liberty of conscience in the liberal charter which the celebrated English philosopher John Locke, 1632 to 1704, drew up for the governance of the Carolinas in 1669, and the spirit of tolerance was always retained there. Still, few Jews were attracted there at the beginning, and about 30 years later, we know of only one Jew, Solomon Valentine, 
as living in Charleston. A few others followed him, and in 1703, a protest was raised against, quote, Jew strangers voting for members of the assembly. About the middle of the 18th century, the number of Jews in Charleston suddenly increased through the above-mentioned exodus from Georgia, and the first synagogue of the congregation Bet Elohim was established in 1750. Its first minister was Isaac de Costa, and among its earliest members were Joseph and Michael Tobias, Moses Cohen, Abraham de Costa, Moses Pimento, David de Olera, Mordecai Sheft, Michael Lazarus, and Abraham Nunez Cardozo. The first synagogue was a small building on Union Street. Its present edifice is situated at Hassel Street. A Hebrew benevolent society, which still survives, was also organized at an early date. A German Jewish congregation was also in existence in the latter quarter of the 18th century. Several prominent Jews of London purchased large tracts of land in South Carolina near Fort 96, which became known as the Jews' land. Moses Lindo, who arrived from London in 1756, became engaged in indigo manufacture, which he made one of the principal industries in the colony. Another London Jew, Francis Salvador, died 1776, was the most prominent Jew in South Carolina at the time of the outbreak of the Revolutionary War. End of chapter 10. Chapter 11 of History of the Jews in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chris Pyle. History of the Jews in America by Peter Wiernick. Part 3. The Revolution and the Period of Expansion. Chapter 11. The Religious Aspect of the War of Independence. Spirit of the Old Testament in the Revolutionary War Sermons in favor of the original Jewish form of government The New Nation as God's American Israel The Quebec Act The Intolerance of Sects as the Cause of Separation of Church and State A Memorial Sent by German Jews to the Continental Congress Fear expressed in North Carolina that the Pope might be elected President of the United States None of the liberties won were lost by post-revolutionary reaction, as happened elsewhere. The spirit of the Old Testament, which was prevalent among the early settlers of New England, was perhaps still more manifest there at the time of the outbreak of the Revolutionary War of Independence. The ever-increasing antagonism, which was aroused by the attempt of the Parliament of England to regulate and to tax the colonies, found expression in biblical terms to an extent which can hardly be appreciated in the present time. The people in America had to fight over again the same battles for constitutional liberties which the English had fought before them, and George III, so far as his claims over the colonies were concerned, relied as much upon the kingly prerogative, the doctrine of divine right, as ever did James I. All of these pretensions, all the questions of right and liberty, had to be re-argued. To refute this false theory of kingly power, it was not only expedient but necessary to revert to the earliest times, to the most sacred record, the Old Testament, for illustration and for argument, chiefly because the doctrine of divine right of a king by the grace of God and its corollaries, unlimited submission and non-resistance, were deduced, or rather distorted, from the New Testament, having been brought into the field of politics with the object of enslaving the masses through their religious creed. It is at least an historical fact, says the historian Lecky, that in the great majority of instances the early Protestant defenders of civil liberty derived their political principles chiefly from the Old Testament, and the defenders of despotism from the New. The rebellions that were so frequent in Jewish history formed the favorite topic of the one, the unreserved submission inculcated by St. Paul, the other. Footnote. Lecky, Rationalism in Europe, Volume 2, page 168. Quoted in Strauss, Origin of Republican Form of Government in the United States, pages 19 and following, which see for an extensive treatment of the subject. While there were many free thinkers or deists among the intellectual leaders of the Revolution, the masses of the colonists were intentionally religious. 
and an argument from Scripture carried more weight with them than any other. Education was limited at that period in the colonies. There were not many newspapers. They were rarely issued more than once a week, and the number of subscribers was but few. The pulpit had their place, and the pastors in their sermons dealt with politics not less than with religion. Sermons were for the people the principal sources of general instruction. These pastors, in the way of history, knew above all that of the Jewish people, and they were the first to bring before their audiences the ideals of the old Hebrew commonwealth. Rev. Jonathan Mayhew, 1720-1766, whose discourse in 1750 against unlimited submission was characterized as the morning gun of the revolution, declared in a later oration on the repeal of the Stamp Act, which he delivered in Boston on May 23, 1766. God gave Israel a king in his anger because they had not sense and virtue enough to like a free commonwealth and to have himself for their king. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And if any miserable people on the continent or isles of Europe be driven in their extremity to seek a safe retreat from slavery in some far distant clime, oh, let them find one in America. Rev. Samuel Langdon, 1723-1797, president of Harvard College, delivered an election sermon before the Honorable Congress of Massachusetts Bay on the 31st of May, 1775, taking as his text the passage in Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 26, And I will restore thy judges as at first, in which he said the Jewish government, according to the original constitution, which was divinely established, if considered only in a civil view, was a perfect republic. And let them who cry up the divine right of kings consider that the form of government, which had a proper claim to be a divine establishment, was so far from including the idea of a king, that it was a high crime for Israel to ask to be in this respect like other nations. And when they were thus gratified, it was rather as a just punishment for their folly. The civil polity of Israel is doubtless an excellent general model, allowing for some peculiarities, at least some principal laws and orders of it, may be copied in more modern establishments. Almost everybody at that time knew by heart the admonitions of Samuel to the children of Israel, describing the manner in which a king would rule over them. Sermons drawing a parallel between George III and Pharaoh, inferring that the same providence of God which had rescued the Israelites from Egyptian bondage would free the colonies, were common in that period, and they probably had more effect with the masses than the great orations of the statesmen or the philosophical essays of the publicists, which came down to us in the literature of the Revolution. The success of the War of Independence was also accepted in that sense. The election sermon preached by the Rev. Dr. Ezra Stiles, president of Yale College, on May 8, 1783, at Hartford, before Governor Trumbull and the General Assembly of the State of Connecticut, may be cited as an instance. Dr. Stiles took for his text Deuteronomy, chapter 26, verse 19, and to make you high above all nations, which he has made in praise and in name and in honor, etc., this sermon takes up 120 closely printed pages and assumes the proportions of a treatise on government from the Hebrew theocracy down to the then present, showing by illustration in history that the culmination of popular government had been reached in America, transplanted by divine hands in fulfillment of biblical prophecy from the days of Moses to the land of Washington, and discussing from an historical point of view the reasons rendering it probable that the United States will by the ordering of heaven, eventually become this people. He referred to the new nation as God's American Israel, and to Washington as the American Joshua, who was raised up by God to lead the armies of the chosen people to liberty and independence. Footnote. Another great American clergyman, Dr. Henry M. Field, 1822-1907, who wrote about a century later, also found in the Jewish polity much that was later adopted in the Constitution of the United States. In his work On the Desert, New York, 1883, he says, Perhaps it does not often occur to readers of the Old Testament that there is much likeness between the Hebrew Commonwealth and the American Republic. At the bottom, there is one radical principle that divides a republic from a monarchy or an aristocracy. It is the natural equality of men, that all men are born free and equal, which is fully recognized in the laws of Moses, as in the Declaration of Independence. Indeed, the principle is carried further, in the Hebrew commonwealth than in ours. 
For not only was there equality before the laws, but the laws aimed to produce equality of condition in one point, and that a vital one, the tenure of land, of which even the poorest could not be deprived, so that in this respect the Hebrew commonwealth approached more nearly to a pure democracy. See a more extensive quotation in Simon Wolfe's The American Jew as Patriot, Soldier, and Citizen, pages 494 to 498. The committee which was appointed on the same day the Declaration of Independence was adopted, consisting of Dr. Franklin, Mr. Adams, and Mr. Jefferson, to prepare a device for a seal of the United States, at first proposed that of Pharaoh sitting in an open chariot, a crown on his head and a sword in his hand, passing through the dividing waters of the Red Sea in pursuit of the Israelites. With rays from a pillar of fire beaming on Moses, who is represented as standing on the shore, extending his hand over the sea, causing it to overwhelm Pharaoh. Footnote. A drawing of this design is printed as the frontispiece of Mr. Strauss's above-named work. Great religious animosity was also aroused by the Quebec Act which was passed by the British Parliament in 1774 for the purpose of preventing Canada from joining the other colonies. It guaranteed to the Catholic Church the possession of its vast amount of property and full freedom of worship. The object which it was intended to effect by the passage of this act was purely one of state policy, and so far as Canada herself was concerned it was a wise and diplomatic step, but with the exception perhaps of the Boston Port Bill, it was the most effectual in alienating the colonies. It was construed as an effort on the part of Parliament to create an established church, and not that alone, but the establishment of that church, which was most hateful to, and dreaded by, the great majority of the people in the colonies. It was not due to lack of religious sentiment that the ultimate bond between the colonies was a strictly secular one, and that church and state were forever separated in the Constitution of the United States. It was rather due to the great and insurmountable differences in the religious beliefs among the various parties to the Confederation. It may be said that it was strong sectarianism which forced upon them a non-sectarian government. The religious complexion of no two of the American colonies was precisely alike. The various sects at the time of the Revolution were grouped as follows. The Puritans in Massachusetts, the Baptists in Rhode Island, the Congregationalists in Connecticut, the Dutch and Swedish Protestants in New Jersey, the Church of England in New York, the Quakers in Pennsylvania, the Baptists, Methodists, and Presbyterians in North Carolina, the Catholics in Maryland, the Cavaliers in Virginia, the Huguenots and Episcopalians in South Carolina, and the Methodists in Georgia. Owing to these diversities, to the consciousness of danger from ecclesiastical ambition, the intolerance of sects as exemplified among themselves as well as in foreign lands, it is wisely foreseen that the only basis upon which it was possible to form a federal union was to exclude from the national government all power over religion. The separation of church and state was therefore a practical necessity, based on causes which were deeply rooted in the life of the people. It was almost a forced step on the way of development, not an enthusiastic outburst in favor of an abstract principle. This is why the ground which was then gained was never lost again, why there was no reaction and no reversion to the former order of a religious establishment as happened in France after the Great Revolution which began in 1789. The moderate self-restrained liberalism of the colonists held its own after the struggle was over and kept on progressing slowly. The violent radicalism of the older country went so far that many steps had to be retraced, and the fight of separating church and state had to be fought out all over again in our own time, more than a century after all religion was abolished during the reign of terror. A letter sent by an unnamed German Jew on behalf of himself and his brethren to the President of the Continental Congress, in which the wretched condition of the Jews in Germany at the time is depicted, and their desire to become subjects of the thirteen provinces is expressed, appeared in the Deutsches Museum of June 1783, and four years later a separate edition of it was published under the title Schreiben eins Deutschen Juden an den Nord Amerikanischen Presidenten. Footnote. See Dr. M. K. Serling, a memorial sent by German Jews to the President of the Continental Congress in Publication 6, pages 5 to 8, where it is also stated the letter was wrongly attributed to Moses Mendelssohn, 1729 to 1786. As there is no record of its reception or discussion in America, it probably attracted very little attention. The same is also true of the letter which Jonas Phillips, born in Rhenish Prussia, 1736, died in New York, 
January 28, 1803, of Philadelphia, sent to the Federal Convention in relation to the removal of the Test Oath in Pennsylvania, which discriminated against Jews and those who did not subscribe to Christian doctrines. September 7, 1787. When the fundamental law of the land was adopted, there were no exciting debates about the question of religious liberty. The clause abolishing religious tests in the federal constitution passed almost unanimously. The state of North Carolina alone voted against it. And as there were hardly any Jews there at that time, the fear of the Roman Catholics was the only cause for the illiberal stand taken by its representatives. The extent of that fear can be understood from the fact that when the state convention in North Carolina to adopt the federal constitution convened in Hillsboro in July 1788, Pamphlets were circulated pointing out in all seriousness the danger of the Pope being elected president should the Constitution be adopted. C. Huner, Religious Liberty in North Carolina, Publications, 16, page 42. The time for religious liberty, as well as for independence and national affairs, had come and was accepted as a matter of course, and it is the exceptional glory of the American Revolution that all the liberties won were retained and the young nation was enabled to continue on the way of progress unhindered by post-revolutionary reaction, and to devote its energies to the solution of the problems which the revolution left unsolved, and to new problems which arose after that period. End of chapter 11、Chapter、12 of History of the Jews in America This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Jews in America by Peter Wiernick. The Participation of Jews in the War of the Revolution. Captain Isaac Myers of the French and India War of 1754. David S. Franks and Isaac Franks. David Franks the Loyalist. Solomon and Louis Bush. Major General Nonus, other Jewish soldiers, of whom one was exempted from duty on Friday nights, the Pinto brothers, Commissary General Mordecai Sheftel of Georgia, Hayam Solomon, the Polish Jew, and his financial assistance to the revolution. There were only about 2,000 Jews in the colonies at the time when the war broke out, mostly well to do merchants of Spanish and Portuguese descent. Of whom a considerable number had formerly lived in England or had trade connections with the mother country and with his various dependencies. Class interest and personal predilection for old associations were therefore in favor of their being in sympathy with the ruling power over the sea. Still, the number of Jewish loyalists was small. The largest number cast their lot with the colonists and performed useful service in various ways. As merchants abstaining under non importation agreements from buying English goods, as tradesmen furnishing supplies, as officials assisting the movements of the army, and as officers and soldiers in the line. In most of the colonies, the Jews were then still barred from elective office by clauses in the charters and restrictive laws, but this did not prevent them from participating in the work of liberating the country. While on the other hand, there was no desire manifested to exclude them from doing their patriotic duty, from which they were excluded in the middle of the preceding century by the less liberal burghers of New Netherlands. The names of more than forty Jews who served in the continental armies of the Revolution have been preserved, and most of the data about them is to be found in Mr. Simon Wolfe's valuable work, as they almost all belonged to the wealthier class. It is but natural that the number of officers is disproportionately large in this small band. Four of them reached the rank of lieutenant colonel, three became majors, and there were at least half a dozen captains. Nor were these the first Jews to bear arms or to hold military rank in the colonies. As early as 1754, during the French and India War, Isaac Myers, a Jewish citizen of New York, Called a town meeting at the Rising Sun Inn and organized a company of bateau men, of which he became the captain. Two other Jews are named as taking part in the same war. Both of them served in the expedition 
across the Allegheny Mountains in the year above named. Two members of the Franks family served creditably in the Continental Army, while a third, they were probably cousins, became known through his sympathy for England. David Salisbury Franks, who is described as a young English merchant, settled in Montreal, Canada in 1774, and was active both in business and in the affairs of the Jewish community. On May 3, 1775, he was arrested for speaking disrespectfully of the king, but was discharged six days later. In 1776, General Wooster appointed him paymaster of the American garrison in Montreal, and when the army retreated from Canada, he enlisted as a volunteer and later joined the Massachusetts Regiment. In 1778, he was ordered to serve under Count de Stang, then commanding the sea forces of the United States. Upon the failure of the expedition, he went to Philadelphia, becoming a member of General Benedict Arnold's military family. In 1779, he went as a volunteer to Charlestown, serving as aide-de-camp to General Lincoln, and was later recalled to attend the trial of General Arnold for improper conduct while in command of Philadelphia, in which trial Franks was himself implicated. He was aide-de-camp to Arnold at the time of the latter's treason in September 1780. On October 2nd, he was arrested, but when the case was tried the next day, he was honorably acquitted. Not satisfied with this, Franks wrote to General Washington asking for a court of inquiry. On November 2nd, 1780, the court met at West Point and completely exonerated him. In 1781, he was sent by Robert Morris to Europe as bearer of dispatches to Jay in Madrid and to Franklin in Paris. On his return, Congress reinstated him into the army with the rank of major. On January 15, 1784, Congress resolved that a triplicate of the definitive treaty of peace be sent out to the minister's plenipotentiary by Lieutenant Colonel David S. Franks, and he again left for Europe. The next year he was appointed vice consul at Marseille. In 1786 he served in a confidential capacity in the negotiations connected with the Treaty of Peace and Commerce made with Morocco, and on his return to New York in 1787 brought the treaty with him. On January 28, 1789, he was granted 400 acres of land in recognition of his services during the Revolutionary War. His relative, Isaac Franks, born in New York, 1759, died in Philadelphia, 1822, was only 17 years old when he enlisted in Colonel Lesher's regiment, New York Volunteers, and served with it in the Battle of Long Island. On September 15th of the same year, he was taken prisoner at the capture of New York, but effected his escape after three months' detention. In 1777, he was appointed to the quartermaster's department, and in January 1778, he was made forage master, being stationed at West Point until February 22nd, 1781, when he resigned on account of ill health. He settled in Philadelphia where he later held various civil offices, and was, in 1794, appointed by Governor Mifflin, Lieutenant Colonel of the 2nd Regiment of Philadelphia County Brigade of the Militia of the Commonwealth. It was at his house at Germantown, now number 5442 Main Street, that President Washington resided during the prevalence of yellow fever in 1793 when the seat of government was removed to that suburb of Philadelphia. His portrait, painted by his friend Gilbert Stewart, is now in the Gibson Collection of the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia. The third and loyalist member of the family, David Franks, born in New York, 1720, died in Philadelphia, 1793, son of Jacob Franks, settled in Philadelphia early in life and was elected a member of the Provincial Assembly in 1748. He supplied the army with provisions during the French and Indian War, and in 1755 he assisted to raise a fund for the defense of the colony. On November 7, 1765, 
He signed the non-importation resolution. His name is also appended to an agreement to take the king's paper money in lieu of gold and silver. During the revolution, he was an intermediary in the exchange of prisoners, as well as an agent to the contractors for vigiling the troops of the King of Great Britain. He was twice imprisoned by the colonial government as an enemy to the American cause, and after his second release in 1780, he left for England. He returned in 1783 and lived the last ten years of his life in Philadelphia. Solomon Bush, a native of Philadelphia, the son of Matthias Bush, was an officer in the Pennsylvania militia for ten years. In 1777, he was appointed by the Supreme Council of Philadelphia, Deputy Adjutant General of the State Militia. In September of that year, he was dangerously wounded during a skirmish and had to be taken to Philadelphia. When the British captured the city in December 1777, he was taken prisoner, but released on parole. In 1779, he was promoted to the rank of lieutenant colonel and was pensioned in 1785. A Colonel Isaacs of the North Carolina militia is mentioned as wounded and taken prisoner at Camden, August 16, 1780, exchange July 1781, Wolf L.C., page 49. Lewis Bush became first lieutenant of the 6th Pennsylvania Battalion on January 9, 1776, and captain on June 24th of the same year. He was transferred to Colonel Thomas Hartley's additional Continental Regiment in January 1777 and was commissioned Major March 12, 1777. He participated in a number of battles and at the Battle of Brandywine on September 11, 1777, he received wounds from which he died four days later. Benjamin Nonus died 1826 a native of Bordeaux, France, emigrated to Philadelphia in 1777 and at once took up arms on behalf of the colonies. He served as a volunteer in Captain Bertie's regiment under Count Pulaski during the siege of Savannah and on September 15, 1779, received a certificate for gallant conduct on the field of battle. He attained the rank of major and it is stated that he was with General DeKalb at the Battle of Camden, South Carolina on August 16, 1780. Jacob de Leon and Jacob de la Mata were captains under DeKalb. Captain Noah Abraham was called out with the Battalion of Cumberland County Militia of Pennsylvania, July 28, 1777. Aaron Benjamin died 1829, who started as an ensign in the 8th Connecticut Regiment, January 1st, 1777, rose three years later to the rank of regimental adjutant. Manuel Mordecai Noah, 1747-1825, to 1825, served under General Marion. Isaac Israel rose to the rank of captain in 8th Virginia Regiment in 1777, and Nathaniel Levy of Baltimore is mentioned as having served under Lafayette. There is a record of a certificate issued by the New York Committee of Safety in January 1776, which read as follows, Hart Jacobs of the Jewish religion, having signified to this committee that it is inconsistent with his religious profession to perform military duty on Friday nights, being part of the Jewish Sabbath. It is ordered that he be exempted from military duty on that night of the week. See Publications 11, page 163. Three and probably four brothers of the old Pinto family, who resided in Connecticut, took an active part in the Revolution. Abraham Pinto was a member of Company 10, 7th Regiment of that state, in 1775. William Pinto, of whom it is not certain he was a brother, appears as a volunteer in 1779 and 1781. Jacob Pinto, who was in New Haven as early as 1759, appears to have been a member of a political committee in that city in 1775, and his name is found among those of other influential citizens of the place in a petition to the Council of Safety 
for the removal of certain Tories in 1776. Solomon Pinto served as an officer of the Connecticut Line throughout the war and was wounded in the British attack on New Haven July 5th and 6th, 1779. He was one of the original members in his state of the Society of the Cincinnati, which at the beginning included only meritorious officers of the Revolutionary Army. Mordecai Sheftel, born at Savannah, Georgia, 1735, died there, 1797, who was one of the first white children born in Savannah, being the son of Benjamin Sheftel, who came there in 1733, was the chairman of the Revolutionary Parochial Committee of his native city. In 1777, he was appointed Commissary General to the troops of Georgia, and in October of the following year, he became Deputy Commissary of Issues in South Carolina and Georgia. His imprisonment after Savannah was taken by the British attracted much attention, and the description of it forms an interesting part of the local history of that period. In 1782, Sheftal appeared in Philadelphia, which was then the haven for patriot refugees, as one of the founders of the Mekwe Israel Congregation. In the following year, in common with other officers, he received a grant of land in what was called the Georgia Continental Establishment, as a reward for services during the war. He subsequently figures as one of the incorporators of the Union Society, 1786, which is still one of Savannah's representative organizations, and his name is also closely associated with the early history of Freemasonry in the United States. Sheftal and the above-named Manuel Mordecai Noah, besides their active service in the army, also contributed large sums to the cause of the revolution. Other Jews advanced considerable sums, some of them almost beyond their means. The list of those who rendered valuable and timely assistance includes Benjamin Levy, Hyman Levy, Samuel Lyons, Isaac Moses, and Benjamin Jacobs. There was one, however, who gave more than all of them together, who gave away practically all he possessed, and neither he nor his rightful heirs ever recovered the large debts which the new nation owed to him. This man was Hyam Solomon, born in Lusa, Poland, now a part of Prussia, in 1740, died in Philadelphia January 6, 1785. He probably traveled extensively before coming to America, because he could speak German, French, and Italian, besides Polish and Russian, an accomplishment which could hardly have been acquired by a Jew in Poland in that period. He settled in New York and there married Rachel, a daughter of Moses B. Franks, a brother of Jacob Franks. He was arrested by the British as an American spy soon after they occupied New York in September 1776 and was kept in confinement for a considerable period. When his linguistic proficiency became known, he was turned over to the Hessian General Heister, who gave him an appointment in the commissariat department. He used the greater liberty which was now accorded him to be of service to the French and American prisoners, and to assist a number of them to effect their escape. On August 11, 1778, he escaped from New York and settled in Philadelphia. He soon became a prominent exchange broker and did considerable business with Robert Morris, 1734 to 1806, the financier of the American Revolution, who was superintendent of finance for the colonies in 1781 to 84. He also became broker to the French consul and the treasurer of the French army, which came to assist Washington, and fiscal agent to the French minister to the United States, Chevalier de la Lucerne. In these capacities, large sums passed through his hands, and he became the principal individual depositor of the Bank of North America, which was founded by Morris. The latter, who kept a diary, mentions in it nearly 75 separate transactions in which Solomon's name figures in the negotiation of bills of exchange, by which means the credit of the government was maintained in this period, Solomon practically being the sole agent employed by Morris for this purpose. 
Most of the money advanced by Louis XVI to the cause of the revolution and the proceeds of the loans negotiated in Holland passed through his hands. He advanced aid to numerous prominent men of this period. James Madison, in a letter, August 27, 1782, urging the forwarding of remittances from his state, which he represented in Philadelphia, wrote, I have for some time been a pensioner on the favor of Hyam Solomon, a Jew broker. On September 30th of the same year, he writes, The kindness of our little friend in Front Street, near the coffee house, is a fund which will preserve me from extremities, but I never resort to it without great mortification, as he obstinately rejects all recompense. The price of money is so usurious that he thinks it ought to be extorted from none but those who aim at profitable speculation. To a necessitous delegate, he gratuitously spares a supply out of his private stock. James Wilson, 1742-98, to another famous delegate to the Continental Congress, who sometimes acted as Solomon's attorney, relates that without his client's aid, administered with equal generosity and delicacy, he would have been forced to retire from the public service. Hyam Solomon died suddenly at the age of 45, leaving a widow and two infant children named Ezekiel and Hyam M. The inventory of his estate showed that he had lent to the government more than $350,000, but although these certificates of indebtedness were almost all that was left of his wealth, they were never paid, and all efforts of his heirs in later times to recover from Congress payment on these claims or even to obtain a token of recognition for his great services, had thus far proved unsuccessful. Solomon also took an active part in Jewish communal affairs in Philadelphia, and was one of the original members of the Congregation Mikwa Israel. In 1784, he was treasurer of what was probably the first Jewish charitable organization in that city. His son, Hyam M. Solomon, lived in New York and was a dealer in powder and shot, occupying a store in Front Street in the time of the Great Fire of 1835. William Solomon, born in Mobile, Alabama, October 9, 1852, of New York, is a great-grandson of Hyam Solomon. End of Chapter 12Chapter 13 of History of the Jews in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Jews in America by Peter Wernick. The Decline of Newport. Washington and the Jews. England's special enmity to Newport caused the dispersion of its Jewish congregation. The General Assembly of Rhode Island meets in the historic Newport Synagogue. Moses Sahaeus' address to Washington on behalf of the Jews of Newport and the latter's reply. Washington's letters to the Hebrew congregations of Savannah, Georgia, and to the congregations of Philadelphia. New York, Richmond, and Charleston. The breaking out of the revolution put an end to the commercial prosperity of Newport. Its situation upon the ocean, which made it before so favorable for commerce, had now an opposite effect, and left it more exposed to attacks from the enemy than any other place of equal importance in North America. Its inhabitants had especially provoked the hostility of the mother country, as it was one of the first places to manifest a spirit of resistance to the British government by burning an armed vessel of war that came to exact an odious tax. It could expect no mercy and receive none, when 8,000 British and Hessian troops occupied it in 1776. 480 houses were destroyed, its commerce was ruined, and its commercial interests never recovered from this blow, which fell with crushing effect upon the Jewish residents.
The congregation was dispersed, the synagogue was closed, and Rabbi Isaac Toro went with his family to Jamaica, where he remained until his death in 1782. Aaron Lopez, who was a heavy sufferer, accompanied by a majority of the foremost Jews of Newport, removed to Leicester, Massachusetts, and their stay in that town had an effect favorable on its development. Others went to Philadelphia and other places. When Newport was evacuated in 1779, after the enemy destroyed its wharfs and fortifications, and carried off its library and records, some of the exiles began to return. When the General Assembly of the State of Rhode Island convened for the first time after the evacuation, it met in the historic synagogue, September 1780. Aaron Lopez was one of a number of the Leicester colony who set out for their former home, but he was drowned on the way and his body was later recovered and buried in the old cemetery. But those who returned did not remain long. New York had become the great commercial center after the revolution, and the important Newport merchants left one by one for that city. Others went to Philadelphia, Charleston, or Savannah. The congregation was, however, still in existence when President Washington visited Newport in August 1790, and he was on the occasion formally addressed by Moses Sahas on behalf of the Jews of Newport, as follows. Quote, Sir, permit the children of the stock of Abraham to approach you with the most cordial affection and esteem for your person and merit, and to join with our fellow citizens in welcoming you to Newport. With pleasure, we reflect on those days of difficulty and danger when the God of Israel, who delivered David from the peril of the sword, shielded your head in the day of battle, and we rejoice to think that the same spirit which rested in the bosom of the greatly beloved Daniel enabled him to preside over the provinces of the Babylonian Empire, rests and ever will rest upon you, enabling you to discharge the arduous duties of chief magistrate of these states. Deprived, as we have hitherto been, of invaluable rights of free citizens, we now, with a deep sense of gratitude to the almighty disposer of all events, behold a government erected by the majesty of the people, a government which gives no sanction to bigotry and no assistance to persecution, but generously affords to all liberty of consciousness and immunities of citizenship, deeming everyone of whatever nation, tongue, or language, equal parts of the great governmental machine. This so ample and extensive federal union, whose base is philanthropy, mutual confidence, and public virtue, we cannot but acknowledge to be the work of the great God, who rules the armies of the heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth, doing whatever deemeth to him good. For all the blessings of civil and religious liberty, which we enjoy under unequal and benign administration, we desire to send up thanks to the Ancient of Days, the great preserver of men, beseeching him that the angel who conducted our forefathers through the wilderness into the promised land may graciously conduct you through all the difficulties and dangers of this mortal life. And when, like Joshua, full of days and of honors, you are gathered to your fathers, may you be admitted into the heavenly paradise to partake of the water of life and the tree of immortality. End quote. To this letter, which bears unmistakable traces of having been originally composed in rabbinical Hebrew, the father of his country replied as follows, quote, To the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island, Gentlemen, while I have received with much satisfaction your address, replete with expressions of esteem, I rejoice in the opportunity of assuring you that I shall always retain a grateful remembrance the cordial welcome I experienced in my visit to Newport for all classes of citizens. The reflection on the days of difficulty and danger which are past is rendered the more sweet from the consciousness that they are succeeded by days of uncommon prosperity and security. 
If we have the wisdom to make the best use of the advantage with which we are now favored, we cannot fail under the just administration of a good government to become a great and happy people. The citizens of the United States of America have the right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy worthy of imitation. All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. It is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it were by the indulgence of one class of people, that another, the exercise of their inherent natural rights, for happily the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. It would be inconsistent with the frankness of my character not to avow that I am pleased with your favorable opinion of my administration and fervent wishes of my felicity. May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the good will of the other inhabitants, while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. May the Father of all mercies scatter light and not darkness in our paths, and make us all in our several vocations useful here and, in his own due time and way, everlastingly happy. Signed, G. Washington. End quote. In the year following this correspondence, the synagogue was closed for lack of attendance, and it was not reopened for nearly a century. The above-named Moses Sahez, who for many years was cashier of the Bank of Rhode Island, was one of the last Jews in Newport of that period. Moses Lopez, the nephew of Aaron, is reputed to have been the last one who remained there, and ultimately he, too, left for New York, where he died in 1830. Sentiment caused the descendants of many of the original families to direct that their remains should be buried in the old cemetery, where tombstones show internments during the entire period down to 1855. Abraham Toro died in Boston, 1822. The son of Rabbi Isaac Toro bequeathed a fund for perpetually keeping the synagogue in repair and also made provisions for the care of the burial ground. His brother, Judah Taro of New Orleans, replaced the old cemetery wall with a massive one of stone with an imposing granite gateway in 1843, and, at his own request, he himself was buried there. The street on which the synagogue is situated is known as Toro Street. The city also possesses a park known as Toro Park, though the Toro Fund provided for the support of the minister also, the synagogue remained closed until 1883 when the Reverend A.P. Mendez, an appointment by the Congregation Shariath Israel of New York, which became the legal proprietor of both synagogue and cemetery of Newport, became minister and conducted services until his death in 1891. There are extant two other letters written by George Washington to Jewish communities which felicitated him upon his advancement to the presidency. One is in reply to an address signed by Levi Shaftal as president in behalf of the Jewish congregations of Savannah and is as follows. Quote, to the Hebrew congregations of the city of Savannah, Georgia. Gentlemen, I thank you with great sincerity for your congratulations on my appointment to the office which I have the honor to hold by the unanimous choice of my fellow citizens, and especially the expressions you are pleased to use in testifying the confidence that is reposed in me by your congregations. As the delay which has naturally intervened between my election and your address has afforded me an opportunity for appreciating the merits of the federal government and for communicating your sentiments of its administration. 
I have rather to express my satisfaction rather than regret at a circumstance which demonstrates, upon experiment, your attachment to the former as well as approbation of the latter. I rejoice that a spirit of liberality in philanthropy is much more prevalent than it formerly was among the enlightened nations of the earth, and that your brethren will benefit thereby in proportion as it shall become still more extensive. Happily, the people of the United States have in many instances exhibited examples worthy of imitation, the salutary influence of which will doubtless extend much further if gratefully enjoying these blessings of peace which, under the favor of heaven, have been attained by fortitude in war, they shall conduct themselves with reverence to the deity and charity towards their fellow creatures. May the same wonder-working deity, who long since delivered the Hebrews from their Egyptian oppressors, planted them in a promised land, whose providential agency has lately been conspicuous in establishing these United States as an independent nation, still continue to water them with the dews of heaven and make the inhabitants of every dominion participate in the temporal and spiritual blessings of that people whose God is Jehovah. Signed, G. Washington. End quote. The third address was from the Hebrew congregations in the city of Philadelphia, New York, Richmond, and Charleston, dated December 13, 1790, and signed on their behalf by Manuel Josephson, to which the president returned the following. Quote, Gentlemen, the liberality of sentiment towards each other, which marks every political and religious denomination of men in this country, stands unparalleled in the history of nations. The affection of such a people is a treasure beyond the reach of calculation, and the repeated proofs which my fellow citizens have given of their attachment to me and approbation of my doings from the purest sources of my temporal felicity. The affectionate expressions of your address again excite my gratitude and receive my warmest acknowledgement. The power and goodness of the Almighty, so strongly manifested in the events of our late glorious revolution, and his kind interposition in our behalf, have been no less visible in the establishment of our present equal government. In war he directed the sword, and in peace he has ruled in our councils. My agency in both has been guided by the best intentions and a sense of duty I owe to my country. And as my intentions have hitherto been amply rewarded by the approbation of my fellow citizens, I shall endeavor to deserve a continuance of it by my future conduct. May the same temporal and eternal blessing which you implore for me rest upon your congregations. Signed, G. Washington. End, quote. End of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of History of the Jews in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Jews in America by Peter Wiernick. Other Communities in the First Periods of Independence. Rabbi Gershom Mendes Satius. Growth of the Jewish Community of Philadelphia on Account of the War. Protest Against the Religious Test Clause in the Constitution of Pennsylvania. Benjamin Franklin Contributes Five Pounds to Midway Israel. Secession of the German-Polish Element. New Societies. Jewish Lawyers. Judge Moses Levi. Congressman H. M. Phillips. The Bush Family of Delaware. New Jersey and New Hampshire. North Carolina, the Mordecai family, and other early settlers. While the Jewish community of New York was not entirely dispersed, like that of Newport, by the outbreak of the Revolution, a great majority resolved to leave the city before it was occupied by the British, 
September 15, 1776. The patriotic minister of the congregation here at Israel, Rabbi Gershom Mendes Seychers, born in New York 1745, died there July 2, 1816, who was the spiritual head of the community since 1766, early espoused the cause of the colonies, and it was mostly due to his influence that the congregation closed the door of its synagogue on the approach of the British. Most of those who left went to Philadelphia, where Vicatius himself first went to Stratford, Connecticut, where he remained about four years, and where several of his former congregants joined him. In 1780, he too went to Philadelphia, but returned to New York after the war. March 1784, when the synagogue was reopened and he resumed his former position, he later, 1787, became a trustee of Columbia College and was one of its incorporators whose name appeared on the charter. It was, however, notwithstanding the statement of Dr. Benjamin Rush that the Jews in all the states are Whigs, a sprinkling of Tories in New York Jewry, who remained at home, and some of them occasionally held services in the synagogue during the British occupation under the presidency of Lion Jonas and subsequently of Alexander Zuntz, a Hessian officer who settled in New York. On the reorganization of the congregation at the close of the revolution, Hyman Levy succeeded Zuntz as president and the congregation presented an address of congratulation to Governor Clinton on the outcome of the war. Rabbi Satius was one of the 14 ministers who participated in the inauguration of Washington as president in New York on April 30, 1789. A list of the residents of New York in 1799, whose residences were assessed at 12,000 pounds or over, includes the names of Benjamin Satius, Solomon Sampson, Alexander Zuntz, and Ephraim Hart. The community was still small, not quite half as large as that of Newport in the preceding period. There were only about 500 Jews in New York at the commencement of the War of 1812, but it was slowly growing, and several of the first communal institutions date from that time. A Hebrew janitor hesedim for the burying of the dead was organized in 1785. The Polonese Talmud Torah was founded in 1802 with a fund which Maya Polonese bequeathed to the congregation for that purpose in the preceding year. The Hebrew Hesed We Amet was organized in the same year. The Jewish community which gained most in time of the war was that of Philadelphia. The little building in Sterling Alley, where the congregation Mikwa Israel prayed at that time, soon became too small, and a three-story brick house in Cherry Alley, between Third and Fourth Streets, was hired. But even the new place was soon too small, and a plain building was constructed on a lot in Cherry Street, west of Third Street, which was bought for the purpose. It was dedicated on September 13, 1782, by Rabbi Satius. A list of the members of the congregation at that time contains 102 names, and the percentage of Ashkenazic, German, and Polish names is much larger than in similar lists of earlier dates. A year after the synagogue was built, the Jews of Philadelphia for the first time appeared as an organized body in any public proceeding. On the 23rd of December, 1783, the minister, Gershom Mendez Satius, the Parnas, Simon Nathan, and Asher Myers, Bernard Gratz, and Chaim Solomon, as members of the Muhammad, or board of trustees, in behalf of themselves and brethren, addressed the Council of Census in relation to the declaration required to be made by each member of the assembly, which affirmed that the scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments were given by divine inspiration, and also in relation to that part of the Constitution which declared that no other test should be required of any civil magistrate in that state. They represented that the provisions deprived them of the right of ever becoming representatives. They did not covet office, they said, 
but they thought the provision improper and an injustice to the members of a persuasion that had always been attached to the American clause. This memorial appeared to have had no immediate effect, but it doubtless had its influence in procuring the ultimate modification of the test clause in the Constitution of Pennsylvania. Rabbi Satius was succeeded in Philadelphia by the Reverend Jacob Raphael Cohen, died September 1811, who was formerly a reader or Hassan in Montreal, Canada, and New York. The congregation was weakened by the departure of a considerable number of members after the war, and probably also by the death of Hyam Solomon, who was one of its most generous contributors, and found itself in financial difficulties about the year 1788, after an application to the General Assembly of Pennsylvania for permission to set up a lottery to pay the amount due on the synagogue building was not granted. The congregation issued a general appeal to citizens of all sects. Among the non-Jews who sent in contributions in response to this appeal was the great Benjamin Franklin, 1706 to 90, and the astronomer David Rittenhouse, 1732 to 96, the former contributing five pounds and the latter two. In April 1790, the legislature passed an act to allow the Hebrew congregation to raise 800 pounds sterling by a lottery. The managers were Manuel Josephson, Solomon Lyon, Solomon Hayes, Solomon Edding, William Wister, and John Duffield. The last two were not Jews, but were placed among the trustees, probably to give the project some influence with members of other denominations. The inevitable secession of the Askenaic element took place in 1802, when the Hebrew German Society wrote of Shalom, one of the earliest German Jewish congregations in America was formed. It was reorganized and chartered in 1812. Among its earliest rabbis were Wolf Benjamin, Jacob Lippmann, Bernard Illoui, Henry Vidiv, Moses Selsbacher, and Moses Rao. A Society for the Visitation of the Sick and for Mutual Assistance was organized in October 1813, on Jacob Cohen as its first president. In 1819, several ladies organized the still-existing Female Hebrew Benevolent Society, of which Miss Rebecca Gratz, 1781-1869, who is reputed to be the prototype of Rebecca in Walter Scott's Ivanhoe, was the first secretary. Several other benevolent and educational societies date their origin from the first half of the 19th century and have helped to give the Jewish community of Philadelphia that substantiality and compactness of organization, which is missing in other large cities of the United States. At the same time, progress was being made in other directions, too. The aptitude of the Jew for the legal profession could not be displayed and utilized as early as his well-known medical skill, which he exercised even in the Dark Ages. But as soon as the opportunity of emancipation was offered, good jurists appeared and soon occupied a prominent place at the bar and also on the bench. The earliest Jewish practitioner in Pennsylvania, of whom there is a record, was Moses Levi, died May 9, 1826 whose admission to the bar dates as far back as 1778, and who a year later was admitted to practice in the Supreme Court of that state. He held various offices and finally became presiding judge of the District Court of the City and County of Philadelphia, 1822, after having served 20 years as recorder. At least three other Jews were admitted to the practice of law in Philadelphia in the 18th century. Samson Levi, died 1831. In 1787, Daniel Levi of Northumberland County, died 1844 in 1791. And Seligman Phillips, 1799-1839 to 1839, in 1799. About a dozen more were during the first half of the 19th century, among them being the latter son, Henry Mayer Phillips, who was admitted in 1832, and was, 24 years later, 
elected to represent the 4th District of Pennsylvania in the 35th Congress. See Henry S. Morris, The Jews of Philadelphia Index. The number of Jews in the remainder of the 13 original colonies was at that time very small, and they were mostly scattered. While there are, for instance, records of Jews who lived or traded in Delaware as early as 1655, there was no Jewish community in that state until about two centuries later, but there was at least one Jewish family in Wilmington, Delaware, immediately after the Revolution, several members of which participated in that struggle. David Bush joined the Washington Lodge of Freemasons of Wilmington on December 16, 1784. He was the senior warden in 1789 its treasurer in 1791, and again senior warden in 1795. He was the father of Major Louis Bush, who has been mentioned in a former chapter, and of three other sons, two of whom also held offices in the same lodge in the last decade of the 18th century. Joseph Capel, Capels, was master of the lodge in 1792. The colony of New Jersey, whose Indians, according to a description by William Penn, closely resembled Jews, had very few real Israelites in colonial times. Despite its proximity to New York on one side and to Pennsylvania on the other, in the test established in West Jersey for office holders in 1693, the candidate had to declare on oath or affirmation that he professes faith in God the Father and Jesus Christ his eternal Son. In the East Jersey Bill of Rights was inserted the provision that no person or persons that profess faith in God by Jesus Christ his only Son shall at any time be any way molested, provided this shall not be extended to any of the Romish religion. But, as it is justly observed by Mr. Friedenberg, see publications 17, page 36. These provisions were not all aimed against the Jews, of whom there were hardly any in the colony at that time, but against heathens, atheists, infidels, and Catholics, especially against the latter. No Jews were naturalized in New Jersey before the Revolution. David Hayes is known to have resided on a plantation in Grigstown, Somerset County, in 1744, when he offered it for sale and Myers Levy, a Dutch Jew, is reported to have absconded from Spotsville in East New Jersey in 1760, leaving many debts behind. Another Jew, Nathan Levy, a shopkeeper of Phillipsburg, Sussex County, West Jersey, is mentioned many years later. It was only, as far as it is known, one Jew in the New Jersey troops of the Continental Army, Asher Levi, or Lewis, a grandson of the well-known Asher Levi of New Amsterdam. He was commissioned ensign in the 1st Regiment, September 12, 1778. The New Jersey Journal was established by David Franks at Camden in 1778 and existed about four years. The first families with Jewish names which are mentioned in the records of New Hampshire were the Moses and the Abrams family descendants of Jewish Christians. The Abrams family, according to tradition, is descended from two brothers who came from Palestine to New England at an unknown date, their names being William Abrams, who was a ship's carpenter and fell into the sea and was drowned, and John, the other brother, who settled at Amesbury, Massachusetts, publication 11, page 79, in the list of grants to settlers on the road between Wolfsboro and Levittstown, Ossipee, issued in 1770, on condition that each settler had to give a bond for 30 pounds that a house would be erected by him within a year. Grant number 11 was made to Joseph Levi. In 1777, mention is made of William Levi of Somersworth as a private in the 2nd New Hampshire Continental Regiment. Abraham Isaac settled in Portsmouth about the close of the Revolution and was active in Masonic affairs. A local historian writes of him that he and his wife were natives of Prussia and Jews of the strictic sect. 
they were the first descendants of the venerable patriarchs that ever pitched their tents in Portsmouth, and during their lives were the only Jews among us. He acquired a good property and built a house on State Street. Their shop was always closed on Saturday. Mr. Isaac died February 15, 1803, and on the stone which marks his grave in the North Burying Ground is an epitaph written by the poet J. M. Sewell, author of the popular revolutionary song, Fain Britons Boast No Longer. It has already been mentioned in a former chapter that there were hardly any Jews in North Carolina at the time when its representatives voted at the Constitutional Convention against the abolition of religious tests. The provision of its state constitution of 1776, which read that no person who shall deny the being of God or the truth of the Protestant religion shall be capable of holding any office or place of trust or profit in the civil department within the state, was doubtless aimed primarily at Roman Catholics, though it necessarily included Jews, Quakers, Mohammedans, etc. Jews did not become directly interested in the struggle for religious liberty in that state until the first decade of the 19th century, and the description of it will be found in the following chapter. The annals of Freemasonry would usually disclose the earliest Jewish settlers in various localities in the 18th century, do not contain any Jewish names in the lodges of that fraternity until its very close. Jacob Mordecai, born in Philadelphia, 1762, died in Richmond, 1838, a son of Moses Mordecai, born in Bonn, Germany, 1707, died in Philadelphia, 1781, was master of Johnston Caswell Lodge, number 10, of Warrington, North Carolina, in 1797, 1798, and 1799. He was the founder and proprietor of a female seminary in that city, which enjoyed a good reputation. One of his sons, Major Alfred Mordecai, 1804-87, was probably the first Jewish graduate of the United States Military Academy of West Point. Zachariah Hart, also spelled Hart, H-A-R-T-E, was a member of David Glasgow Lodge in Glasgow County in 1798 and 1799. Abraham Isaacs was senior warden of St. Tammany Lodge No. 30 of Wilmington in 1798. Aaron Lazarus, 1777-1841, to 1841, who was mentioned as one of the first Hebrews to reach Wilmington and later became one of the first directors of the Wilmington and Weldon Railway Company, was a member of the same lodge in 1803. There were about half a dozen other Jewish masons in the lodges of Wilmington, New Bern, and of Beaufort County about that time. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of History of the Jews in America This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Jews in America by Peter Wernick The Question of Religious Liberty in Virginia and in North Carolina Little Change in the Basic Systems of state institutions. Patrick Henry, Madison, and Jefferson on Religious Liberty in Virginia. The similarity between the Virginia Statute and the conclusions of Moses Mendelssohn pointed out by Count Maribu. The First Congregation of Richmond. Article 32 of the Constitution of North Carolina against Catholic, Jews, etc. How Jacob Henry a Jewish member of the legislature, defended and retained his seat in 1809. Judge Gaston's Interpretation The First Congregation of Williamton, North Carolina Final Emancipation in 1868 The provision in Article 6 of the Constitution of the United States, Section 3, states that, quote, no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust 
under the United States, end quote, settled the matter only as far as the national government was concerned. Each of the independent and sovereign states could solve this problem in its own way, though most of them have already adapted full religious freedom. But it must be remembered that the basic institutions of the states were not directly changed by the revolution, and in some of them, they were not changed at all. In some instances, royal charters remained, with some alterations as state constitutions. English common law remained in force even to this day, unless otherwise provided for by special enactment. The colonies were too free originally to require or desire a sudden radical change when they threw off the British yoke. They kept on progressing by the slow process of evolution, but not at an equal pace, each emphasizing the questions in which the inhabitants were mostly interested. Uniform or simultaneous action was not to be expected under such conditions. Virginia, the state of Washington and of Jefferson, the, quote, mother of presidents, end quote, and the home of the framers of the National Constitution, began to consider the question of religious liberty seriously soon after peace was declared. It was not a new question even then, for as early as 1776, when a new constitution for the Commonwealth was drafted, there occurred a significant discussion about the difference between toleration and rights. The Declaration of Rights, reported by a committee of which Colonel Mason was chairman, contained a provision relative to religious liberty whose authorship is attributed to Patrick Henry, 1736 to 1799. It provided that all men should enjoy the fullest toleration in the exercise of religion. Madison strongly opposed the use of the word toleration, which recognized liberty of worship not as a right, but as a favor granted to dissenting denominations. At his instance, the provision was amended to read, quote, All men are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience. End quote. But even this was still far from actual separation of church and state in Virginia. Even annual assessments, which had been theretofore levied in favor of the Episcopal Church, were not abolished outright. They were simply suspended from year to year until, at Jefferson's insistence, the grant was defeated in 1779. In that year, he introduced a measure entitled, quote, a bill for establishing religious freedom, end quote, which, after two readings, was sent through the state to secure the sense of the people relative to it before taking final action at the next legislature. It was permitted to languish unenacted upon for several years, and during that time an agitation was kept up against the spirit which it embodied. Various measures were suggested about 1784 looking to establish Christianity in Virginia instead of any single Christian sect, as before the revolution, and for securing governmental support to all Christian sects. The theory of the advocates of such measures was that while there should be no actual persecution of non-Christian sects, the state ought to establish Christianity as the religion of the great majority of the people, and that the revolution had involved merely the principle that no single Christian sect should be preferred over any other. On November 11th, 1784, a resolution drafted by Patrick Henry was reported to the lower, lower house of the legislature, providing that, quote, the people of the Commonwealth, according to their respective abilities, ought to pay a moderate tax or contribution for the support of the Christian religion or of some Christian church denomination or communion, end quote. In spite of Madison's opposition, it was adopted by a vote of 47 to 32, and a special committee, of which Mr. Henry was chairman, was appointed to draft such a bill. It was clearly understood that this measure was intended to curtail the rights of Jewish and other non-Christian residents. Beverly Randolph, writing about this subject to James Monroe, says, 
quote, the only great point that has been discussed since the sitting of the assembly has been a motion for a general assessment upon more contracted ground than I could ever have expected. The generals on the opposite side were Henry and Madison. The former advocated with his usual art the establishment of the Christian religion in exclusion of all other denominations. By this I mean that Turks, Jews, and infidels were to contribute to the support of a religion whose truth they did not acknowledge. Madison displayed great learning and ingenuity with all the powers of a close reasoner, but was unsuccessful in the event, having a majority against him. I am, however, inclined to think that the measure will not be adopted. The supporters of this holy system will certainly split whenever they come to enter upon the minute arrangements of the business. End quote. Quote, a bill establishing a provision for teachers of the Christian religion, end quote, was brought in December 23rd, 1784, and after it was amended, uh, but without materially changing its substance, it passed its second reading. But on the next day, December 24th, Madison was able to secure the passage of a resolution postponing the third reading till the following November, and copies of the bill were ordered to be printed and distributed in every county of the Commonwealth. The people were requested to signify their opinion respecting the adoption of such a measure to the next se session of the legislature. An active and thorough discussion of the bill followed throughout the state. Madison prepared a, quote, memorial and remonstrance, end quote, against the bill, which was extensively circulated and signed. Madison made no mistake in suggesting this appeal to the people. When the assembly met in October 1785, the table of the House of Delegates almost sunk under the weight of the accumulated copies of the memorial against the bill, which came from different counties, each with its long and dense columns of subscribers. The fate of the assessment was sealed. The manifestation of the public judgment was too unequivocal and overwhelming to leave the faintest hope to the friends of the measure, and it was abandoned without a struggle. The declaratory act of the establishment of the religious liberty, which had been drawn by Jefferson as one of the committee of revisers and presented to the legislature in 1779, was then taken up and passed into law. Madison's, quote, memorial and remonstrance, end quote, had cleared away every obstruction. In a letter to Madison, dated December 16, 1786, Jefferson, who was then our minister to France, wrote, quote, the Virginia Act for Religious Freedom has been received with infinite approbation in Europe and propagated with enthusiasm. I do not mean by the governments, but by the individuals who compose them. It has been translated into French and Italian, has been sent to most of the parts of Europe, and has been the best evidence of the falsehoods of those reports which stated us to be in anarchy. It is inserted in the new encyclopedia and is appearing in most of the publications respecting America. In fact, it is comfortable to see the standard of reason at length erected after so many ages during which the human mind has been held in vassalage by kings, priests, and nobles. And it is honorable for us to have produced the first legislature who had the courage to declare that the reason of men may be trusted with the formation of its own opinions." End quote. In the following year, Count Maribu, 1749 to 1791, the most distinguished of the advocates of Jewish emancipation in France, calls attention in his essay on Moses Mendelssohn and the political reform of the Jews, 1787, to the striking similarity of the enactment of Virginia to the conclusions at which the Jewish philosopher of Berlin arrived by abstract reasoning, assuming that Mendelssohn never saw the preamble of the American law, which was drafted by Jefferson four years before the publication of, quote, Jerusalem in 1783. It is clear, however, 
that about seven years later, when the Great French Revolution, which was influenced by the American Revolution, much more than is commonly supposed, was in full swing, even the debates of the Constitutional Convention of Virginia of 1776 had become known to the Friends of Religious Liberty in France. In the course of a petition in favor of their own emancipation, addressed by the French Jews to the National Assembly on January 29, 1790, they said, quote, America, to which politics will owe so many useful lessons, has rejected the word toleration from its code as a term tending to compromise individual liberty and to sacrifice certain classes of men to other classes. To tolerate is, in fact, to suffer that which you could, if you wish, prevent and prohibit, end quote. There were not many Jews in Virginia at the time when this momentous question was discussed and solved. Individual Jews were mentioned in the 17th century, but the first record of a congregation occurs in connection with the address to Washington, mentioned above, page 102, which was sent by the Hebrew congregations of Philadelphia, Richmond, New York, and Charleston. The minute book of the congregation Bet Shalom of Richmond, Virginia, dates back to the year 1791, and it is assumed that the first or Sephardic congregation was organized in that year. The first place of worship was in a room of a three-story brick building on the west side of 19th Street between Franklin and Grace Streets, where one of the members resided. It later moved to a small brick building erected on the west side of 19th Street in the rear of the Union Hotel, which then stood on the corner of Main Street. After some years, a lot was purchased from Dr. Adams on the east side of Mayo Street, above Franklin Street, on which a commodious synagogue was erected, in which the congregation worshipped for upwards of three quarters of a century. The burial ground on Franklin Street, near 21st Street, which is now enclosed with a substantial granite wall, was conveyed by Isaiah Isaac to Jacob I. Cohen, Israel I. Cohen, David Isaac, Moises Mordecai, Jacob I. Cohen, Jr., Simon Gratz, Aaron Levy, Moses Jacob, and Levy Myers as trustees on October 21st, 1791. It was used until about 1816 when Benjamin Wolfe, then a member of the Common Council of the City of Richmond, made application on behalf of the congregation for a new piece of ground, which was granted by an ordinance passed on the 20th day of May, giving for that purpose an acre of land belonging to the City of Richmond lying upon Soakey Hill. North Carolina, like Virginia, had an established church until a short time before the outbreak of the revolution. All citizens being required to pay toward its support and dissenting clergymen being denied the privilege of performing even the marriage ceremony. But when the dissenters won their fight against the establishment, they took an uncompromising stand against the complete emancipation of Roman Catholics, Jews, and others not belonging to a Protestant denomination. The opposition to Jews was mainly theoretical or academic, as there were practically no Jews in North Carolina at that time. In happy contrast to some old world countries of the present time, opposition to Jews in the United States developed only in parts of the country where they were least known. In all the original states which had considerable Jewish communities, like New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island, full religious liberty was firmly established before the adoption of the federal constitution. Like Virginia, too, North Carolina adopted a constitution in 1776. It provided for liberty of worship and even excluded clergymen from being members of the Senate, House of Commons, or Council of State. But when it came to the question of holding office, an exception was incorporated in Article 32, which reads as follows, quote, that no person shall deny the being of God or the truth of the Protestant religion or the divine authority either of the Old or New Testament, or who shall hold religious principles incompatible with the freedom and safety of the state 
shall be capable of holding any office or place of trust or profit in the civil department within the state, end quote. This article was doubtless aimed primarily at Roman Catholics, but the prohibition being a sweeping one, it necessarily included Jews, Quakers, Mohammedans, Deists, etc. While there was some opposition to the adoption of this section, it seems to have expressed the predominating opinion of the state on that point. For, as it was noted above, page 86, the delegates of North Carolina voted on the Federal Constitution Convention in 1787 against the clause abolishing religious tests. The entire question was again discussed at the state convention, which was called in 1788 to ratify the Constitution of the United States and the narrower view prevailed. The convention resolved neither to ratify nor reject the Constitution, but that a Declaration of Rights be laid before Congress and 26 amendments proposed. North Carolina was therefore unrepresented in the extra session of the first Congress, which adopted the First Amendment, quote, that Congress shall make no laws respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, end quote. This amendment was partly a concession to the state, implying a guarantee that even should a Papist or a Mohammedan be elected president, he should not be able to force his religion on those unwilling to accept it. After its adoption, North Carolina adopted the Constitution in November 1789. Despite all this prejudice, Section 32 of the state constitution soon became to be regarded a dead letter. As a matter of fact, a Catholic was elected governor in 1781. It was not until 1809 that the whole subject again came predominantly to the front in the case of Jacob Henry, a Jew, who was elected a member of the legislature for Cotteret County. He had served throughout the year 1808 and had apparently been re-elected for 1809, and then a fellow member asked to have his seat declared vacant on account of his faith. Henry delivered a notable address in the assembly in defense of his rights to his seat. It made a strong impression at that time, and it was later republished as an example of fine composition in a work known as the American Orator. He was permitted to retain his seat, but the principle at issue was rather avoided than settled. It was decided that the article prohibiting non-Protestant from holding office in any civil department of the state did not exclude such persons from serving in the legislature, because the legislative office was above all civil offices. The view was more poignantly defined by saying that Catholics and Jews could make the laws, but could neither execute nor interpret them. Actually, however, both executive and judicial offices were held by non-Protestants before and after that incident. When a distinguished Roman Catholic, William Gaston, 1778 to 1844, was chosen Justice of the Supreme Court of North Carolina in 1834, a doubt arose, even in his own mind, whether he could accept the office. But he resorted to an even more ingenious interpretation of the Constitution, which was subsequently followed in all other cases as well. He argued that the word, quote, deny, end quote, implied an overt act, and that, quote, the Constitution does not prescribe the faith which entitles to or excludes from civil office but demands from all those who hold office that decent respect of the prevalent religion of the country which forbids them to impunge it, to declare it false, to arraign it as an imposition upon the credulity of the people." End quote. While the acceptance of this decision made it possible for everyone to hold office, the efforts to abolish the religious test altogether did not cease. The question was again thoroughly debated at the convention, which came together in 1835 to amend the state constitution. There were practically no Jews in the state even then, but some of the distinguished members of the convention championed the cause of absolute religious liberty and worked for the abolition of the entire article which prescribed the test. 
Their efforts, however, were not successful, and the change which was adopted emancipated only the Catholics by substituting the word Christian for Protestant. The small Jewish congregation of Williamton, North Carolina, which was organized in 1852 for burial purposes, began about four years later to circulate a petition for the removal of the existing disability. A bill to that effect was introduced in the legislature in the same year, 1858, but the committee to which it was referred reported that while it considered the objectionable clause, quote, a relic of bigotry and intolerance, unfit to be associated in our fundamental law with the enlightened principle of representative government. It is highly inexpedient to alter or amend the Constitution by legislative enactment in any particular whatsoever." End quote. When the Constitution of North Carolina was again changed by the Convention of 1861, which voted for secession and joined the Confederacy, the article in question was changed in phraseology only. The word Christian was omitted, but the clause still debarred from holding office a, quote, person who shall deny the being of God or the divine authority of both the Old and the New Testament, end quote. The Convention of the Period of Reconstruction, which met in 1865, afforded no relief. But the Constitution, which it framed, was rejected by the people at the polls in the following year, though on other grounds. It was not until the Constitutional Convention of 1868 that Jewish emancipation was accomplished in North Carolina. The time was ripe for the abolition of all religious tests, and there appears to have been no debate on that point. Only, quote, persons who shall deny the being of Almighty God, end quote, were, and still are, debarred from holding office in that state as no change has been made in this regard since 1868. End of chapter 15. Chapter 16 of History of the Jews in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Jews in America by Peter Wernick The War of 1812 and the Removal of Jewish Disabilities in Maryland The Jewish community almost at a standstill between the Revolution and the War of 1812. Stoppage of immigration and losses through emigration and assimilation. No Jews in the newly admitted states. The small number of Jews who fought in the Second War with England included Judah Toro, the Philanthropist, the Jewish Disabilities in Maryland, a Jew appointed by Jefferson as United States Marshal for that state, the Jew Bill as an issue in Maryland politics, removal of the disabilities in 1826. The hopes of the Jews of Western Europe were raised by the French Revolution, which gave the Jews of France full citizenship. The Napoleonic Wars bought liberty and Jewish emancipation in the countries and principalities which were conquered by the great Corsican, and even where this was not achieved, it became a probability for the near future. The disturbed state of Europe made foreign travel, and especially emigration over sea, hazardous, and there were hardly any new arrivals of Jews from the Old World during the quarter century following the establishment of the United States government. There were, on the other hand, numerous departures of Jews for England and its American colonies, especially Jamaica, during and after the Revolution, and the losses through baptism and mixed marriages, which account for the disappearance of a large number of colonial Jewish families, retarded the natural growth of the communities. As a result, it is doubtful whether there were as many Jews in the United States at the time of the outbreak of the Second War with England in 1812 as there were in the Revolutionary period. Neither had their wealth or importance increased in those times. It seems that there was even some deterioration in both, caused, no doubt, by the lack of new blood, which is indispensable to small communities. There were hardly any Jews in the three new states, which were admitted to the Union in the eight years of Washington's administration. In Vermont, 
which came in in 1791, there was no Jewish congregation until the last quarter of the 19th century. Kentucky, 1792, and Tennessee, 1796, had very few Jews until a later period, and the stray Jewish-sounding names which are met within various records in the first half-century of their existence as states are not safe material for the foundation of a history of the Jews in these commonwealths. Ohio, which was admitted in 1803, had very few Jews at the time, and the immense territory of Louisiana, which was purchased from Napoleon in the same year, had practically none, as Jews never thrived in the French possessions in the New World, except in colonies like Martinique, where there was a Jewish community prior to it being occupied by the French, 1635. The number of Jews who took part in the War of 1812 was therefore smaller than that of the participants in the War of Independence, and the disproportionately large percentage of officers shows that they still belonged mostly to the wealthier classes. In the list which is enumerated in the valuable work of Mr. Simon Wolf, which was mentioned above, there are mentioned 13 officers, of whom one, Nathan Moses of Pennsylvania, achieved the rank of colonel, and two, Mayor Moses of South Carolina and Mordecai Myers of Pennsylvania, were captains. General Joseph Bloomfield of New Jersey, who is included in the list, was not a Jew. See Publications 11, page 190. The balance comprises three lieutenants, one adjutant, one ensign, two sergeants, three corporals, and 27 privates. Among the latter were Jacob Hayes and Benjamin Hayes of New York, father and son, and Judah Turo, the philanthropist, who was dangerously wounded at the Battle of New Orleans in January 1815. The War of 1812 gave the impetus to a renewal of the agitation for the removal of the disabilities of the Jews of Maryland, the only state which had a considerable Jewish community in such a disadvantageous position. The church establishment in Maryland terminated with the fall of the proprietary rule and the emergence into statehood. With it fell, too, the force of the legislation which for the century and a half had declared the profession of Jewish faith a capital offense, as was already mentioned in a previous chapter. But part of the old spirit remained under the new conditions and the new state constitution of 1776, which granted free exercise of religion, provided for a declaration of belief in the Christian religion as a necessary qualification for holding public office. But this did not prevent a gradual influx of Jews during and after the Revolutionary War, which is to be attributed to the commercial and industrial advantages of Baltimore. The first formal effort to effect the removal of the disability was made in December 1797, when Solomon Edding, born in York, Pennsylvania, 1764, died in Baltimore, 1847, Bernard Gratz, born in York, Pennsylvania, 1764, and died in Baltimore, 1801, and others presented a petition to the General Assembly at Annapolis, in which they averred, that they are a sect of people called Jews, and thereby deprived of many of the valuable rights of citizenship, and pray to be placed upon the same footing with other good citizens. The committee to whom this petition was referred reported the same day that they have taken the same into consideration and conceive the prayer of the petition is reasonable, but as it involves a constitutional question of considerable importance— they submit to the House the proprietary of taking the same into consideration at this advanced stage of the session. This disposition of the petition puts a quietus upon further agitation for the next five years. In the meantime, 1801, Reuben Edding, born in York, Pennsylvania, 1762, died in Philadelphia, 1848, a brother of the above-mentioned Solomon, was appointed by President Jefferson United States Marshal for Maryland, which presented the anomalous condition of a man who could not be chosen constable under the state laws, holding a highly responsible federal office. 
A second petition with the same object in view as the first was presented to the General Assembly in November 1802, and this time it came to a vote, but it was refused, 38 voting against it and only 17 in its favor. The attempt was renewed in 1803 and in 1804, when it was again defeated by a vote of 39 to 24. This fourth defeat disheartened the few determined spirits upon whom the brunt of the struggle had thus far fallen, and the formal agitation ceased for a time. The arrival in Baltimore from Richmond, Virginia, in the year 1808, of the Cohen family, consisting of the widow and six sons of Jacob J. Cohen, a soldier of the Revolution, a native of Rhenish Prussia, who came to America in 1773 and died in 1808, and other arrivals in that period, helped to increase the material importance and the communal influence of the Jews of Baltimore. After Solomon Edding and several members of the Cohen family served with distinction in the defense of Baltimore and in subsequent military engagements, the injustice of the Jewish disabilities became more manifest. The sympathy of a group of men active in public life was enlisted, and these conducted the legislative struggle for full emancipation of the Jews in the General Assembly from 1816 to 1826. The most prominent figure in this group, which included Thomas Brackenridge, E.S. Thomas, General Winder, Colonel W.G.D. Worthington, and John V.L. McMahon, was Thomas Kennedy of Washington County. The Jew Bill became a clearly defined issue in Maryland politics, and here we see again the American peculiarity mentioned above that those who knew the Jew best were the most ardent defenders. Several representatives from country districts, where Jews were known by name only, failed of re-election because they had voted for the repeal of Jewish disabilities, while on the other hand, a disposition favorable to Jewish emancipation became at an early date a sin qua non of election from Baltimore. The successful effort of Jacob Henry to retain his seat in the legislature of North Carolina, which has been described in the previous chapter, was effectively used by the Friends of the Jews in Maryland. Speaking on the Jew Bill in 1818, Mr. Brackenridge alluded to the incident as follows. In the state of North Carolina, there is a memorable instance on record of an attempt to expel Mr. Henry, a Jew, from the legislative body of which he had been elected a member. The speech delivered on that occasion I hold in my hand. It is published in a collection called The American Orator, a book given to your children at school and containing those Republican truths you wish to see earliest implanted in their minds. Mr. Henry prevailed, and it is part of our education as Americans to love and cherish the sentiments uttered by him on that occasion. Six years later, Colonel Worthington, in the course of a speech on the same subject, also recalled Henry's triumph in glowing terms. Some of these addresses delivered on the subject were considered of sufficient importance to be republished separately after the question was settled. One collection of them, entitled Speeches on the Jew Bill in the House of Delegates in Maryland, was published in Philadelphia in 1829. Finally, in 1822, a bill to the desired effect passed both houses of the General Assembly, but the Constitution of Maryland required that any act amendatory thereto must be passed at one session and published and confirmed at the succeeding session of the legislature. Accordingly, recourse was necessary to the session of 1823-24, to in which a confirmatory bill was introduced accompanied by a petition from the Jews of Maryland. The bill was confirmed by the Senate, but defeated in the House of Delegates after a stirring debate, and all formal legislation hitherto enacted was rendered nugatory. But the time was ripe for this act of justice, and on the last day of the following session of the legislature, February 26, 1825, an act for the relief of the Jews of Maryland which had already received the sanction of the Senate, was passed by the House of Delegates by a vote of 26 to 25. The bill provided that every citizen of this state professing the Jewish religion 
who shall be appointed to any office of profit or trust shall, in addition to the required oaths, make and subscribe a declaration of his belief in a future state of rewards and punishments, instead of the declaration now required by the government of the state. In the following year, a brief confirmatory act was passed, and the battle for Jewish emancipation was won. Theoretically, there still remained a discrimination, which was not eliminated until many years afterwards. But practically, there was no formal disability. Solomon Edding and Jacob I. Cohen, both of whom had been throughout the moving spirits of the legislative struggle, were promptly elected in Baltimore, October 1826, as members of the city council, and the former ultimately became president of that body. A number of Jews later occupied and still occupy important political positions in Maryland, commensurate with their individual ability and with the prominence of Jews in the business and professional life of the state. End of chapter 16. Read by Ellen Corcoran. Chapter 17 of History of the Jews in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Jews in America by Peter Brunick. Mordecai Manuel Noah and his Territorialist Zionistic Plans. Noah's Family. His youth and his early successes as journalist and dramatist. His appointment as consul in Tunis and his recall. His insistence that the United States is not a Christian nation. Editor and playwright, high sheriff and surveyor of the Port of New York. His invitation to the Jews of the world settle in the city of refuge, which he was to found on Grand Island. Impressive ceremonies in Buffalo which were the beginning and the end of Ararat. His discourse on the restoration of the Jews. Short career on the bench. Jewish activities. While the last vestiges of discrimination against the Jews were being removed in Maryland, a grandiose plan for solving the Jewish problem through colonization in America was conceived by one of the most prominent Jews of New York. This man was Mordecai Manuel Noah, born in Philadelphia, July 19, 1785, died in New York, March 22, 1851. He was of Portuguese descent, a son of Manuel Mordecai Noah of South Carolina, who served in the Revolutionary Army, and a cousin of Henry M. Phillips, born in Philadelphia, 1811, died there, 1884 who was a member from the 4th District of Pennsylvania in the 35th Congress, elected as a Democrat in 1856, and besides occupying various positions of honor and trust, also served as Grand Master of Freemasons of his native state. Noah was left an orphan at the age of four, and was brought up by his maternal grandfather, Jonas Phillips, born in Germany 1736, died in Philadelphia, 1803. Noah was apprenticed to a carver and gilder, but his studious habits and abilities attracted the attention of some prominent men, and it is said that the financier Robert Morris procured the cancellation of his indentures and obtained for him an appointment as clerk in the office of the Auditor of the United States Treasury. Upon the removal of the national capital to Washington, Young Noah resigned his clerkship and accepted employment as a reporter at the sessions of the Pennsylvania Legislature in Harrisburg, where he acquired his first experience in journalism. Several years later, he moved to Charleston, South Carolina, where he became, in 1809, the editor of the City Gazette and became an ardent advocate of war with England. This was against the prevailing spirit of the wealthy seaport town and it involved him in many quarrels, and in several duels, in one of which he killed his opponent. It was also in this city that his first play, Paul and Alexis, or 
the Orphans of the Rhine, was performed for the first time. It was afterwards taken to England where it was somewhat altered, and with its name changed to The Wandering Boys, was brought out in 1820 at the Park Theatre in New York with great success. After declining an appointment as consul to Riga, Russia, in 1812, Noah was appointed by President Madison a year later as American consul to Tunis, with a special mission to Algiers. He sailed from Charleston in a vessel bound for France, which was captured by the British fleet off the French coast. He was brought to England as a prisoner of war, but being regarded as a person of importance, he was allowed to remain at liberty upon his parole, and to utilize the time in traveling through the country. After some months, he was released and proceeded by way of Spain to his post of duty. He was soon engaged in the work for which he was specially commissioned, to ransom the American prisoners then held in slavery by the Algerians. He was to endeavor to release the captured sailors in such wise as to lead the Algerians to believe that the relatives and friends of the captives, and not the American government, was interested in their ransom. No affected this in a creditable manner under the circumstances, but he was compelled to expend a sum exceeding the amount allowed him by his government. Noah's political opponents at home made use of this apparent irregularity to effect his recall. Mr. Monroe, then Secretary of State, wrote to him that it was not known at the time of his appointment that his religion would be any obstacle to the exercise of his consular functions, but that recent information on which entire reliance could be placed proved that it would have been a very unfavorable effect that the president therefore had deemed it expedient to revoke his commission, and that upon the receipt of this letter he should consider himself as no longer in the service of the United States. Noah finally extricated himself from all his difficulties, and later was thoroughly vindicated. His actions approved and his advances remitted. One of his official acts as consul deserves a special mention. The war between the United States and England was still raging, when one day an American privateer came into the harbor of Tunis with three English East India men, loaded with valuable cargoes as prizes. The prizes and cargoes were turned over to the American consul to sell at auction. The British minister protested against such sale on the ground of a clause in the treaty with England, which provided that no Christian power should sell a British prize or its cargo in an Algerian port. Noah admitted the bona fides of the stipulation, but contended that under proper interpretation of international law, the United States could not be held to be a Christian nation within the meaning of the treaty, and hence was accepted from the inhibition. To prove his contention, he exhibited the Constitution of the United States with its provisions against sectarianism and religious tests and finally cited the Joel Barlow Treaty with Turkey of 1808, ratified by the United States Senate, which declared that the United States made no objections to Muslimmen because of their religion, and that they are entitled to and should receive all the privileges of citizens in the most saved nations. This argument was sustained by the Bay, and the prizes were accordingly sold in Tunis. Noah's contention thus became established as a principle of international law, which has never since been challenged. It was perhaps the stand taken by Noah in declaring the American nation to be non-Christian, which convinced the government at home that his faith was an obstacle to the exercise of the consular functions. On his return to America, Noah settled in New York, 1816, where he resided for the rest of his life, in the enjoyment of many honors and great popularity, he was successively the editor of the National Advocate, New York Enquirer, Evening Star, Commercial Advertiser, Union, and Times and Messenger. In 1819, he published in New York his travels in England, France, Spain, and the Barbary States, in which he described his experiences abroad, 
the services he had rendered to his government of Tunis, and the manner in which he was requited. His occupation as a journalist, which brought him into frequent connection with the theater, led him to return to dramatic authorship, and he was reputed to be one of the most popular American playwrights of his day. Most of his plays were based on American history, but some of them dealt with other themes like his successful melodrama, Yourself Carmati, or The Siege of Tripoli. He also took an active part in politics and was appointed High Sheriff of New York in 1822. But when the office was made elective a short time afterwards, he was defeated after an exciting campaign. He was a supporter of General Jackson and was later appointed him Surveyor of the Port of New York. But during all these varied activities, he never forgot, as he was indeed seldom permitted to forget, that he was a Jew. He had strong convictions on the subject of Jewish nationality and devoted considerable attention to the Jewish question in general. Finally, in 1825, he turned to his long-cherished scheme of the restoration of the Jews to their past glory as a nation. For this purpose, he acquired, with the aid of some of his friends, an island 13 miles in length and about 5 miles broad, called Grand Island, in the Niagara River, opposite Tonawanda, not far from Buffalo, New York, and issued a proclamation to the Jews of the world, inviting them to come and settle in the place, which he named Ararat, a city of refuge for the Jews. The plan had its practical side and attracted considerable attention. Noah was at that time perhaps the most distinguished Jewish resident in America, and could by no means be considered a visionary. The tract was chosen with particular reference to its promising commercial prospects, being close to the Great Lakes and opposite to the newly constructed Erie Canal, and Noah deemed it preeminently calculated to become in time the greatest trading and commercial depot in the new and better world. After heralding this project for some time, in his own newspapers and in the press, religious and secular, generally, Noah selected September 2, 1825, as the date for laying the foundation stone of the new city. Impressive ceremonies, ushered in by the firing of cannon, were held and participated in by state and federal officials, Christian clergymen, and even American Indians, whom Noah identified as the lost tribes of Israel, and who were also to find refuge in this new Ararat. It was found on that day that there was not boats enough in Buffalo to carry to Grand Island all who wished to go there, and the celebration in consequence took place in Buffalo. A procession, headed by a band of music, was formed, composed of military companies and several Masonic bodies in full regalia. After which came Noah, as governor and judge of Israel, wearing a judicial robe of crimson silk trimmed with ermine, followed by fraternal officers and dignitaries. After marching through the principal streets of Buffalo, the procession entered the Episcopal Church, where exercises, including a long oration by Noah, were held the close of the ceremonies being announced by a salvo of twenty-four guns. The celebration in Buffalo was the beginning and the end of the scheme. There was no response to the proclamation. The city was never built, and the monument of brick and wood which was erected upon the island, on the site of the contemplated town, fell to pieces, and in the course of time wholly disappeared. The only relic of the enterprise is the foundation stone of the proposed city, which is preserved in the rooms of the Buffalo Historical Society, with the inscription of 1825 still legible. Noah's plan was to establish Ararat as a merely temporary city of refuge for the Jews, until in the fullness of time a Palestinian restoration could be effected. The failure of this project of a temporary asylum did not weaken his belief in the ultimate redemption of the Jews and their return to the Holy Land. 
nearly 20 years after the unsuccessful attempt to concentrate the Jews on Grand Island. Noah delivered the greatest oration of his life, a discourse on the restoration of the Jews, which was soon afterwards published in book form, New York, 1844, in which he urged the return to Palestine as the only solution of the Jewish question, which had become acute in Europe in the troublesome times preceding the upheavals of 1848. Noah resigned the office of surveyor at the port of New York in 1833, after having held it about four years. After eight years of intense journalistic and political activity, he was, in 1841, appointed a governor Seward and associate judge of the New York Court of Sessions. He had no sooner commenced to discharge his judicial duties than James Gordon Bennett, in the New York Herald, began to assail and ridicule him. Noah himself made no complaint, but others took up the defense of the court's dignity, and Bennett was indicted for libel. Noah himself was not anxious to have the case prosecuted, asserting that the attack on him was the result of an old editorial quarrel, in which he had been to a considerable degree the aggressor. Bennett came off with a small pecuniary fine. Noah shortly afterwards resigned from the bench, to avoid sitting upon the trial of forgery of a certain member of Congress whom he had known from boyhood. He took an active part in Jewish communal affairs of New York City and was, in 1842, elected president of the Hebrew Benevolent Society. He was also president of the Jewish Charity Organization of New York and remained at its head when it was merged into a B'nai Lodge. Among his works of Jewish interest, deserves also to be mentioned a translation of the Book of Cheshire, which he published in 1840. He married Rebecca Jackson of New York, and their offspring numbered five sons and a daughter. He died in the 66th year of his age, and was the last Jew that was buried within the limits of old New York City. End of chapter 17Part 4, Chapter 18 of History of the Jews in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Jews in America by Peter Wiernick. Part 4, The Second or German Period of Immigration. Chapter 18, The First Communities in the Mississippi Valley. The Second or German Period of Immigration Part 4 The First Communities in the Mississippi Valley Impetus given to immigration to America by the reaction after the fall of Napoleon The Second Period of Jewish Immigration First Legislation About Immigration, 1819 The First Jew in Cincinnati Its First Congregation, Bene Israel Appeals to outside communities for funds to build a synagogue. The first Talmud Torah. Rabbis Gotham, Wise, and Lilienthal. Cleveland, St. Louis, Louisville, Mobile, Montgomery and its alleged Jewish founder, Abraham Mordecai, Savannah and Augusta, New Orleans, Judah Toro. The reaction in Western Europe after the fall of Napoleon in 1815 gave an impetus to emigration to America. This was especially true of Germany and more particularly of the German Jews. Those who had already tasted the sweets of freedom could not so easily endure the returning hardships of the galling exceptional laws and discriminations, as did their fathers and grandfathers who knew not the experience of better conditions. While the struggle for political and religious liberty was carried on with increased intensity in the various German states and principalities, many ventured to come out to the New World in quest of more favorable conditions and better opportunities. This new immigration, which continued for about half a century, until the Jews in all the German states were emancipated, 
much exceeded the immigration of the preceding two centuries, while it now appears almost insignificant in comparison with the large influx from the Slavic countries in the last thirty years. These Jewish immigrants of the second period, which is usually called the German period, though a considerable number came from Austria-Hungary, Russian Poland, and even Russia proper, were, in one essential point, more like the Slavic Jews, who came after them, than like the Sephardim of former times. They came poor and grew up with the country. The Spanish and Portuguese Jews as a class were wealthy. Some of them brought more capital with them than was found in the localities in which they settled. Their wealth and their business connections made them welcome, or secured them sufferance at a time and at places. In the old world, as well as in the new world, were a poor Jew, coming to earn his living as a peddler or craftsman, would probably never have been admitted. But better times had come, an immensely large country, which had now increased its territory by the Louisiana Purchase, and doubly secured its independence by the successful issue of the Second War with its former masters, now needed men even more than money, and the immigrant who came to cast his lot with the new nation was welcome. A substantial part of the Jewish immigrants of this new era remained in the older communities, which were thereby largely increased, but many penetrated far into the south and the west. New settlements were founded in scores of places, and almost in each case, a congregation was formed as soon as there were a sufficient number of Jews to warrant such an undertaking, as there was no longer any struggle between the Jews as such and the surrounding non-Jewish world. The history of the Jews of a locality is mainly the history of its communal institutions and of its individual members, who reflect credit on it by their distinction in various fields of activity. We shall now follow the formation of these new communities in various parts of the country with an effort to understand the spirit which moved the early settlers in their Jewish activities, which helped them to rise to an eminent position in their new home and to be useful to their fellow citizens, as well as to their co-religionists who arrived at a later period. There are no statistical figures for the number of immigrants who arrived in the second decade of the 19th century, but what may be considered as an official declaration in the voluminous report of the Immigration Commission issued in 1910 states that after the year 1816, an unprecedented emigration from Europe to the United States occurred. It is estimated that no less than 20,000 persons arrived in 1817. The sudden demand for passage caused overcrowding, disease and death in the steerage of the sailing vessels, which resulted in the first legislative interference by a law which became effective March 2, 1819, containing provisions intending to regulate the number of passengers on each vessel and proper victualling of each vessel. A provision of this law also marked the beginning of statistics relative to immigration into the United States and as there was now a certain percentage of Jews among the arrivals of each year, it may be presumed the Jews of that time were as much interested in these earliest provisions relating to immigration as we are today in that perennial question. Some of the pioneers of this new Jewish immigration came from England, but as in the earlier period of the Spanish Jews, the Germans and the Polish soon followed or came simultaneously. A typical instance was that of Cincinnati, where the first Jewish congregation in the Ohio Valley was formed. The first Jew to settle there was Joseph Jonas, born in Exeter, England, 1792, died in Cincinnati, May 5, 1869, who came to America in 1816 and lived for a short time in New York and in Philadelphia. He left the latter city on the second day of January, 1817, and arrived in Cincinnati on the 8th of March. He was a watchmaker by trade, and had little difficulty in establishing himself. He was a curiosity at first, 
as many in that part of the country had never seen a Jew before. Numbers of people came from the country round about to see him, and he related in his old age of an old Quakeress, who said to him, Art thou a Jew? Thou art one of God's chosen people. Wilt thou let me examine thee? She turned him round and round, and at last exclaimed, Well, thou art no different to other people. Jonas remained the only Jew in Cincinnati for about two years, when he was joined by Louis Cohen of London, Barnett Levi of Liverpool, and Joseph Levy of Exeter. These four with David Israel Johnson of Brookville, Indiana, a frontier trading station, conducted in the autumn of 1819 the first Jewish service in the western portion of the United States. Solomon Buckingham, Moses Nathan, and Solomon Menken came there from Germany in 1820. The last name established the first wholesale dry goods house in Cincinnati. The six Moses brothers, one of whom, Phineas, died 1895, lived to the age of 97, arrived in the following two years, and about this time Joseph Jonas was joined by his three brothers, Abraham, Samuel, and George. Their parents and a fourth brother, Edward, coming sometime afterward. Services were held only on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur until 1824, when the number of Jewish inhabitants reached about 20. See publication 9, page 155, for 14 Jewish names from the Cincinnati Directory of 1825. In the first month of that year, the congregation, Beni Israel, was formally organized, and at a meeting held sometime thereafter, it was resolved to build a suitable house of worship. There was not, however, sufficient wealth in the new community to enable the congregation to undertake the work unaided, and an appeal was sent to the older congregations in the United States, and also to England, for help in the proposed undertaking. A copy of this appeal has been preserved in Publications 10, pages 98 to 99, and reads as follows. To the elders of the Jewish congregation of Charleston, Gentlemen, being deputed by a congregation in this place, as their committee to address you on behalf of our holy religion, separated as we are and scattered through the wilds of America, as children of the same family and faith, we consider it as our duty to apply to you for assistance in the erection of a house to worship the God of our forefathers. Agreeably to the Jewish faith, we have always performed all in our power, to promote Judaism, and for the last four or five years, we have congregated where a few years before, nothing was heard but the howling of wild beasts and the more hideous cry of savage man. We are well assured that many Jews are lost in this country from not being in the neighborhood of a congregation. They often marry with Christians, and their posterity lose the true worship of God forever. We have at this time a room fitted up for a synagogue, two manuscripts of the law and a burying ground, in which we have already interred four persons, who, but for us, would have lain among the Christians. One of our members also acts as Sosha. It will therefore be seen that nothing has been left undone, which could be performed by eighteen assessed and six unassessed members. Two of the deceased persons were poor strangers, one of whom was brought to be interred from Louisville, a distance of nearly two hundred miles. To you, gentlemen, we are mostly strangers and have no further claim on you than that of children of the same faith and family, requesting your pious and laudable assistance to promote the decrees of our holy religion. Several of our members are, however, well known both in Philadelphia and New York namely, Mr. Samuel Joseph, formerly of Philadelphia, Mrs. Moses Jonas, and Mr. Joseph Jonas. The two Mr. Jonases have both married daughters of the late Reverend Gershon Mendez Sessions of New York. Therefore, with confidence, we solicit your aid to this truly pious undertaking. We are unable to defray the whole expense, 
and have made application to you as well as the other principal congregations in America and England, and have no doubt of ultimate success. It is also worthy of remark that there is not a congregation within 500 miles of this city, and we presume it is well known how easy of access we are to New Orleans, and we are well informed that had we a synagogue here, hundreds from that city we now know and see nothing of their religion, would frequently attend here during holidays. We are, gentlemen, your obedient servants. S. Joseph Chan Joseph Jonas, D.I. Johnson, Phineas Moses. I certify the above as agreeable to a resolution of the Hebrew Congregation of Cincinnati, July 3, 1825. Joseph Jonas Panners. Both the congregation in Charleston and then in Philadelphia sent contributions, and so did some individuals in New Orleans and in Barbados, West Indies. It was some time, however, until the necessary amount was collected, the congregation was chartered by the General Assembly of Ohio in 1830, and the synagogue was dedicated in the year 1836. The first official reader was Joseph Samuels. He was succeeded by Henry Harris, who was followed in 1838 by Hart Judah. In the same year was organized the First Benevolent Association. The first religious school was founded in 1842 but it existed only a short time. A Talmud Torah was established in 1845, which gave way in the following year to the Hebrew Institute, of which James K. Gotham, born in Prussia 1817, died in New Orleans 1886, was the founder. This also flourished but a short time, for with the departure of Rabbi Gotham for New Orleans in 1848, the Institute was closed. A considerable number of German Jews arrived in the city during the fourth decade of the 19th century. They were not in sympathy with the existing congregation, in which the influence of the English Jews was predominant, and determined to form another congregation. The Bene Yeshurun congregation was accordingly organized by these Germans in September 1841 and it was incorporated under the laws of the state in 1842. Its first leader was Simon Bamberger, and when Gotham, who followed him, left it, he was succeeded by H. A. Henry and A. Rosenfeld. The assumption of the office of rabbi in the Bene Yeshurun congregation by Isaac M. Wise in April 1854, and in the Bene Israel congregation by Max Lilienthal, born in Munich, 1815, died in Cincinnati, 1882. In June, 1855, gave the Jewish community of Cincinnati a commanding position and made it a Jewish center and the home of a number of movements which were national in scope. But their activity in general Jewish matters does not properly belong to the history of Jews in Cincinnati and will be treated in a succeeding chapter. Three other congregations were formed before the close of the period of German-Polish immigration. The Adath Israel, organized in 1847. The Ahabat Achim, organized in 1848. And the Shirat Israel in 1855. The first Jew who was known to have settled in Cleveland, Ohio, was a Bavarian, Simpson Thorman, who came there in 1837. He was soon joined by Aaron Leventreit and by others of his countrymen, and the thriving city, which had then about 6,000 inhabitants, soon had 20 Jews, who organized the Israelitish Society in 1839. In 1842, there was a split, and the seceding part formed the Anche Chisit Society. A four years later, these two again united and formed the Angie Cheese Congregation, the oldest existing congregation in Cleveland. The first services were held in a hall on South Water Street and Vineyard Lane, with Thorman as president and Isaac Hoffman as minister or reader. A burial ground was purchased in 1840. New dissensions arose in 1848 in the rapidly increasing community and resulted in the withdrawal of a number of members 
or in 1850, formed the congregation Tiferet Israel, which from the beginning represented the reform element. Isidore Kalish, born in Krodoshin, Prussia, 1816, died in Newark, New Jersey, 1866, was its first rabbi until 1855, and he was followed by Wolf Passbinder, Jacob Cohen, G.M. Cohen, Jacob Mayer, Aaron Holm, and the present incumbent, Moses J. Grease, born in Newark, 1868, who assumed his position in 1892. The rabbis of the older congregation were Fuld, 1850, E. Hertzman, 1860 to 61, G. M. Cohen, 1861 to 66, Nathan, 1866 to 67, Gustav M. Cohen, 1867 to 75, Moritz Tintner, born in Austerlitz, Austria, 1828, died in New York, May 11, 1910, 1875 to 76, and M. Mackall, born in Colmar in Posen, 1845, since 1876. The first Jewish congregation in St. Louis, Missouri, was organized about the same time as that of Cleveland, though individual Jews were living there more than 30 years before. The Block, or Block family, of Shifra, Bohemia, settled there about 1816, the pioneer being Wolf Block. Elise of Block was an attorney at law there in 1821. Most of the early arrivals intermarried with Christians and were lost to Judaism. It was not until the Jewish New Year in 1836 that the first religious services were held, with ten men rented a little room over a grocery store at the corner of Second and Spruce Streets. The Abduth Israel or United Hebrew Congregation, was organized in 1839. Abraham Feigl died 1888, being the first president, and Samuel Davidson the first reader. Services were held for many years in a private house in Frenchtown. The first building used as a synagogue was located in Fifth Street, between Green and Washington Avenues. According to Markins, Bernard Illoui, born in Colm, Bohemia, 1814, died near Cincinnati, Ohio, 1871, one of the leading conservative rabbis of America in his time, a pupil of the great rabbi Moses Sofer, 1763-1839, to of Pressburg, Hungary, was elected to the rabbinate of the St. Louis Congregation in 1854, its temple on 6th Street between Locust and St. Charles Streets, was dedicated in 1859. Reverend Henry J. Messing, born 1848, held the position of rabbi for about 30 years. The Benet L. Congregation, which was organized in 1852, moved into its own house of worship in 1855. Rabbi Moritz Spitz, born in Kassaba, Hungary, 1848, editor of The Jewish Voice, has been at the head of this congregation since 1878. The third of the earlier congregations, Cher Emmet, was organized in 1866, with H. S. Sonnenschein, born in Hungary 1839, died in Des Moines, Iowa 1908, as its first rabbi. The first Jewish organization of Louisville, Kentucky, is mentioned in the year 1832 and two brothers named Haman, or Hyman, from Berlin, were known to have settled there as early as 1814. Several Polish Jews from Charleston, South Carolina, and some German Jews from Baltimore, arrived there about 1836, and were soon joined by new arrivals direct from Germany. They bought a graveyard, built a mikvah, and engaged a soche. A few wealthy Jews came from Richmond, Virginia, but they did not associate with the others and were soon absorbed by the non-Jewish population. The first regular minister was J. Dinkelspiel, 1841, and the congregation, which was named Atath Israel, was incorporated in 1842. B. H. Gotthef was elected cantor and sochet in 1848 
and later became Hebrew teacher of a school, which was opened in 1854. In 1850, a synagogue was built on 4th Street between Green and Walnut Streets, which was consumed by fire in 1866. A regular preacher, L. Kleberg, was then engaged and remained till 1878. Another congregation was chartered by the legislature in 1851, but it was not properly organized until 1856, when it changed its name from the Polish House of Israel to Bet Israel. Further to the South, congregations were organized about that time in Mobile, Alabama, and in two other towns of that state. The most prominent among the early settlers of Mobile was Israel I. Jones, who arrived there from Charleston, South Carolina, and organized the congregation Shari Sharian, the oldest in the state, in 1844. B. L. Tim from Hamburg, in whose residence the first services were held. I. Goldsmith, S. Lyons, D. Markstein, Solomon Jones, and A. Gutstocker, all from Germany, were among the first members. The first synagogue was dedicated in December 1846, with Mr. Jones as president and Reverend De Silva as minister. The latter died in New Orleans in 1848 and was succeeded by Baruch M. Emanuel, who served for five years. Montgomery, which is said to have been founded by Abraham Mordecai, an intelligent Jew, who dwelt fifty years in the Creek Nation, and confidently believed that the Indians were originally of his people. See Publications 13, pages 71 to 81, 83 to 88, at his first Jewish Society for Relieving the Sick, organized in 1846. His first twelve members were from Germany and Poland. In 1849, the Shevra, which held religious services on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, was enlarged into a regular congregation called Kalal Montgomery, or Temple Beth Ar. Isaiah Well was the first president, and the number of members was about 30. No rabbi was employed until about 15 years later. There is also a record of a congregation which was organized in Claiborne, Alabama in 1835 and had an officiating rabbi. Most of the Jews, however, left the town and the congregation passed out of existence. While the older Jewish community of Savannah, Georgia, which dated from the 18th century, was strengthened by the new immigration, a new community in Augusta grew up in the first half of the 19th century. A Mr. Florence and his wife came there from Holland in 1825. Isaac Hendricks arrived with his family from Charleston, South Carolina in 1826, and it is believed that Isaac and Jacob Moisey, also Charlestonians, reached Augusta about the same time. Jews from Germany began to arrive in 1844. Isaac Levy, who came there about 1840, was for many years city sheriff, and Samuel Levi, was for two years judge of the Superior Court and for ten years judge of the Court of Ordinary. Markins, page 113. There is reason to believe that the sixth governor of Georgia, David Emanuel, died 1808, who assumed the office March 3, 1801, and after whom the largest county in the state, Emanuel, was named, was a Jew, or at least of Jewish descent. The number of Jews in Augusta went on increasing until about 1846, when the congregation, B'nai Israel, which is still in existence, was organized. The prominent figure of the philanthropist Judith Torah, born in Newport, Rhode Island, 1775, died in New Orleans, 1854, looms large in the early Jewish history of New Orleans. Torah was educated by his uncle, Moses Michael Hayes, 1739-1805, to 1805, who had become an eminent merchant of Boston and was later employed in his counting house. Toro came to New Orleans about a year before Louisiana was purchased by the United States from France in 1803. He opened a store and built up a thriving trade in New England products and soon became one of the wealthiest and most prominent merchants of the growing city. 
He gave liberally to many charities and public-spirited enterprises in New Orleans and elsewhere, at a time when large gifts with such purposes were not as common as they are now, when he donated $10,000 towards the erection of the Bunker Hill Monument in 1840. Those interested in raising the necessary funds had almost given up their project in despair. Though the cornerstone was laid in 1826, on the 50th anniversary of the battle, which it was to commemorate, Amos Lawrence's generous offers of aid met with no material response, even when aided by the eloquent appeals of Edward Everett, 1794-1865, and Daniel Webster, 1782-1852, until Toro privately offered to duplicate Lawrence's donation, provided the remaining necessary $30,000 would be raised. On the dedication of the monument in 1843, when Daniel Webster was the orator of the day, the generosity of the chief donors was praised in the lines read by the presiding officer, which became very popular at that time. At his death, he left, among many other bequests, a large sum in trust to Sir Moses Montefiore, 1784 to 1885, for the poor Jews of Jerusalem. His name is connected with the oldest and largest Jewish institutions in New Orleans, while Boston, Newport, and other communities have benefited by his generosity. Alexander Isaacs and Asher Phillips were also among the arrivals at New Orleans early in the last century. Morris Jacobs and Aaron Daniels were the senior wardens, and Abraham Plotz, Asher Phillips and Abraham Green, the junior warrens of a benevolent society, named Shara Chesed. In that capacity, they bought the first Jewish cemetery in New Orleans, which was located just beyond the suburb of Lafayette, in the parish of Jefferson, fronting on Jackson Street, where the first interment, that of Hyam Harris, took place on June 28, 1828. The first congregation adopted the name of the Benevolent Society and worshipped in a room on the top floor of a building in St. Louis Street. The oldest existing synagogue, the Shari Chesed Nefesat Judah, commonly known as the Torah Synagogue, was organized in its present form in 1854. The other congregations belong to a later period, which will be described in a subsequent chapter. Another prominent Jew, the greatest American public life, Judith B. Benjamin, also lived in New Orleans in this period, but he took no interest in Jewish affairs, and his career belongs to the chapters in which the participation of Jews in the dispute about slavery and in the Civil War will be described. End of chapter 18《ハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピー Chicago, First Congregations and Other Communal Institutions, Indiana, Iowa, Polish Jews settle in Keokuk and German Jews in Davenport, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Congregation Bet El of Detroit, Michigan, the First Mignon of Gold Seekers in San Francisco, Mining Congregations, Solomon Haydenfeld, Portland, Oregon. The tide of immigration, which began to rise still higher than before in the second quarter of the 19th century, now consisted to a considerable part of Germans, and a goodly portion of them were Jews from Germany and the surrounding countries. The official figures for the number of immigrants who came to the United States in 1826 are 10,837, for 1832, 60,482, in 1842 it rose to 104,565,000. The rise was very unequal, with marked recessions sometimes to less than half in the intervening years. But when measured by decades, the increase was constant, and after 1845, 
There were only two years, 1861 and 1862, in which the number of immigrants fell below 100,000. While there are no figures obtainable as to the number of Jews which came in those years, it is certain that they soon outnumbered many times the few comparatively small communities which existed before that period. The estimates made by representative Jews at various times, giving the numbers of Jews in the country in 1818 as 3,000, in 1826 as 6,000, in 1840 as 15,000, and in 1848 as 50,000, are merely guesses, but they give a fair idea of the estimated ratio of increase in those 30 years. The experience of today is that whenever actual figures are obtained, they prove to be in excess of the estimate made by communal leaders, and it is probable that the same results would be disclosed in the former times too. On the other hand, care must be exercised to guard against exaggerated estimates made for various reasons, but mainly for political effect. As a large part of the Jewish immigrants then took to peddling or other forms of trade on a small scale, it was natural for them to disperse over all the states and territories, though, as we shall see farther on, many settled in the larger cities in which the number of Jews soon rapidly multiplied. The problem of congestion never arose or could arise among business people, no matter how small their business might be at the beginning. It arose at a later period of immigration, which brought to our shores large number of laborers, both skilled and unskilled, with whom living near their centers of occupation was an economic necessity as well as a convenience. This is why no artificial aid or encouragement was at that time necessary to the scattering of Jewish immigrants over all habitable places and why many of them became pioneers and early settlers in new communities. The same happens now, too, with that small part of the immigrants which still take to trading as their first vocation. Thus we find in Chicago the future metropolis of the Great Middle West, a Jew by the name of J. Gottlieb, arrived within a year after its incorporation as a town in 1837. Isaac Ziegler, 1808-93, a peddler, came there in 1840, and the same year came also the brothers Benedict, died 1854, and Nathan Schubert and P. Newberg, Taylors. The last named became a tobacco dealer and later removed to Cincinnati. Benedict Schubert became a leading merchant tailor and built the first brick house in Chicago, on Lake Street, where he carried on his business for a number of years. About 20 Jews from Germany, including Jacob Rosenberg, died 1900, and the brothers Julius Abraham, born in Bavaria, 1819, died in Chicago, 1871, and Moses Cohen, came to Chicago between 1840 and 1844, and about as many in the following three years. A Jewish burial ground society, of which Isaac Wormser was president, was organized in 1845 and bought from the city one acre of ground on the north side, now within the confines of Lincoln Park, for a cemetery. It was abandoned in 1857 when it was already within the city limits. The first religious services were held in a private room above a store on Wells Street, now Fifth Avenue, on Yom Kippur of the same year, Philip Newberg and Mayor Klein officiating as readers. Only an exact minyan or ten men attended those services, which had to be discontinued whenever one left the room. The second services, with about the same number of attendants, were held on Yom Kippur 1846, also in a private room above the dry goods store of Rosenfeld and Rosenberg, 155 Lake Street, Philip Newberg and Abraham Cohn officiating. A scroll on the Torah which the brothers Cohn had brought with them from Germany was used on both occasions. The Kahalia Ansi Ma'arab was organized with about 20 members in 1847. L. M. Leopold, born in Württemberg, 1821, died in New York, 1889, was the first president, and Reverend Ignaz Ken Reeder, 1811 to 84, was elected rabbi, so shot and reader. He held the position for six years when he retired to private life and later engaged in the real estate and loan business. The first synagogue, which was built on Clark Street between Adams and Quincy Streets, where the new post office now stands, was dedicated Friday, June 13, 1851. Reverend Liebman Adler, born in Saxe-Weimar, 1812, arrived 1854, died in Chicago, 1892, Father of the prominent architect Donker Adler, 1844-1900, was the second rabbi of the congregation and held the position for more than 20 years. The Hebrew Benevolent Society was organized in 1851 and is still in existence. The second congregation, under the name Banai Shalom, consisting mostly of natives of Prussian Poland, was established in 1852. The Jewish Reform Verein, which subsequently led to the organization of the Sinai Congregation, 
was organized in 1858, with Leopold Mayer as president and Dr. Bernhard Felsenthal, born in Germany 1822, died in Chicago January 12, 1908, as secretary. The Hebrew Relief Association, which later built the Michael Reese Hospital, the first Jewish hospital in Chicago, was instituted in 1859. Henry Greenbaum, born in Germany 1833, was its first president. Isaac Greensfelder became treasurer, and Edward S. Salomon, who afterward served with distinction in the Civil War, was brevetted to the rank of brigadier general and later served for four years as governor of Washington Territory, 1871-74, to was its first secretary. Salomon was elected clerk of Cook County in 1861. The oldest Jewish congregation in Illinois outside of Chicago is that of Peoria, surnamed Anche Emet, which was organized in 1860. In the neighboring state of Indiana, which was admitted to the Union in 1816, Jews began to settle about the same time as in Illinois, and there are four communities which date back to the period before the Civil War. The oldest Jewish congregation in the state is the Adduct We Shalom of Fort Wayne, which was instituted in 1848. The congregation Ahawat Achim of Lafayette is but one year younger, while the congregation of Evansville dates from about the same time. The first Jewish settlers in Indianapolis, the capital, which now had the largest community, were Moses, Wolf, and Alexander and Daniel Franco, who came there from England in 1849. A family of Hungarian Jews named Neffler arrived soon afterwards. Adolf Rosenthal and Dr. J.M. Rosenthal came in 1854, and Hermann Bamberger, who later became a leading merchant, arrived in 1855. The first congregation was organized in 1856, but more than a decade passed until it was housed in its own building. Jewish immigrants also soon penetrated west of Illinois into that part of the Louisiana Purchase, which was organized as the Iowa Territory in 1838. Its pioneer Jew was Alexander Levy, born in France 1809, who arrived to this country in 1833 and kept a store in Dubuque in 1836. He was the first foreigner to be naturalized in Iowa and was a Justice of Peace in 1846. A Mr. Samuel Jacobs was surveyor of Jefferson County in 1840, and Nathan Lewis and Solomon Fine are mentioned as peddlers in Fort Madison in 1841. They settled in Keokuk and later in McGregor, both of which places had a number of Jews in those early days. It is stated at Sea Glacier, the Jews of Iowa, Des Moines, 1905, that about 100 Jewish peddlers arrived in Iowa in the decade following its admission as a state, 1846. Burlington and Keok were the centers for peddlers, who were mostly from Poland and Russia, while most of the German Jews preferred Davenport, which was largely settled by Germans. According to the above-mentioned authority, the first minyan was held in Keokuk in 1855 on Passover, and in that year the Jews of that place organized a society which later became the Congregational Banai Israel. In Davenport, a congregation having the same name was organized in 1861, which is still in existence. Among those who participated in public affairs was William Krauss, born about 1823, who arrived in Iowa in 1843, and furthered the movement to remove the capital from Iowa City to Fort Des Moines, where he resided. He was the founder and one of the directors of the first public school in that city. His brother, Robert, was one of the earliest settlers of Davenport. Farther to the north, there were only individual Jewish traders in Minnesota before the Civil War, and the three brothers Samuels, from England, who had an Indian trading post at Taylor Falls, on the Minnesota side of the St. Croix River, seemed to have been the first Jewish settlers in that state. Morris Samuels, a captain in the Union Army, was one of them. Isaac Marks, who resided in Mankato about that time, had a trading post near that place. About 1857, some Jews came to St. Paul and engaged in general business, which likewise consisted mostly in trading with the Indians. But there was no communal organization there or in any other part of the state until about 15 years afterwards. There is a record of one Jew who resided in Green Bay, Wisconsin as early as 1792. His name was Jacob Franks. See Publications 9, page 151. But we know little of other Jews there prior to the time of its admission to the Union in 1848. Shortly afterward, the congregation Bene Yesheron was organized in Milwaukee by Loeb Rinskoff, Leopold Neubauer, Emanuel Silverman, and others. Alexander Lasker and Marcus Heinemann were its first cantors in the order named. Isidore Kalish, M. Folk, Elias Epstein, and Emanuel Gericher later succeeded one another as rabbis. Still farther to the north, Michigan, which became a state 11 years before Wisconsin, received its first Jewish settlers about the same time. 
About a dozen families of Bavarian Jews settled in Detroit in 1848. According to an account written by Dr. Leo M. Franklin, born in Cambridge City, Indiana, 1870, rabbi of Temple Bet El, Detroit, since 1899, it was due to Isaac Cozens, and more especially to his wife Sophie, with whom he arrived in Detroit from New York about 1850, that the Bet El Society was established in that year. In April 1851, steps were taken to incorporate the congregation by the undersigned Israelites of the city of Detroit for the purpose of forming a society to provide themselves a place of public worship, teachers of their religion, and a burial ground, and give such society the name of Congregation Bet El. The signatures attached to the petition for incorporation are those of Jacob Silberman, Solomon Bendit, died in St. Clair, Michigan, 1902, Joseph Friedman, Max Cohen, Adam Hirsch, Alex Hine, Jacob Long, Aaron Joel Friedlander, Louis Bresler, and C.F. Bresler, an exact minion or the minimum number required for the formation of a synagogue. Like most congregations of that period, Bet El was orthodox in its ritual, but it was not long before the reform spirit began to create divisions in the community. In 1861, a large number of members withdrew because of the introduction of an organ and a mixed choir into the synagogue, and they formed the congregation Sha'er Zedek, of which Reverend A. M. Hirschman is now the rabbi. The first rabbi of congregation Bet El was Rev. Samuel Marcus, and he was followed by a number of well-known rabbis, including Liebman Adler, Isidore Kalish, Kaufman Kohler, Henry Zierndorf, and Louis Grossman. A large number of Jews crossed the continent or came by boats from various parts of the world, along with a heavy tide of travel towards the Pacific coast, when the discoveries of gold in California in 1849 began to attract great multitudes. There was a minyan in San Francisco on Yom Kippur of that year and a tent owned by Louis Franklin. Among those who participated were H. Joseph and Joel Noah, a brother of Mordecai M. Noah. The organization of the Jewish community was completed between July and October of the following year, when two congregations came into existence about the same time. The Sharit Israel Congregation, which comprised the Polish and English elements, was organized in August 1850 under the leadership of Israel Solomons. The Germans and Americans united in the Congregation Emmanuel, the name of whose president, Emanuel M. Berg, is signed on a contract dated September 1, 1850, for the renting of a room on Bush Street below Montgomery as a place of worship. About a dozen mining congregations sprang up in as many different places in California in the following ten years. Sonora had a Hebrew Benevolent Society as early as 1851. Stockton, a congregation Reim Ahubin in 1853. In Los Angeles, the founding of a benevolent society was brought about by Carvalho, a Sephardic Jew, who was a member of General Fremont's expedition. Religious services were held there in 1852. In Nevada City, a Hebrew society was organized in 1855, which numbered 20 members about two years later. In Jackson, a congregation was organized for the autumn holidays in 1856, and it erected the first synagogue in the mining districts. The building still stands, but it is used for other purposes, as the Jews have left the place long ago. Fiddleton, Grass Valley, Shasta, Folsom, Marysville, and Yesu Maria all had temporary congregations, which did not long survive the gold fever. See Jewish Encyclopedia. Sacramento is the only place in the state outside of San Francisco which has Jewish organizations, a congregation and two societies which originated in this period. A majority of the Jews from the mining communities who did not return to the East finally drifted into San Francisco, which from the beginning had the largest and most important Jewish community of the Pacific Coast. The foremost among the Jews who attained eminence in the new state, which was admitted into the Union in 1850, was Solomon Haydenfelt, born in Charleston, South Carolina in 1816, died in San Francisco 1890. He removed to Alabama at the age of 21, where he was admitted to the bar and practiced law for a number of years in Tallapoosa County. He was obliged to leave the state on account of his views on the slavery question and came to San Francisco in 1850. He was elected Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of California two years later and held the office with distinction from 1852 to 1857. His brother Elkin and Isaac Cardozo were members of the legislature of California in 1852, while another Jew, Henry A. Lyons, was also a member of the Supreme Court of the state about that time. A. C. Labatt, one of the pioneers, was an alderman of San Francisco in 1851, when Samuel Marks was United States appraiser on the port and Joseph Shannon was county treasurer. 
Many Jews who began their careers in San Francisco later became eminent merchants and financiers, like the four brothers Seligman, the three brothers Lazard, the Glaziers, and the Wormsers, all of whom settled later in New York. Michael Reese, one of the extensive realty brokers, Moritz Friedlander, who later became one of the largest grain dealers in the country, and Adolf Sutro, the engineer, were also among those whose modest beginnings belong to that period. To the same class belong also Louis Sloss and Louis Gerstel, who later founded the Alaska Commercial Company. What may be considered as an overflow of the Jewish immigration to California reached Oregon about a decade before it attained statehood in 1859. Most of the first Jewish settlers, who originally came from various parts of southern Germany, arrived in Oregon from New York and other eastern states by way of Panama and California, and settled principally in Portland. Its first congregation, Bet Israel, was organized in 1858, the founders being Leopold Mayer, M. Mansfield, B. Simon, Abraham Frank, Jacob Meyer, H. F. Block, Samuel Levy, and others. Rev. H. Boris was the first Hazan, and Rev. Dr. Julius Ekman, the first rabbi and preacher. He was succeeded by Rev. Dr. Isaac Schwab, who later went to St. Joseph, Missouri. A burial society or cemetery association was organized some time before, and the first benevolent society about a year later. The Jewish community of Portland has practically remained the only one in the state to this day, and though not large numerically, it has been from the beginning one of the most influential and important of the Jewish communities of the country. A proportionately larger number of Portland Jews have been elevated to high positions in the service of the city, state, and nation than those of any other community, but they mostly belong to a later period which will be treated in a subsequent part of this work. End of chapter 19「ヒストリー・オブ・ジュース・イン・アメリカ」「This is a LibreVox recording. All LibreVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibreVox.org.」Read by Ifan「ヒストリー・オブ・ジュース・イン・アメリカ」by Peter w i e m i c k The Jews in the Early History of Texas」The Mexican War The first settler in 1821, Adolphus Stern Who fought against Mexico and later served in the Texan Congress? David S. Kaufman, Surgeon General Levy in the Army of Sam Houston, a Jew as the first meat packer in America, Major Leon Dyer and his brother Isidore, Major s e l i x o n of Galveston, 1853, one Jew laid out Waco. Castro County is named after another, but later communal and religious activities. The war with Mexico, in which only a small number of Jews served. David Camden de Leon and his brother Edwin, U.S. Consul General in Egypt. The history of the Jews of Texas begins at the time when the largest state of the American Union was still a part of Mexico. The first Jewish settler of whom any record is preserved was Samuel Isaacs, who came there from the United States in 1821 with Austin's first colony of 300. He received a Spanish grant of land as a colonist, and is later mentioned once more as the recipient of a bounty warrant for 320 acres of land located in Polk County. For services in the Army of Texas in 1836 to 1837. When Abraham Cohen Labatt, born in Charleston, South Carolina in 1802, died in Texas after 1894, who has been mentioned in the preceding chapter, visited Velasco, Texas in 1831. He found there two Jews, Jacob Henry from England and Jacob Leon from Charleston. Who had been there for some years engaged in business. When the former of the two died without issue, he left his fortune for the building of a hospital at that seaport. Adolphus Stern, born in Cologne, Germany, 1801, died in New Orleans, 1852, was one of the first settlers in Nacogdoche, in the eastern portion of Texas, where he came from New Orleans in 1824. He knew several European languages and soon mastered various Indian dialects, which made him very useful to the insurgents against Mexican rule, whose cause he espoused. 
He was sentenced to death for his share in the Fredonian War against Mexico. He was saved by a general amnesty, which had been declared by that time, and took an oath of allegiance to the Mexican government, which he kept faithfully until Texas became an independent republic in 1836. After having been alcalde and official interpreter under the old order, he served in both the upper and the lower houses of the Texas Congress. Dr. Joseph Hertz came with his brother Hyman to Nacogdoche about 1832. Simon Schloss, born in Frankfurt on the Main, 1812, came there in 1836. David S. Kaufman, born in Cumberland County, Pennsylvania, in 1813, died in Washington, D.C., 1851. A graduate of Princeton College, came there from Louisiana in 1837. In 1838, he was elected a representative in the Texas Congress, was twice re-elected, and was twice chosen Speaker of the House. In 1843, was elected to the Senate, where, in 1844, as a member of the Committee on Foreign Relations, he presented a report in favor of annexation to the United States. When this plan was carried out, he was elected one of the first members of the House of Representatives from Texas, serving from 1846 until his death five years afterwards. Albert Emanuel, born 1808, came there from Germany in 1834 and was one of the first volunteers in the Texas Army, serving in the Battle of San Jacinto. He later settled in New Orleans where he died in 1851. Samuel Mass, who married the sister of Offenbach, the composer, and Simon Weiss, were two other natives of Germany who settled in Nacogdoche about that time. Four Jews are known to have fought at Goliad under Fanon, March 26, 1836, one of whom, Edward J. Johnson, born in Cincinnati, Ohio, 1816, was slain, together with his chief, after the surrender to the Mexicans. Moses Albert Levy served as Surgeon General in Sam Houston's army throughout the Texas-Mexican War. Dr. Isaac Leons of Charleston served as Surgeon General under General Tom Green in the War of 1836, among other Jews who rendered notable service to the Republic of Texas were the brothers Leon and Isidore Dyer, natives of Germany, who, at an early age, came with their parents to Baltimore, where the older Dyer founded a meatpacking establishment, which is said to have been the first in America. Leon Dyer, born 1807, died in Louisville, Kentucky, 1883, who settled in New Orleans was quartermaster general of the state militia of Louisiana in 1836 when Texas called for aid in her struggle for independence. With several hundred other citizens of New Orleans, he responded, and coming to Galveston, he received a commission as major in the Texas forces, signed by the first president, Burnett. The Louisiana contingent was assigned to the force of General Green and saw much active service. Major Dyer also served on the guard which took General Santa Ana, the captive president of Mexico, from Galveston to Washington in the following year. His brother, Isidore Dyer, born 1813, died in Waukesha, Wisconsin, 1888, settled in Galveston as a merchant in 1840, and was one of its public-spirited citizens. He was one of the earliest Grand Masters of the Order of Odd Fellows in Texas. The first Jewish religious services in Galveston were held at his house in 1856. Henry C. Lixon, born in Philadelphia, 1828, died 1886, came to Texas in 1839 and was elected first lieutenant of the Galveston Cadets, an organization composed of young boys, which rendered efficient service. His father was Michael Selixson, died 1868, who was elected mayor of Galveston in 1853. Levy Myers, sometimes also called Levy Charles or Charles Levy Harvey, 
Born in Georgetown, South Carolina, 1793, died in Galveston, 1870, who was a midshipman in the United States Navy in 1812 and was taken prisoner by the British, also participated in the Texan War of Independence. A. Wolf was killed in the Battle of Alamo in 1836, and his name is inscribed on the Alamo Monument at Austin. Jacob de Cordova, born in Spanish Town, Jamaica, 1808, died in Texas, 1868, removed to Gaveston from New Orleans in 1837, and was the founder of several newspapers, represented Harris County in the Texas legislature in 1847, and laid out the city of Waco in 1849. Henry Castro, born in France, 1786, died in Monterey, Mexico, 1861. A descendant of a wealthy Murano family, entered in 1842 into a contract with President Sam Houston of Texas to settle a colony west of the Medina. Houston also appointed him Consul General in France for the Republic of Texas. Between 1843 and 1846, Castro sent to Texas about 5,000 emigrants from the Rhenish provinces, who settled in the towns of Castroville, Quihi, Vandenberg, and O'Harris. Castro County, in northwest Texas, was named in honor of this early promoter of immigration to Texas, who sank large sums in the venture. There was little communal and religious activity in the stirring times of the early development of Texas, and the first communal organizations appeared a considerable time after Jews settled in some localities. The first Jewish cemetery in Texas was established in Houston in 1844, where the first synagogue in the state was built exactly 10 years later. The Jews of Gaveston acquired their first burial ground in 1852, Religious services were held since Yom Kippur, 1856, but no congregation was organized until 12 years later. In San Antonio, almost 20 years passed between the acquisition of a cemetery, 1854, and the organization of the first congregation. All the other Jewish communities in the rapidly growing state date their foundation from a later period. The war with Mexico, which began in 1846, was the least popular of all the wars in which the United States has engaged, and this probably accounts for the small number of Jews who volunteered to participate in what was practically an attack on a weak neighbor. The number of Jews in the country was now more than 10 times as large as in the time of the wars with England, but there are only about a dozen more names in the list of the Jewish soldiers of the Mexican War in the above-mentioned work of Mr. Simon Wolfe, than in the list of the year 1812. New York now had the largest Jewish community and was represented by no less than 15 in that small band of less than 60, in which there was only one from Pennsylvania, Gabriel Dropsy, Colonel Enlisted, 1st Regiment, one from New Jersey, Sergeant Alexander B. Weinberg, and five from Maryland. The others were mostly from the South, a large portion of them having participated in the earlier struggle between Texas and Mexico. The most prominent Jewish soldier of the Mexican War was David Camden de Leon. Born in South Carolina, 1813, died in Santa Fe, New Mexico, 1872. He graduated as a physician from the University of Pennsylvania in 1836 and two years later entered the United States Army as an assistant surgeon. He served with distinction in the Seminole War of 1835-1842, to which was the most bloody and stubborn of all wars against Indian tribes. For several years afterwards, he was stationed on the western frontier. He served throughout the Mexican War and was present at most of the battles. At Chaputepec, He earned the sobriquet of the fighting doctor, and on two occasions led a charge of cavalry after the commanding officer had been killed or wounded. He twice received the thanks of Congress for his distinguished services and for his gallantry in action. He was afterwards again assigned to frontier duty, and in 1856 became surgeon 
with the rank of major. Like most southern officers in the regular army, the Leon resigned his commission at the outbreak of the Civil War and joined the Confederacy, for whose government he organized the medical department, becoming its first surgeon general. Edwin de Leon, born in Columbus, South Carolina, 1818, died 1891, the journalist and author, who was appointed by President Pierce Consul General to Egypt and was later a confidential agent of the Confederate States in Europe, was a brother of David C. de Leon. Leon Dyer and Henry Seligson, whose participation in the struggles of Texas was described at the beginning of this chapter, also served as officers in the war with Mexico. The names of Captain Michael Stift, who served on the staff of General Zachary Taylor and of Lieutenant Colonel Israel Moses, who was promoted from the rank of assistant surgeon, have also been preserved. Among those who were killed in action was Sergeant Abraham Adler of the New York Volunteers. End of chapter 20. Chapter 21 of History of the Jews in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Richard Vogel. History of the Jews in America by Peter Wiernick. The Religious Reform Movement. Political Liberalism and the Religious Radicalism of the German-Jewish Immigrant The Struggle with Orthodoxy Hardly More Than an Animated Controversy No attempt made here by the Temple to swallow the synagogue, as was the case in Germany. The First Reformers of Charleston, South Carolina Isaac Leeser, the Conservative Leader the first to make a serious effort to adjust Judaism to American surroundings. Dr. Max Lelenthal, Isaac M. Wise, the energetic organizer of Reform Judaism, Dr. David Einhorn, Dr. Samuel Adler, Bernhard Felsenthal, Samuel Hirsch. The Jewish immigrants who were penetrating into various parts of the country in that period formed only a portion of the new arrivals. The bulk of them, as in later times, remained in the East, principally in New York City, where not less than ten new congregations were established in the second quarter of the 19th century. While the proportion of those unaffiliated with the synagogue was probably smaller then than it is now, the tendency to establish very small synagogues was also less, so that the existence of a dozen congregations in New York about the year 1850 may denote a larger Jewish population at that time than an equal or even a larger number would imply at the present time. It would also not be safe to insist that there were not at that time in existence several congregations whose names were not preserved on account of their insignificance or for other reasons. The German element, which predominated in this second period of Jewish immigration, was mostly under the influence of the liberalism which was then prevalent in Germany. But the political liberal of Central Europe at that time found in the United States all, and in some respects more, than he was striving for in the old country, including that national unity which was then only a pious dream in Germany. Aside from the question of slavery, which was not yet acute in the North at the beginning of that period, the German liberal found here all his ideals realized. Perfect equality for all white men, without distinction of creed or nationality, absolute freedom of speech and of the press, more individual liberty and better opportunities for work, for trade, and for enterprise than could be thought of in the localities from which he came. 
It was natural for most of them to sympathize with the abolitionist movement, and later they were among the first to join the newly formed Republican Party. But even the political radical or revolutionary of the other side of the ocean had little to object to in the democracy which he found here fully developed, and he soon became a patriotic and, to some extent, a conservative American citizen. It was different in regard to the religious liberalism or radicalism which was then occupying the minds of Jews in Germany. The conditions in that country made religious reform one of the burning questions of the day among them. Some saw in its adoption a sure means of obtaining the much-coveted political emancipation, while others thought it only protection against the frightfully increasing number of conversions which were then occurring. Orthodox Judaism was certainly losing ground in Germany at the time, and it was difficult to foresee where it would stop or how much of it would remain. Wherever there was a struggle between the old order of things in religious matters and the new, the later was certain to prevail. Within a few decades, the real old-style orthodoxy almost totally disappeared from most parts of Germany, retaining a foothold only in the province of Posen and in isolated localities like Mainz and Frankfurt on the Main. Elsewhere, even those who did not join the extreme reformers adopted a conservatism which was far from the old orthodoxy. The bulwark of orthodoxy, the poor Jewish masses, was itself disappearing. The old-style rabbis who survived were in despair, and when they died, modern German preachers were chosen to fill their places. It seemed as if the temple was swallowing the synagogue, and the religious radical was victorious decades before the political radical obtained even a part of what he desired. The conditions in this country were entirely different. Emancipation had been achieved and there was practically no Jewish question as far as the outside world was concerned. There were no wholesale desertions from the camp of Judaism, but that slow drifting away of a part of the wealthier class, which is not an unusual phenomena, wherever and whenever there is no legal restriction or stubborn prejudice to prevent gradual assimilation, there was also a steady replenishment, or rather an augmentation, of the poorer Orthodox classes, among whom the Polish and Russian element was steadily increasing, a prejudice which is almost national, keeping them apart from the Germans, who were rapidly advancing in wealth, social, and political position, as well as in religious radicalism. The old American element, which remained true to traditional Judaism, the considerable part of the Germans who would not accept reform, and the masses of later arrivals, gave to Orthodox Judaism in America a strength which it never possessed in Germany after the close of the 18th century. The steady increase in immigration from the Slavic countries easily filled up the places of those whose improved material and social condition caused them to drop out of the ranks of the Orthodox. Just as those who rose to wealth and joined the Reformers filled up the places left vacant by those who advanced beyond Reform Judaism into that complete assimilation into which it must lead those of its devotees who emphasize its progressive side and neglect the eternal and historical sides. These conditions reduced the struggle between orthodoxy and reform to something hardly above an animated controversy in the denominational periodicals, and its historical value consists chiefly as an indicator of material progress. There was no class struggle between the wealthy Jews and their poorer brethren who came after them in increasingly larger numbers. And there was no conflict between the former's and the later's religious views for the same reason. 
Accession to the ranks of wealth usually meant affiliation with a reform congregation, where the poor man could not afford to join and would not be welcome if he came. While several of the young enthusiasts who came over permeated with the fighting spirit of the German reformers might have thought at the beginning of continuing the struggle in the old world fashion until the enemy was annihilated, it did not take them long to discover the futility of such efforts. The task of Reform Judaism in America was plainly not to conquer the Orthodox synagogue or to win recruits from the ranks of those who wished to remain faithful to traditional Judaism, but to enroll under its banner the affluent American or Americanized Jews who were on the point of drifting away altogether. The view of the extremely conservative who considered these reformers as already lost to Judaism has been shared by a large majority of Jews of the United States for the last 60 or 70 years. But aside from condemning public declarations which were offensive to the Orthodox spirit and which were occasionally made by reform bodies or by their conspicuous representatives, the Orthodox masses have, as usual, displayed more fortitude than aggressiveness in religious matters. This accounts for the presence of numerous leaders, agitators, and organizers in the reform camp, where newly assumed positions had to be defended to one's own satisfaction, even if there was no formidable attack, while orthodoxy easily held its own by force of increasing numbers, even if its tenacity was relaxed by stress of circumstances. The autonomy of congregation, which is a characteristic feature of new Jewish settlements and which remain permanently in a country where there are no general laws of absolute religion and no special relations with the government to force on the Jews' official representatives, was also favorable to the spread of reform. Still, the first attempt which was made in Charleston, South Carolina in 1824 to imitate the reform movement of Germany was a failure. The Reformed Society of Israelites, which was established there in that year by 12 former members of the congregation Bet Elohim, who left the later religious body, because a memorial for the reformation of the ritual was rejected by the vestry without discussion, had but a brief existence. But Charleston was losing its comparative importance and was attracting less Jewish immigration than the northern seaport communities. So there was a continual drifting away into indifference. And when a new synagogue was built to replace the one which was destroyed by the great conflagration of 1838, the petition of 38 members that an organ be placed in the new structure was granted. There was again a split in the congregation, which did not become united until it was greatly reduced by the ravages of the Civil War. It was the rabbi of the Charleston congregation, Gustav Poznanski, a man imbued with the spirit of the Reformed Temple of Hamburg, who decided as an authority on Jewish matters that an organ in the synagogue was permissible according to religious law. This is typical of numerous later cases in which an autonomous congregation, subject to no other religious authority and not connected with any other religious body, accepted the authority of its own rabbi to modify its ritual and its religious practices in accordance with his personal views or inclinations. Several other reform farin in the East and Middle West had a more lasting success because they obtained able and energetic leaders from among the young German scholars who came over at that time and who were, so to speak, in duty bound to continue the spread of reform in their new home. But curiously enough, and perhaps emblematic of the ultimate course of American Judaism, 
the first real and successful attempt to adjust Judaism to its surroundings in the United States was not made by an adherent of the Reform Movement, but by its strongest and ablest opponent which this country has developed. Long before the new leaders of that movement arrived and began to spread their ideas and ideals in the German language, there arose a vigorous and diligent pioneer who introduced the English sermon in the American synagogue, who established the first influential Jewish periodical, a man whose strong intellect and organizing abilities left their impress on the Jewish community of the entire country. Rabbi Isaac Leeser. He was born in Neuenkirchen, Prussia, in 1806, and received his secular education in the gymnasium of Munster. But he was also instructed in Hebrew, and was well versed in several tractates of the Talmud, when he left for the United States at the age of 18. He came to this country in May 1824 and settled in Richmond, Virginia, being employed in the business of his uncle, Zalma Rian, for the following five years. He went to a school for a short time, but studied much in his leisure hours, increasing not only his secular knowledge, but also his acquaintance with Jewish lore. He early evinced interest in religious affairs and was soon assisting Reverend Isaac Satius, 1782-1839, to 1839, of the Portuguese congregation of Richmond in teaching religious classes. In 1828, an article in the London Quarterly reflecting on the Jews was answered by Leeser in the columns of the Richmond Whig and attracted considerable attention on account of its excellence. This ultimately led to his being elected minister of Congregation Mikwa Israel in Philadelphia in 1829. He came to Philadelphia in that year and resided there for the remainder of his life. He preached his first English sermon in 1830, and in the same year appeared his translation of Jolson's Instruction in the Mosaic Religion. In the following ten years, appeared several volumes of his articles and discourses, a Hebrew spelling book, and a catechism. In 1843, he established the Occident and American Jewish Advocate, which he edited for 25 years until his death, when it was continued for one year longer by Mr. Now Judge, Mayor Salzberger, who had laterly assisted Rabbi Leeser in its direction. In 1845 appeared his translation of the Bible, which became an authorized version for the Jews of America. Besides writing, editing, and translating, he visited various parts of the United States where he lectured on diverse topics relating to Judaism always advocating and spreading that enlightened conservatism for which he consistently stood all his life. The Hebrew Education Society, the Board of Hebrew Ministers, and the Jewish Hospital of Philadelphia owe their foundation to his active efforts. And he also advocated a union of all the Jewish charities of that city which was consummated some years after his decease. The Board of Delegates of American Israelites, the First American Jewish Publication Society, and the Maimonides College, of which he was the first president, were also created mostly through his influence. After serving 21 years at the Mikwe Israel Synagogue, Rabbi Leeser retired in 1850 and held no clerical position until 1857, when the Bet El Emmet congregation was organized by a number of his friends. He became its rabbi, continuing until his death on February 1, 1868. The opinion that he was the most distinguished of Hebrew spiritual guides in this country is hardly exaggerated. 
the first among the prominent leaders of the reform movement to arrive in this country was Dr. Max Lelenthal. Born in Munich, Bavaria in 1815 and dying in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1882, he played an important part in the attempt of the Russian government to spread secular knowledge among the Jews of that country by drastic means. But when he seemed to be at the height of his career, he suddenly left Russia under circumstances which have never been thoroughly explained and came to the United States in 1845. Settling in New York, he first became the rabbi of Anne's Chest on Norfolk Street, and later of Shahar HaShomayim on Attorney Street. These were Orthodox congregations, and there was considerable friction between the religious members and the rabbi, who was inclined towards reform. He gave up the rabbinate in 1850, and established an educational institute, at the same time becoming one of the most active spirits in the Verein der Lichtfreund, a society formed in 1849 for the discussion and spreading of the teachings of reform. In 1855, he was elected rabbi of the congregation Bene Israel of Cincinnati, Ohio, and held the position until his death. He wrote many articles and several works of prose and poetry, both in German and in English, and was an active communal worker, a teacher, and even participated in the municipal affairs of Cincinnati, serving as a member of the Board of Education, as a director of the Relief Union, and of the University Board. But he was eclipsed and practically reduced to the position of assistant to the man who surpassed him as a leader and organizer and who became the recognized head of the Reformed Jews of the West. This man was Isaac Meyer Wise, born in Bohemia in 1819 and dying in Cincinnati in 1900, who came to this country in the summer of 1846 and after a brief stay in New York became the rabbi of Congregation Bethel of Albany, organized in 1838, the first and then the only congregation of that city. He had received an old-fashioned rabbinical education at home, but he soon developed here into a radical reformer and introduced in his synagogue many novel features and practices, often in the face of strong opposition. A split in the community followed in 1850, and his followers organized a new congregation, the Anch Emmet, of which he remained rabbi for four years. In 1854, he was chosen rabbi of the congregation B'nai Yushurun in Cincinnati and held the position for the remaining 46 years of his life. He established there the Israelite, now the American Israelite, soon after his arrival in Cincinnati. And through this organ, he advocated with much energy his ideas of reform and the plans of organization, which he succeeded in carrying out after many failures and setbacks, when the time for unification and organization had arrived. He also established in 1855 a German weekly, the Deborah, by means of which he reached a part of the Jewish public which did not read English. He wrote much for his periodicals and also was the author of numerous books on theological and historical subjects, and also several novels, and even two plays in German. But his chief strength was his ability as an organizer, the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, the Hebrew Union College, opened in 1875, and the Central Conference of American Rabbis, organized in 1889, owe their existence to him. David Einhorn, born in Bavaria in 1809 and dying in New York in 1879, who came to America in his mature years, 
had played a somewhat prominent role in the reform movement in Germany, where he held several important rabbinical positions. His scholarly attainments were of a high order, but he was even more radical than Wise and Leilenthal, whom he strongly opposed soon after his arrival to this country in 1855. He became in that year the rabbi of Har Sinai Congregation in Baltimore, Maryland, organized in 1843, and soon afterward he began to issue there a monthly magazine in German under the name of Sinai, in which he advocated his views of reform. In 1861, Einhorn was compelled to leave Baltimore on account of his anti-slavery views, which he courageously expressed, despite the local sympathy with the South. He went to Philadelphia, where he became a rabbi of Knesset, Israel, removing to New York in 1866, where he became the rabbi of congregation Adath Geshuran a position which he held until a short time before his death. In later years, he became reconciled to his former opponents in the reform camp and was the leading spirit in the rabbinical conference, which was held in Philadelphia in 1869. Dr. Samuel Adler, born in Worms, Germany in 1809 and dying in New York in 1891, was a preacher and assistant rabbi in his native city until 1842, when he became the rabbi of Alze, Rheinhesse, and remained there about 15 years. He also participated in the rabbinical conferences in Germany, in which the reform movement was to some extent systematized, and he was considered one of its representatives there when he was called in 1857 to become rabbi of Congregation Emmanuel of New York. This was the first avowedly reformed congregation in the city and has become the wealthiest Jewish congregation in the country. It was organized in 1845. Its first place of worship was a private house on the corner of Clinton and Grand Streets and its first rabbi preacher, L. Mertzbacher, who died in 1856, began his duties at a salary of $200 per annum. Dr. Adler was brought as his successor, and he held the position until he was retired as Rabbi Emeritus in 1874, being succeeded by Gustav Gotthiel, born in Pene, Prussian Poland in 1827 and dying in New York in 1903. Adler was, in his time, practically the only reform rabbi in New York, and neither his disposition, which was that of a scholarly retired man, nor the local circumstances, which were influenced by the fact that the Poles and Russians had a large majority, even in the supposedly German period, were favorable to the spread of reform. He was the possessor of a large library of Rabinica, which after his death was presented by his family to the Hebrew Union College. Dr. Felix Adler, born in Alzey in 1851, the founder of the Society for Ethical Culture, is his second son. The last of the American pioneer reform rabbis whose activities date back to the time before the outbreak of the Civil War was Bernard Felsenthal, born in Germany in 1822 and dying in Chicago in 1908. While originally intended for a secular career, he was a thorough Talmudical scholar and for a decade before he came to this country in 1854, he was a teacher in a Jewish congregational school. After three years spent in Madison, Indiana as rabbi and teacher, he removed to Chicago, where he became an employee of a Jewish banking firm. In 1858, the Jewish Reform Friend of Chicago was formed with Felsenthal as its secretary and guiding spirit. 
In the following year, he published a pamphlet in favor of reform, which attracted much attention. And two years later, after the Reform Fair and developed into Sinai Congregation, he became its first rabbi. In 1864, he took charge of Zion Congregation, the second Reform Congregation of Chicago, and held the position until he was retired as Rabbi Emeritus in 1887. While he was theoretically an extreme radical in religious matters, his extensive knowledge of rabbinical literature and his love for Jewish learning added to his generous disposition and real affection for Jewish scholars of the old type helped to make his relations with the Orthodox Jews more pleasant than in the case of other representative rabbis of his class. He was probably the only reform rabbi in this country who was really beloved among the masses of the immigrants from the Slavic countries, and he thus exemplified a possibility of a better understanding between the different wings of American Judaism, which was then, and partly still is, by many considered difficult of accomplishment. Samuel Hirsch, born in Rhenish, Prussia in 1815 and dying in Chicago in 1889, belonged to this group. Although he did not arrive in America until 1866, after having served as chief rabbi of Luxembourg for nearly a quarter of a century, he succeeded David Einhorn in Philadelphia, where he remained for 22 years. After retiring from the ministry, he removed to Chicago, where he spent his last days with his son, Dr. Emil G. Hirsch, born in Luxembourg in 1852, the eminent preacher and professor of rabbinical literature at the University of Chicago. Samuel Hirsch belonged to the extreme wing of radical reformers and was one of the first to advocate the holding of special services in the temple on Sunday. His chief work was written in Germany, to Religions Philosophy der Juden, Leipzig, 1842, of which only one part appeared. It is an effort to explain Judaism from the Hegelian point of view, but as it was written long before he arrived in this country, it has no interest for American Jewish history except perhaps as an instance of the influence of the German method of abstract theorizing on the uncompromising radical pioneers of the American reform movement. End of chapter 21Chapter 22 of History of the Jews in America. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Claire. History of the Jews in America by Peter Wiernick. Conservative Judaism and its Stand Against Reform. The Poor Jews of Elm Street and the Rich Jews of Crosby Street. Rabbis Samuel M. Isaac, Morris J. Raphael, and Jacques J. Lyons. Sabatos Morais, Kalish and Hupscht, the moderate reformers, Benjamin Sold, Dr. Marcus Jastrow's career in three countries, Alexander Kohut, Russian Orthodoxy asserts itself in New York, and the Bet Ha Midrash Had Godul is founded in 1852, Rabbi Abraham Joseph Ash and his various activities, charity work which remains subordinate to religious work in the synagogue. In New York, too, it was not a radical appearing to a wealthy congregation, but a conservative in a neighborhood where the poorer Jews dwelt, who first introduced the English sermon in the synagogue. Reference is made by a correspondent from New York, see Orient, 1840, page 371, to the poor Jews of Elm Street and the rich Jews of Crosby Street in that period. And it was, characteristically enough, in the synagogue of the Bene Yeshuran, then situated at Elm Street, that the innovation was made... Samuel Mayer Isaacs, born in Lee Warden, Holland, 1804, died in New York, 1878, 
The son of a Dutch banker who removed to England was called to the rabbinate of that congregation in 1839. When members who seated from that synagogue formed the congregation Sha'ere Tafila in 1847, Rabbi Isaacs went with them and remained with his new charge until his death. He was an able exponent of conservative Judaism and was the founder of the Jewish Messenger, 1857, which was continued after his demise by his son, Professor Abraham Samuel Isaacs, born in New York, 1852, until 1902 when it was merged with another Jewish periodical. Like Leeser, Rabbi Isaacs was a good organizer and influenced the foundation of various Jewish institutions. His successor as rabbi of the Elm Street Congregation was Rabbi Morris Jacob Rafal, born in Stockholm, Sweden, 1798, died in New York, 1868, who was, like Isaacs, also the son of a banker. Rafal was a linguist and a good rabbinical scholar, and while in England, he delivered lectures on Hebrew poetry and also began there the publication of the Hebrew Review and Magazine of Rabbinical Literature, which was discontinued in 1836. For some time, he acted as secretary to Solomon Herschel, 1762 to 1842. He also made translations from Maimonides, Albo, and Wesley. He participated in the translation of part of the Mishnah and began a translation of the Pentateuch, of which one volume appeared. After being for eight years minister of the Birmingham Synagogue, he sailed for New York in 1849 and remained with the B'nai Yeshurun until shortly before his death. Rafal was the only prominent northern rabbi who defended the institution of slavery in the pulpit, as well as in one of his works entitled Bible View of Slavery. Rev. Jacques Judah Lyons, born in Suriname, 1814, died in New York, 1877, who was a rabbi in his native city for several years, came to the United States in 1837, went to Richmond, Virginia, where he was minister of the congregation B'nai Shalom for two years came to New York in 1839 and became rabbi of the Spanish and Portuguese congregation, which had removed from Mill Street to Crosby Street in 1834. He held the position 38 years, successfully combating every movement to change the form of worship in his congregation. Leeser's successor in the pulpit of McWay Israel in Philadelphia was also a prominent conservative. Sabato Moraes, born in Leghorn, Italy, 1823, died in Philadelphia, 1897. After having spent five years in London as the master of a Jewish orphan school, he arrived in Philadelphia in 1851, and until his death, his influence was a continually growing power for conservative Judaism. Though his ministry covered the period of greatest activity in the adaptation of Judaism in America to changed conditions, he, as the advocate of Orthodox Judaism, withstood every appeal in behalf of ritualistic innovations and departures from traditional practice, proving thereby how much the personality of the rabbi counts in this country in deciding the religious attitude of his congregation. When Maimonides College was established in Philadelphia in 1867, Moraeus was made professor of the Bible and biblical literature, and he held the chair during the six years that the college existed. He was the founder and the first president of the faculty of the Jewish Theological Seminary which was established in New York in 1886, which position, as well as that of Professor of Bible, he held until his death. Henry Samuel Morias, born in Philadelphia 1860, the writer on Jewish historical subjects and the first editor of the Philadelphia Jewish Exponent, established 1887, is a son of Sabato Morias. Isidore Kalish, born in Ukrotyshin, Prussian Poland, 1816, died in Newark, New Jersey, 1886, was another scholarly rabbi of that period, who came to the United States in 1849 after having studied at several European universities. While he was more inclined toward reform, he is chiefly known for his literary works and translations, which cover a wide range of Jewish subjects in Hebrew, German, and English. He officiated as rabbi in various communities, beginning with Cleveland, Ohio, and ending in Newark, New Jersey, to which city he removed from Nashville, Tennessee, after he retired from the ministry in 1875. Supreme Court Justice Samuel Kalish, born in Cleveland, Ohio, 1851, of Newark, is his son. Rev. Adolf Hupsch, born in Hungary, 1830, died in New York, 1884, was also a moderate reformer with a good rabbinical education. He came to New York in 1866 and became rabbi and preacher of the congregation Ahabat Chasid, which grew considerably under him. 
He was one of those who yielded to the temptation of the time to tamper with the Sudur, and his edition of it, which was adopted by several other congregations for a certain time, was an addition to the curiosities of American Jewish liturgical literature. Henry S. Jacobs, born in Kingston, Jamaica, 1827, died in New York, 1893, who came to Richmond, Virginia as rabbi of Congregation Bet Shalom in 1854, and later held similar positions in Charleston, South Carolina, New Orleans, and New York, Shi'arit Israel, 1873-74, B'nai Yeshurun, 1874 93 also belongs to the group of conservative rabbis of that period, who did much to uphold traditional Judaism as a living faith without treating it as a movement or considering themselves as agitators. His conciliatory attitude enabled him to act as president of the Board of Jewish Ministers of New York from its organization until his death. Benjamin Sold, born in Hungary 1829, died at Berkeley Springs, West Virginia 1902, who came to Baltimore in 1859 as rabbi of Oheb Shalom Congregation and remained with it as rabbi until 1892, and as rabbi emeritus until his death, was an opponent of radicalism who influenced his congregation to adopt a more conservative course relating to prayers. The changes in the contents of the Siddur, or traditional prayer book, are a characteristic of the extremely individualistic period in the Reform Movement, when almost every leader of prominence tried his hand at it, and when the aim seemed to be to make the services in each temple or reform synagogue as unlike that of the other as possible. Most of these special sidurim have neither literary nor historical value and deserve to be mentioned only as the curiosities or vagaries of an epoch of transition in American Judaism. Zold used the prevailing method for the purpose of inducing his congregation to retrace its steps, and his Abudat Israel, which closely followed traditional lines, soon displaced the more radical Minghang America, not only in his own synagogue, but in a number of others. It was republished several times, once with an English translation. His commentary on Job, Baltimore, 1886, written in Hebrew, is one of the best works of that nature produced in the United States. Miss Henrietta Zold, the translator and writer on Jewish subjects, is his daughter. Of the same age, and to some extent imbued with the same views as Zold, was Mordecai or Marcus Jastro, Born in Rangosin, Prussian Poland, 1829, died in Germantown, Pennsylvania, 1903, who had a remarkable career as rabbi in two countries before he came to America. Jastro had a thorough rabbinical education and also a degree of Ph.D. from the University of Halle. In 1858, he became the preacher of the modern or German congregation at Warsaw, Russian Poland, and threw himself into the study of the Polish language and of the condition of the Jews of Poland. His work, Dialogi der Juden in Poland, which appeared anonymously, Hamburg, 1859, proves him to have possessed much valuable information and clear views on the conditions of the Jews of Poland, while a collection of Polish sermons, which was published in Posen, 1863, attests to his mastery of the language. He took the part of the Poles against their Russian oppressors and participated in the demonstrations against the killing of five Poles in a suburb of Warsaw in February, 1861, which led to the beginning of the Second Polish Insurrection. Jastro was imprisoned together with the great rabbi Beirush Mazels, and after being held more than three months, was expelled from Russia. His widely circulated patriotic Polish sermons, his effects to bring the Jews and Christians together in protest against the Muscovite tyranny, and his imprisonment made him one of the most popular men in the old Polish capital at that time. He occupied the position of rabbi at Mannheim, Germany, for a short time in 1862, but his sympathy with Poland was too strong to permit him to remain there when, on the supposed pacification of that unhappy country, the order for his expulsion was revoked in November of that year. He soon returned to Warsaw, but a few months later the actual insurrection broke out, and his passport being cancelled while he was visiting Germany, he could not return to Russia. He then, 1864, accepted a position as rabbi at Worms, Hesse, where he remained until 1866, when he was chosen rabbi of the congregation Rodolphe Shalom in Philadelphia. In the first years of his American rabbinate, Jastro ably seconded the efforts of Leeser to preserve conservative Judaism in the East against the advance of radical reform, and continued to oppose that tendency after Leeser's death. Jastro was one of the professors of Maimonides College and later collaborated with Zold on the revision of the Siddur Abodat Israel and in its translation into English. 
Besides his activity in local Jewish affairs and in other Jewish matters of a more general nature, he contributed to many European and American Jewish periodicals and was for several years the chief editor of a new translation of the Bible into English, which was undertaken under the auspices of the Jewish Publication Society of America. He also found time to compile his great work, a dictionary of the Targumum, the Talmud, Balbi, and Yerushalami, and the Midrashic literature, London and New York, 1886 to 1903, and in his last years was editor of the Department of the Talmud in the Jewish Encyclopedia. Two of his sons are renowned American scholars. The older, Professor Morris Jastro, born in Warsaw, 1861, has occupied the chair of Semitic languages at the University of Pennsylvania since 1892 and is one of the foremost Orientalists in the country. The younger, Joseph Jastrow, born in Warsaw, 1863, has been professor of psychology at the University of Wisconsin since 1888 and a recognized authority on his special subject. He was in charge of the psychological section of the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893 and served as president of the American Psychological Association for the year 1900. The last of the important rabbis to come here from a Western European country was Alexander Kohat, born in Hungary 1842, died in New York 1894. The lexicographer and orientalist whose Arush Completum, Vienna 1878-92, to which he devoted 25 years of his life, is still the standard work on the subject. The first four volumes were printed during his residence in Hungary, where he was rabbi first at Stuhl Weissenberg, then at Fünfkirchen, and lastly at Gross Wardin. 1880-84. The last four appeared during his sojourn in America, whither he came in 1885 when he was chosen rabbi of Congregation Ahaba Chesed in New York. He was at once recognized as an eminent conservative leader and was associated with Marias in founding the Jewish Theological Seminary, in which he became professor of Talmudic methodology. In March 1894, while delivering a eulogy on Kosith, he was stricken in the pulpit and died after lingering several weeks. A volume containing memorial dresses and tributes to his memory was published by his congregation in 1894. Another volume containing essays by 44 noted scholars in Europe and America entitled Semitic Studies and Memory of Rev. Dr. Alexander Kohut was published in Berlin in 1897 by his son, George Alexander Kohut born in Stusch-Weissenberg, 1874, the bibliographer and writer on Jewish subjects. Extreme Russian orthodoxy asserted itself in New York about the middle of the 19th century. There were numerous Jews from Russia in the country long before that, and the immigration from Russian Poland increased heavily after 1845, when Jews in the Kingdom of Poland were first conscripted in the army, in violation of a promise made by the government that was to be postponed until they were granted equal rights with non-Jewish subjects. The first Russian congregation in America was founded on June 4, 1852, with 12 members, which soon increased to about 23, several of whom, however, were natives of Germany who were dissatisfied with the reform tendencies of the congregations to which most of their countrymen belonged. The first place of worship was in a garret of the house, number 83 Bayard Street, for which a monthly rental of $8 was paid. B. Lichtenstein was the first Parnass, or president, I. Cohen, the secretary, H. S. Isaacs, the reader, and Abraham Joseph Ash, Einstadt, born in Semyatich, Russia, 1813, died in New York, 1888, who came to America in that year and was a Talmudical scholar and acted as rabbi without compensation. The place on Bayard Street was soon too small for the rapidly increasing congregation, and it removed in November of the same year to larger quarters on the first floor of a house on the corner of Canal and Elm Streets, for which a monthly rental of $25 was paid, although there was a carpenter shop on the floor above. In another six months, the continual increase necessitated another removal, this time to the top floor of a former courthouse at the corner of Pearl and Center Streets. There was a German congregation, Bet Abraham, on the first floor of the same building, but it soon moved out and changing its name to Sha'er Zadik, located in Henry Street, and was known as the Henry Street Synagogue until it moved uptown several years ago. During the three years which the first Russian congregation, which called itself simply the Bet Ha Midrash, remained on Pearl Street, Mr. Ash became the regularly appointed rabbi at a salary of $2 a week, and Joshua Falk Hakohen, author of Abney Joshua, a commentary on Perk Abbott, New York, 1860, delivered occasional sermons without compensation. 
About this time, a quarrel between Rabbi Ash and Judah Middleman, who was also a Talmudical scholar, about the recognition of a shohat, in which the rabbi would not submit to the decision of European rabbinical authorities, led to the first split in the congregation. Middleman and his followers withdrew and formed a separate minyan on Bayard Street, which later became the congregation B'nai Israel. Collier organized 1862, which now has its synagogue on Pike Street. A Portuguese Jew by the name of John Hart, who visited the Pearl Street Synagogue to say Kaddish on his Yarhitz, or anniversary of his parents' death, influenced his friend, Samson Simpson, the founder of Mount Sinai Hospital, born in Danbury, Connecticut, 1780, died in New York, 1857, to donate $3,000, which formed the largest part of the fund with which the Welsh Chapel, number 78 Allen Street, was purchased and turned into a synagogue. It was dedicated June 8, 1856. New quarrels between the rabbi's adherents and the officers of the congregation led to a lawsuit, and later to another split. This time, Rabbi Ash and 23 of his followers left the synagogue, and they formed a new congregation which they named Bet Hamidrash Ha Godal, which was dedicated August 13, 1859, the first location being the top floor of the house on Forsyth Street, on the southwest corner of Grand Street. Henry Chuck was the first president of the new congregation, Mayor Salwin, Secretary, Israel Cohen, Reader, and Nathan Mayer, Beadle and Collector. About the time of the beginning of the Civil War, Rabbi Ash left the rabbinate and engaged in business, in which he was successful for a time. During these years, he became one of the largest contributing members and acted for a time as the highest officer of the congregation. But reverses came and he again became a rabbi, which, with a short interruption in 1876, when he became a dealer in kosher wine, he remained until his death. The congregation removed from Forsyth to the corner of Clinton and Grand Streets in 1865, and from there moved into its own new building at 69 Ludlow Street, which was dedicated September 27, 1872. This building was sold in 1885 when the congregation purchased the Methodist Church at numbers 52 through 60 Norfolk Street, which has been known as the Bet Ha Midrash Ha Godul for the last quarter of a century. This synagogue, which was increasing in wealth and membership, made progress in true Orthodox fashion. A system of baking strictly kosher matzah for Passover was introduced in 1870. An extra soshat, Asher Lemiel Harris, was engaged for the special meat market which supplied the members. A Hebra Mishneyat for the daily study of the Mishnah was organized in the same year, and a Hebra Shas for the study of the Talmud every evening after the services was organized in 1874 by Rabbi Ash and Judah David Eisenstein, born in Merzgarek, government of Sidos, Russian Poland, 1855, arrived 1872, who is now the editor and publisher and practically the author of the Hebrew encyclopedia Ozar Israel. The congregation also did a considerable amount of direct and unorganized charity work, the money often being contributed by members or visitors who were called to the reading of the Torah on Saturdays or other formal occasions. Poor transients and immigrants were assisted, some were taken into the houses of the more wealthy members for Sabbaths and festivals. Many of them were assisted to become peddlers and were even instructed in the rudiments of the occupation. The poor of the Holy Land were also remembered by special donations once a year but charity work never overshadowed the religious work. The affairs of the synagogue remained paramount, which is one of the principal reasons why congregations of this kind retain their truly orthodox character. The increase of wealth brought the employment of the first professional cantor, Judah Oberman, 1877, who was succeeded by Simha Samuelson in 1880. Other large congregations were now growing up on the east side where the Jewish population was increasing very fast, but the further development of its religious and communal life belongs to a later period. End of chapter 22